The Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Mr. Toakley. Good morning. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. It's the Constitution. It's the Constitution this morning. You've been it's looking forward vibe. to this. <laughs> Thank you. It's the vibe, Your Honours, Your Commissioners. Um, Commissioners, this morning I'll be summarising the uh, responses that were received to the issues paper. Um, term of reference C in this Commission's letters patent directs this Commission to inquire into several matters concerning the legal framework for attending to national emergencies. Term of reference C in particular asks whether changes are needed to Australia's legal framework for the involvement of the Commonwealth in responding to national emergencies, including in relation to the following. One, thresholds for and any obstacles to state or territory requests for Commonwealth assistance. Whether the Commonwealth Government should have the power to declare a state of national emergency. Three, how any such national declaration would interact with state and territory emergency management frameworks. And four, whether in the circumstances of such a national declaration, the Commonwealth Government should have clear authority to take action, including, but without limitation, through the deployment of the Australian Defence Force in the national interest. It is immediately apparent that the term of reference C uses the expression national emergency and not natural disaster. The concept of a national emergency can be broader than a natural disaster. For example, a national emergency might embrace an event such as a terrorist attack, which is something that is not a natural disaster event or disaster. Another feature to point out is that the use of the word national, sorry, is the use of the word national in the term of reference. There is a question of how national an emergency has to be in order to engage the declaration that is contemplated by term of reference C. That is, need it be on a national scale or must the response be in the national interest or some other measure of significance? To illustrate, in some scenarios it could mean multi-level and or Australia-wide. In others, it could mean something more geographically confined, but of such importance to our economic and psychological well-being because of the proportion of the population affected. For example, a significant tsunami or earthquake directly impacting one of Australia's most populous cities. It's almost trite to say that term of reference C raises matters of importance and significance to Australia as a whole. Accordingly, in order to explore the matter, on the 8th of May this year, the Royal Commission published an issues paper entitled Issues Paper Constitutional Framework for the Declaration of a State of National Emergency. The issues paper invited submissions on three questions, which the operator will now display. If I could please have document RCN.900.106.0001. And Commissioners, you'll see the three questions displayed up there. The Commission received 18 responses to the issues paper. In particular, responses were received from the Commonwealth of Australia, the states of New South Wales, Queensland, South Australia, Victoria and Western Australia, as well as from eminent constitutional law practitioners, academics and members of the public. The key issues arising out of those responses will be summarised shortly. To facilitate consideration of the issues paper, the Office of the Royal Commission published a background paper entitled Constitutional Issues and National Natural Disaster Arrangements on the 22nd of May this year. The background paper provided further detail on certain topics, particularly in relation to the external affairs power in the Commonwealth Constitution, under which the Commonwealth Parliament can make laws to implement international agreements to which Australia is a party. I propose now to summarise the, the themes arising from the um, responses to the issues paper. I propose to do so by way of theme rather than summarising the answers to the questions posed. The responses represented a diverse range of issues, sorry, views on the issues. First, many submissions made the point that it was somewhat difficult to answer the questions posed in the issues paper as to the existence of the power to make a declaration of a national emergency in the abstract. 
This is because the Commonwealth Constitution contains no explicit or express head of legislative power that has as its subject matter or purpose national emergencies or natural disasters. In order to understand why our Commonwealth Constitution does not have any express mention of national emergencies or natural disasters, it is useful and helpful to have regard to some history of its drafting. As was mentioned in some of the responses to the issues papers, at the time of Federation, catastrophic fires were a well-known colony-specific issue, with catastrophic fires burning in Victoria while the Constitution's text itself was being debated. Indeed, a Victorian Royal Commission report on relevant issues was published just before Federation. There were other matters of more concern that were a feature of the Convention debates, which it could be surmised drew the particular attention of the participants. The framers of the Constitution assigned to the Commonwealth Parliament the minimum capacities to establish a national polity. Their starting point was that response to and prevention of natural disasters was essentially a local matter and that a standalone power was not to be provided to the Commonwealth Parliament other than to assist the Commonwealth Parliament to appropriate funds to assist states. While some countries' constitutions include a framework for dealing with emergencies, none of the constitutions on which Australia's constitution was based included express emergency powers. This might have influenced the omission of such powers in the Commonwealth Constitution in its final form. Of course, the drafting history of our Constitution is not determinative of whether the Commonwealth is able to make a declaration of a national emergency. It is the words of the Constitution itself that are ultimately determinative. Further, it was known when the Constitution was drafted that the executive power contained in Section 61 of the Constitution would be developed as the nation grew or developed. There are two other matters of overarching relevance or significance that, I that have a bearing upon the discussion that follows that I wish to mention. The first matter is one that is recognized in most of the submissions and underlying most of the submissions. It is one that is in one sense very obvious, but it has significant implications for and informs discussions of matters. It is the nature of federation and federalism. A concept of federalism underlies discussion about the respective roles and responsibilities for the Commonwealth and the states. In one sense, it may be said to be the vibe of the Constitution. The conception of federalism in both its legal and political dimensions clearly has a bearing upon one's perception of the respective roles and responsibilities of the actors, the Commonwealth, the states, and territories within the Federation. The continued existence of the states is a given. Their respective roles and responsibilities and their evolution have always been the subject of different points of view. These views informed the discussion in many of the submissions in relation to the preferable distribution of responsibilities from a policy perspective, as well as in relation to the extent of the Commonwealth's power under the Constitution. The second matter is that climate affects all of Australia. Climate is not constrained by the legal or political boundaries of the Federation. As the Commission has already heard, it necessarily plays a role in many natural disasters. Some submissions highlighted that the changing global climate will lead to a need to respond with increasing speed and agility to more frequent and potentially more severe natural disasters. The first theme for review is the Commonwealth's executive power and the express incidental power. The issues paper considered whether a declaration of a state of national emergency could be made by the Commonwealth, A, without legislation relying only on the Commonwealth's executive power in section 61 of the Constitution, or B, with legislation, where the legislation would rely on the executive power together with the express incidental power contained in section 5139 of the Constitution. The express incidental power enables the Commonwealth to legislate in aid of the executive power. Starting first with section 61, section 61 is as follows. The executive power of the Commonwealth is vested in the Queen and is exercised by the Governor-General as the Queen's representative and extends to the execution and maintenance of this Constitution and of the laws of the Commonwealth. 
The executive power can also be exercised by ministers commissioned by the Governor General and their officers and other officials in the name of the Crown. Section 61 is said to comprise several different types of categories of non-statutory power. First, powers defined by reference to the prerogatives of the Crown, properly attributable to the Commonwealth. Secondly, powers defined by the capacities of the Commonwealth, common to legal persons. And th thirdly, what is called the inherent authority, derived from the character and status of the Commonwealth as national government, which is sometimes referred to as the nationhood power, although sometimes the questions are raised as to its labelling as such. The most accepted formulation of the so-called nationhood power, referred to just then, was put forward by Sir Anthony Mason, as he then was, in the AAP case, and accepted subsequently by the majority of the High Court in PAPE against the Commissioner of Taxation, otherwise known as PAPE's case. That formulation is that it empowers the Commonwealth to engage in activities peculiarly adapted to the government of the nation, which cannot otherwise be carried out for the benefit of the nation. In Pape's case, a majority of the High Court, Chief Justice French and their honours Justices Gummo, Crennan and Bell, concluded that the payment of a tax bonus during the global financial crisis was supported by the executive power of the Commonwealth, combined with the legislative incidental power in section 5139. Their honours Justices Gummo, Crennan and Bell relevantly said at paragraphs 233 and 242 of the judgment that the executive government is the arm of government capable of and empowered to respond to a crisis, be it a war, natural disaster or a financial crisis on the scale here. This power has its roots in the executive power exercised in the United Kingdom up to the time of the adoption of the Constitution, but in form today in Australia it is a power to act on behalf of the federal polity. And at paragraph 242, they adopted the words of Sir Anthony Mason in the AAP case when they said, the present is an example of the engagement by the executive government in activities peculiarly adapted to the government of the country and which otherwise could not be carried on for the benefit of the public. The passages reflect a view of the Federation that I mentioned earlier as a fundamental underlying consideration to any discussion. It was this aspect of the executive power that the submissions generally treated as most relevant to the question of whether the Commonwealth has power to declare a state of national emergency. It was suggested that the nationhood power is best thought of as being derived from or sourced in section 61 of the Constitution rather than it as being implied in the Constitution separately from section 61 or other powers. It is important to understand, as some of the submissions point out, that Pape's case was not a case concerned with a natural disaster, but with an economic crisis. Accordingly, the decision does not, of itself, establish a binding precedent, sorry, binding judicial precedent for dealing with natural disasters. Moreover, it is a feature of the common law system that judicial exegesis, exegesis I'll get it right one time, exegesis, thank you, Ron of meaning occurs over time, often involving the views of several different judges holding sway at various points in time. In this vein, submissions pointed out that it is difficult to apply judicial statements about the nationhood power with certainty or precision. Because of the importance of the Pape decision, I will spend a little bit of time on it. In relation to the Pape decision, some submissions emphasized in varying degrees of detail that the majority judgments in Pape held that a. The executive power extends to activities peculiarly adapted to the government of the country and which otherwise could not be carried on for the benefit of the nation. B. The power is most clearly exercisable in areas in which Commonwealth legislative or executive action involved no real competition with state executive or legislative competence. In relation to the fiscal stimulus measures under consideration in PAPE, only the Commonwealth had the resources needed to respond to the measure, and there was no suggestion that the measure involved any real competition with state legislative or executive competence. The submissions provided by the State of New South Wales had a somewhat extended treatment of the case, and also made several other points. First, that Chief Justice French in the majority in writing separately warned that the power was not a general power to manage the economy, 
Secondly, the majority did not consider the executive power to extend to whatever activity or enterprise the executive deems to be in the national interest. Nonetheless, three of the judges writing together in the plurality appeared to rely on the notion of a national emergency as engaging the power. The three judges did not classify this non-statutory executive power to engage in activities as a nationhood power, and one judge in the majority drew a distinction between this aspect of the executive power and an implied nationhood power. The submission observed that the decision has resulted in some confusion as, the source of the, as to the source of the power, its relationship to other forms of executive power, and the limits that apply to it but that the precise nature of the relationship between the executive power and the implied nationhood power may be academic for the purposes of determining when the power is engaged. A number of submissions cautioned against taking an unduly broad view of what the Commonwealth could do in reliance on Pape's case in this context. A number of submissions noted that it was decided by a 4-3 majority. A number of submissions pointed out that by contrast to the situation in PAPE, the states are clearly in the field of natural disaster response, such that there are limits to what the Commonwealth could do without competing with state legislative or executive competence. This is particularly so in relation to Commonwealth action beyond mere spending. One submission cautioned against placing too much reliance on the reference in PAPE to natural disasters. The caution is based on the notion that the Constitution confers on the Commonwealth express powers relating to war and the economy, but express no powers on the Commonwealth with respect to natural disasters. The caution goes to whether a crisis for which there are no supporting powers under the Constitution, natural disasters, would be treated in a similar way to crises for which there are supporting powers, war and financial crises. The submission of the State of New South Wales noted that the majority judgments in PAPE did not delineate the bounds of what may, might be considered to be a national emergency so as to enliven the executive and legislative power, and that dissenting judgments cast doubt on the scope of the Commonwealth's powers to respond to national emergencies and raise questions about the role of the court relating to executive or legislative responses to national emergencies. What then can the Commonwealth do in reliance on the executive power? There was a general consensus in the submissions that the scope of the nationhood power and the extent to which it could be relied upon by the Commonwealth in taking particular actions in the event of a nat national natural disaster was uncertain. One submission made the point that such uncertainty is highly undesirable in the era of a natural disaster response commissioners that may well, may well be so for both policy and practical reasons. However, with the exception of the State of Western Australia's submission, most submissions agreed, or at least did not dispute the position put forward in the issues paper, that the Commonwealth could rely on the executive power to at least make a declaration of a state of na national emergency that was symbolic, that is, galvanising in nature and gave rise to no further consequences. Beyond that, a number of submissions consider that legislation would likely be needed to enable significant legal consequences to flow from the declaration, depending upon what those consequences were. Accordingly, it is appropriate to have regard also to the Commonwealth's legislative powers, and specifically those heads of power in Section 51 of the Constitution, as a means to support legislation providing for certain measures to address a natural disaster depending upon the nature of those measures. The issues paper and background paper mentioned a number of heads of legislative power that would likely be of most relevance in this context, including the External Affairs Power, Section 5129, the Territories Power, Section 122, the Corporations Power, Section 5120, and the Trade and Commerce Power in Section 511. Other submissions also noted the potential relevance of other powers, namely the quarantine power in section 5119 in the case of a pandemic, the banking power in section 5118 in the case of an attack on the financial system, and the Commonwealth's power to regulate itself, for example, to marshal its own resources. Unfortunately, it would consume considerable time to review those heads of power in any detail. However, the following can be said about the reach of the Commonwealth's legislative powers. First, all of the submissions that dealt with the Commonwealth's legislative power 
appear to accept that a combination of powers, or as it has been called, a smorgasbord or patchwork quilt, can be used, and none of the submissions cast doubt upon that approach from a constitutional perspective. The technique has been used previously, and the technique was upheld by some High Court decisions, including in the Work Choices case in 2006. Most of the submissions discussed the Commonwealth's legislative powers make the point that there may well be gaps in the coverage of any legislative scheme based on Commonwealth heads of legislative power. That is, the Commonwealth legislation would be piecemeal rather than comprehensive, or the heads of power relied upon to support the law might not support its application in every situation that arises. In light of the potential for gaps or the uncertainty as to the extent of the Commonwealth's power to legislate in relation to responding to a natural disaster, some of the submissions favour an approach that involves cooperation between the Commonwealth and the states in the event it is established that there is a need for reform. Several submissions recommended developing a new national legislative framework in collaboration with the states and territories for the purpose of providing a clearer framework for cooperation and clarifying the existence and scope of the Commonwealth's power to assist in the form of a uniform law enacted by the Commonwealth in reliance on referrals of power by the states to the Federal Parliament under Section 5137 of the Constitution. Commonwealth submission noted that Commonwealth laws on many important matters, including corporations, terrorism, personal property securities, fair work and redress for institutional child sexual abuse have been enacted based on referral from the states. The main advantages put forward for such an approach included that would re a remove any uncertainty or doubts about the extent of Commonwealth power, b enable the broadest range of Commonwealth responses in the event of a disaster, and C, emphasise the nature of Australia's cooperative response. In conclusion, the most important propositions emerging from the submissions are as follows. First, there appeared to be a broad consensus that the Commonwealth could declare a state of natural emergency that had merely symbolic effect without needing to enact legislation but that legislation would likely be needed in the event that significant legal consequences were to follow from the declaration. Various views were expressed as to the scope for relying on the executive power combined with the express incidental power to legislate for these legal consequences following from the declaration. However, there was broad consensus that the precise scope for legislating in reliance on the executive power combined with the express incidental power was uncertain. Further, a number of submissions indicated that the legislation, supported by other heads of legislative power, might be needed in order to impose coercive obligations on people. Secondly, there appeared to be broad consensus that the Commonwealth would have some scope to legislate in relation to responding to natural disasters, relying on one or more of its heads of legislative power, such as the corporation's power, trade and commerce power, and so on. However, there also appeared to be a broad consensus that there would be some gaps in terms of what the Commonwealth could do in reliance on these powers. Thirdly, there was strong support in a number of submissions for pursuing Commonwealth legislation based on a referral of powers, referral of powers, including to avoid such uncertainty and gaps as mentioned above. A number of submissions also referred to the possibility of pursuing alternative forms of cooperative Commonwealth state legislative schemes in order to achieve this. And fourthly, and finally, there was a broad consensus that a number of limitations in the Constitution, both those inherent in particular heads of power and separate express or imply limitations in the Constitution, would be relevant to consider in, develop in, any, sorry, in developing any Commonwealth legislation in this area. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairs. Uh, thank you, Chair and Commissioners, for listening. Um, no, thank you for taking us through all that. I think that's been very important. One, one thing to note in all that, it doesn't appear that the Constitution took into account that the growing expectation of the Australian population over time for uh, for a Commonwealth uh, response or action in an, in many areas, I that's, would say. That's correct, Chair. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay, please continue. Thank you. Yes. I just have one quick...
question. Yes. Did it, Mr. Mr. Tarkey, did any of the um, submissions deal with the Commonwealth's power um, to put conditions on um, financial assistance? I don't know. I don't think so. Thank you. No. I'll, I'll, I'll check, but not in not in express terms. No. Okay. Thank you. No, please continue. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, there are some documents to tender for this morning's uh, hearing. Um, and if I could, the documents listed in the tender list provided by Council Assistant can be found at Volume 1, Tab A of your bundle of documents. And the documents in the tender list include, for each witness, either a submission and or organisational response to a notice issued by the Commission. And Chair, I, se I seek to tender the documents in the tender list as a bulk tender and I mm -hmm. seek a direction from you that the documents identified in the tender list, together with the document's identification number, be recorded on the transcript of this, as the documents tendered today. Okay, so we go 30.1 through to 30.15. Yes. Is that... Uh, that's correct. That's correct. Okay, we'll take all those and the documents in between uh, listed in the tender list as exhibits today. Thank you. Thank you. And also, I noticed that you referred to the Constitution there, Mr. Yeah. Togler. Can you just show me that? Because I think most people expect you to wheel it in on a on a trolley, <laughs> and uh, it sits in that uh, that small document there. So yes, it's it's a it's a handy pocket sized version yeah, for, of for the, those that should need it. Yeah, of, but uh, of those who need it, and and um, wonderful bedtime reading, if I may say so. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think it's important because I think most people would expect it to be a far bigger document uh, than what's uh, quite concise on that. Mm. It may well have yeah. been as originally signed. It may signed well have been. I know you can get it online and uh, and, yes. and reference it, but it, uh, I think it just puts a lot of it in perspective as well. Yes, and I think the original price of this was only $2, so <laughs> it, it immensely affordable. I hope not drafting the Constitution. No, no, Could, no. No, just the book. No. Just a little book. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, very you for much, taking us through that. It's a, it's a good context for the rest of the day. And, um, Commissioners, uh, my colleague, Ms Dominic hogan Doran of Senior Council, will be taking the rest of the day. Taking the rest of the day in a seamless transition. Thank you. Thank you. Although, Chair, I feel inadequate because I didn't bring my pocket copy. No, of the I know that you have it, uh, but uh, but I think that was very worthwhile summary. So, Ms hogan Doran, welcome, welcome to the chair. Commissioners, we have a number of witnesses today, as you know. Our first witness uh, is Dr Christine Owen. She will be followed by uh, Mr Mark Crossweller and Mr Campbell Darby. Uh, and then we'll break for morning tea. Then we will have um, Professor Cheryl Saunders uh, until lunchtime. Uh, and then this afternoon, Secretaries uh, Pizzullo and Gaitchens. I call uh, Christine Owen. Professor Owen, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity. No, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, Professor Owen, will you take an oath or an affirmation? Uh, I'll take an oath. Thank you. Professor Owen, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Dr Owen, thank you for joining us today. Um, you're a senior researcher at the University of Tasmania and you're investigating communication coordination and collaborative practices in safety critical and high consequence environments, which seems a very large undertaking, if I may. Uh, the commissioners have a copy of your CV at RCN uh, 900 103 0001, um, that's exhibit uh, 30.4.9. Um, uh, but if I, just before I ask you some questions, if I could just get you to um, describe at a high level some of the research interests that you've had and the contributions that you've made uh, um, to um, uh, okay. emergency um, management. So uh, my, my um, initial uh, beginnings were in the aviation industry. Um, I became involved in uh, exploring uh, technological, cultural and organisational change in the aviation uh, air traffic services uh, sector. Um, from that, uh, I started to get involved in 
uh, looking at work practices in um, emergency medicine uh, and uh, in other high consequence domains. And from 2005, uh, I've been involved in uh, investigating a range of teamwork and coordination issues in uh, the foreign emergency services sector. That includes working at times uh, with uh, various public um, safety organisations. Uh, I've done some work in Queensland with Queensland Police through the Australian Institute of Police Management and I also uh, prepare and support professional capability development with AFAC and the Australian Institute of Disaster Resilience. Thank you. <laughs> Excuse me. That's all right. Um, I'm going to come in a moment to uh, the broader question I want to pursue with you today, which is strategic emergency management. Uh, but if I could just begin with um, some of the work uh, that you've done uh, and your observations in relation to um, in emergency management uh, arrangements, there is a often a process of after-action reviews, and a we've heard evidence of a number of emergency services, indeed nearly all of them now, having introduced what they call lessons management frameworks. Um, just seek your insights as to the utility of those arrangements and how can governments or academia better support emergency management organisations to learn lessons from their experiences of pr previous emergencies and disasters? Okay, um, that's a kind of rather large one. Um, <laughs> it is. I think. <laughs> um, I think uh, what one of the things I've noticed in the past fifteen years is the degree to which uh, there has been a maturing uh, and an opening up and an interest in. Uh, learning um, lessons, identifying through after action reviews, and they've taken a number of different um, uh, vehicles. Um, but that's also in the context of, uh, I think, a, a defensiveness uh, within the foreign emergency services sector of feeling like uh, they are sometimes responsible for outcomes that are beyond uh, their uh, control um, and that they are kind of judged in the media and in particular, um, you know, rightly or wrongly, um, you know, that, you know, there's a focus in on the outcomes and as if it was bleedingly obvious right from the get-go in the moment of um, doing something, making a decision uh, with ambiguous information, with conflicting information, uh, with competing tensions, with fatigue, stress, degraded conditions and so on. Um, and that, that then means that uh, if you're just looking at what happened at the end, you know, it's not kind of taking into account, you know, those aspects of it. So that's kind of one, I think, aspect uh, in terms of after-action reviews. Um, I've been involved um, over the years in a number of internal reviews uh, and some of those have taken uh, different formats. So one, for example, after the Dunalley fires um, in 2013 uh, and um, a similar approach was taken some years later to look at the firefighter deaths in the Linton um, fire uh, was to do a staff ride, so to take people back um, to the site, if you like. It's a kind of military historical approach to learning um, and capability uh, to, to understand the critical decisions that were being taken by people in the field, in the heat of the moment, in the fog of war, um, if you like, um, and then to try and unpack that in a way uh, that isn't as uh, socially defensive, but actually trying to get people to um, better understand what was working in the system uh, for them uh, or not, as the case may be, where did kind of breakdowns start to occur um, so that others may learn. And I think uh, in Australia that's uh, an increasing um, uh, vehicle for understanding what goes on and that in that case um, it's actually been particularly helpful. In contrast, um, I've also sat in on after action reviews where nothing's been written down. Um, and in part, um, that's because of, again, a defensiveness about how might critical reflection actually be taken out of context or misused. Mm. Um, but having said that, and if I can think of another example of being involved in uh, looking at um, 
uh, the tropical uh, cyclone Debbie and the subsequent uh, flooding events in Queensland, um, there was an intentional appreciative inquiry approach taken there uh, and that um, I think to a, a large degree um, that was very beneficial. Um, I'll sum up by also just um, noting that within the broader sector, I think there's been an increasing momentum uh, in trying to understand uh, what we can learn. And people talk about um, just because somebody's had an insight doesn't actually mean learning's occurred unless something's actually changed. Uh, and so it's not good enough for just an author um, of a publication or an after action review or a report to actually say, here are the insights uh, we have now changed. Although sometimes uh, in this industry, there is not a lot of attention paid to implementation uh, and the concerns about some of the complexities with that. Uh, but, um, but broadly, uh, there's an increasing appetite, I think, for learning lessons and for lessons management. Um, I've facilitated a national uh, lessons management forum for the past couple of years. It's been going uh, for a few years longer than that. And increasingly, uh, there's a number of jurisdictions nationally that come together uh, to actually share what they know, um, to critically reflect on a range of novel um, as well as routine problems, and that um, recent work in updating the Lessons Management Handbook as a resource that's on the, I think, ADAR uh, Knowledge Hub uh, is actually supporting as an infrastructure that kind of process. Now, um, thank you so much for that response, um, uh, Professor Owen. In relation to the work that you've done, I might just have noted for the commissioners because they do have it, uh, but I want to move on to a related topic. Uh, there's the, um, published in the Institute of Public Administration Australia in 2018 is uh, a research and evaluation piece titled Enhancing Learning and Emergency Services Organisational Work, which is RCN 900. Yes. Uh, 1000031, um, which you co-authored with uh, Benjamin Brooks and Stephen Kernan and Chris Beerman, from, um, the, the first two from your university and um, Mr Beerman from Central Queensland University. And I just want to flag um, one of the matters that you raise in that, in that, um, uh, that publication is that uh, there's a risk um, that uh, uh, the guidelines and directives that have been identified to try to manage risk within uh, these emergency organisations uh, has the risk of or the counterproductive response of stifling learning by creating risk averse cultures. Is that something that you perceive that the lessons management framework or in the way that you have described the lessons management processes can seek to arrest that um, potential counterproductive outcome? I think uh, the, there, there are a number of cultural and structural factors at play. Uh, one is, um, by very nature, in foreign emergency services, they tend to be quite reactive and responsive. That's their mode of operation. Um, and then to move into a critically reflective stance where we might take even a near miss um, or an accident and... Um, replay it as a potential opportunity to learn from, um, you know, can become challenging. And I think um, in relation to that notion of, of what becomes risk averse is that, um, and, you know, it, in many complex organisations, uh, a change in one part of the organisation can actually lead to more problems somewhere else. So um, I think part of the problem uh, in after action reviews and in inquiries is that uh, we can come up with a range of different uh, recommendations, um, but in fact, uh, they can be contradictory to each other. Uh, they can then uh, create other um, problems and bottlenecks further down the track. Uh, and that in some of those cases, things just become too hard. You know, it's just too complex. So the notion of, of things then becoming risk averse is the concern about um, letting the community down, about um, not wanting to sit, to be seen, uh, to be doing the wrong thing, um, as well as uh, in that particular paper, it talks about the pace of change that's actually been occurring within this particular sector, especially over the past five or eight years, um, that people now talk about having no downtime. 
um, no time between seasons uh, to actually be able to uh, to stop and think about how they might be rechanging things and, and rearranging them uh, so that um, you know, there might be better outcomes. Um, you mentioned the Cyclone Debbie review. I'll just note for the commissioners that it's Exhibit 18.2.23 and a review action plan at 18.2.28. I'm reminded by Mr Glover that that was tendered during our IGEM day, as we called it. You recently chaired uh, a panel of the Victorian and Queensland Inspector Generals of Emergency Management. Um, the Victorian IGEM has recently provided his report to the Victorian Government on the 29 2020-2020. 2019-2020 bushfires um, and the Royal Commission awaits receipt of that report. Um, in your opinion, what is the importance or value of the role of the IGEM in the emergency management frameworks? Uh, it's a good question and I think that um, there are a number of other um, aspects in terms of um, uh, sorry, I just had an interruption downstairs unexpected um, uh, that in addition to the Inspector Generals, for example, um, there have been, um, in the case of, of Victoria, especially post uh, Black Saturday, uh, there's been an increasing uh, role for uh, what they've called um, kind of real-time performance monitoring that's been going on. Now, initially, uh, within the sector, um, that kind of uh, scrutiny uh, was regarded as, um, you know, people felt quite kind of defensive about it and, and defensive about, well, what, what's an IGEM going to be looking at and are they going to beat us over the head with a stick again? Um, and so I think what has actually happened and is evolving uh, in both of those uh, jurisdictions uh, is, an, is both an acceptance that... Um, having someone look over your shoulder isn't actually to imply that you don't know how to do your job or that you're doing it wrongly, uh, but actually in the case of monitoring uh, and quality assurance, which in part is large part is the IGM role, is actually a kind of reassurance and a calibration and a feedback mechanism, particularly for people who are involved in uh, real-time uh, performance monitoring, uh, to actually provide a resource and a support uh, for those people rather than another big stick. So is, is, is um, having an IGM more than just giving communities confidence in the, uh, in the performance in, of the emergency managers? Um, I would believe so. Uh, I think that um, if, if I'm, and I'm linking in uh, my own uh, thought process here, uh, towards um, one of one of the AFAC initiatives is the Emergency Management Professionalisation Scheme. Yes. Uh, and it strikes me uh, that um, thinking about iGEMS in a quality assurance uh, feedback monitoring role um, and the idea of what a profession has uh, in terms of the ways that it um, reviews itself, uh, the standards that it might set, um, the accountabilities in terms of how it checks, audits, kind of what's, what performance is occurring, um, is uh, in fact the, the IGM role. I'll also um, note though that in that um, presentation, uh, that webinar, that both um, IGEM spoke about the journey uh, that they have been on, uh, which included kind of moving uh, from, and th these are my words, not theirs, but moving from you know, a kind of post um, hoc, uh, well, what actually happened, what went wrong uh, approach potentially uh, to a more appreciative inquiry, a le you know, what lessons can we learn from this in order to continue to sustain uh, good practice uh, to identify where there might have been slips and lapses that we got away with um, at the time uh, that could have turned into something uh, far worse, as well as what we can actually learn for improvement. Thank you, um, Prof uh, Professor Owen. What I want to take you now is to that broader um, question of strategic level emergency management and how that differs in context and content to operational and 
tactical level responsibilities and then what's the importance for that. If we could have um, uh, just identified to the commissioners and have shown, uh, this is the publication from the International Journal of Disasters in 2017, which you co-authored, addressing challenges for future strategic level emergency management, uh, reframing networking and capacity building. That's RCN 900-100-0013. Uh, which is Exhibit 30.4.3. Just have that identified for the benefit of the transcript. And while that's being brought up, uh, Professor Owen, uh, that's RCN 900 100 Thank you, Operator. Um, while that's just being brought up, could you just, uh, as a preliminary point, uh, explain to the Commissioner, for the Commissioner's benefit, how strategic level emergency management differs in, in its context and its content to operational and tactical level responsibilities, and what importance does that then have for evaluation? Okay. Um, uh, can I address the question with a potted history of kind of how Please. the forms of emergency management organising have evolved? Um, so basically, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I started uh, looking at um, local level incident management teams and teamwork and, and information flows uh, in the first phase of the work with the CRC. That was kind of about 2005. Um, contextually, uh, it was also just a few years after uh, the national um, adoption of, of the AIM, what's now known as AIMS, and I know that that's been discussed, the Australasian Inter-Service um, Incident Management uh, System. Um, and, and so it was kind of interesting to see a few kind of variations of that in the early days. There were some jurisdictions who weren't on board with it. There were others who'd embraced it. At that point, um, how we managed an emergency was framed up as, you know, there's an incident controller, there are four other people in um, an incident, a local level incident management team, operations, logistics, planning, um, and they might, if things kind of uh, get um, complicated or go on for a while, need subunits within them. So we have situation within planning and resources in, uh, and so on. Um, and so, um, then events uh, were were larger, and there was then uh, a bit of inquiry into well, how was it that people at a regional level and a state level were accessing that information? How were they supporting it? Um, and and in particular, after Black Saturday, um, there was a lot of work done in uh, Victoria about better understanding the the regional footprint, and I've uh, been uh, observing uh, the uh, Commission's hearings for the past few days, and you know, I know that um, you know, the discussion about resource sharing has come up, um, and in fact, uh, what's uh, the focus there at a regional level is actually to organise, uh, 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 you might have multiple incident management teams, for example, operating within a particular region, and then how does that feed up uh, to, uh, to a state level? I recall being involved in an internal review at the time about, you know, uh, well, certainly post Black Saturday, let's just say, and making the observation that what seemed to be happening was that the roles and responsibilities at the local level were being duplicated at the regional level and then duplicated again at the state level. Um, and so the question was, well, what, how is that adding value uh, rather than just adding up number of fire trucks, number of personnel, uh, etc.? Uh, and so, uh, and within the agencies, they were already looking at that. And so, a variety of different roles and responsibilities have since morphed and evolved uh, within those arrangements. Um, and and having then been involved in looking at um, what happens above the local incident management team, um, I've um, also observed a number of state operation centres, and I know they've been briefly mentioned in the last couple mm -hmm. of days. Um, and one of the things that uh, struck me is that um, people at the time had a maturity uh, within uh, the sector of understanding what kind of professional development and training was needed to undertake the, the roles at a local incident management level. Uh, there was uh, patchy um, involvement uh, in trying to think about what the roles and skills and tasks uh, and skill sets might be uh, for operating differently 
uh, especially given that people uh, typically end up at a state um, operations centre coming not always but typically through the ranks of uh, being an operations officer or an incident controller and then taking it up to that state level, that sometimes uh, we're observing challenges when, uh, say, if, if push comes to shove and things are starting to get um, particularly uh, stressful or there's pressure from other sources like ministers and premiers wanting to know what's going on, um, to uh, people at a state level reverting back to be becoming tactical and micromanaging um, and trying, and in some cases, subverting this, the uh, organising um, information flows uh, that were supposed to be helping them by going through the back door to get kind of information. And so we spent some time within uh, the industry um, identifying, well, what is similar and different about um, these particular roles and responsibilities? They're, they're, not, um, uh, they're not duplicated. And so at a strategic level, um, the, the crisis leadership attributes are, are quite different. Uh, they're, they're not at the immediate responsive um, approach. They're about trying to understand what that whole of government uh, need is, to be thinking about uh, consequence management. And I know um, Emergency Management Victoria have done a lot of work uh, in articulating uh, recently what, um, you know, the, the primary, secondary, tertiary consequences, the immediate, medium, long-term um, impacts might be. Uh, and that, that also then raises the question about the level of, of uh, communication, ambassadorial uh, skills, diplomacy skills that might be required uh, for trying to get the best out of um, the people that you're working with. Because the other thing uh, that I think is important um, to identify is that at a state, even without thinking about kind of cross state borders, a major event um, being operated out of a state operations centre involves hundreds of people. And that of those hundreds of people, frequently there are many, many liaison officers from different organisations. Mm -hmm. So uh, at a state level, uh, there's a need for people to be having input and providing information to um, telecommunications utilities. They are playing a, a, their response role. Uh, it's not just uh, the fire and emergency services responders on the ground who are involved in the event. Uh, they, uh, telcos are responsible for getting those uh, community warnings out. Uh, there's issues around uh, infrastructure, and gas, electricity uh, within those agencies or, or sectors. There's been a considerable um, devolution, so you can't even talk about a gas provider. You've got to talk about 18 different parts um, and various others who might be involved. Mm. Uh, there are issues, indirect issues, communities of interest, um, tourism, tourism ministers, um, ministerial liaison on people and so on. So hence, um, it's, it, you can't um, at that point think that um, and, uh, and you know, a, a state operations officer or a state response manager or a, a duty officer or whatever they call themselves, depending on what um, jurisdiction you're in, nevertheless uh, then have to bring those people to the table and try and get the best out of them. And I noticed in uh, Mr Murphy's um, uh, comments yesterday uh, that each of those um, representatives within a state operations centre are also running their own um, operations centre. So the police have theirs, uh, the telcos have theirs, health have theirs, and in relation to health, they too might be having their own emergency in terms of, you know, where are the triple O calls coming from? Can they reach those people, for example? So some some of those issues. So I think you've going you, on. I think you've covered quite a number of the core challenges which uh, were identified in the research. In fact, I think you've expanded beyond those. If I just have those shown to the commissioners, zero zero one five. Um, operator, we could have that document back up and have 0015 and have the core challenges um, uh, identified. Just in that, thank you. Um, so this is a study that was undertaken. The methodology included uh, interviews and workshops with Australia's senior emergency managers uh, and um, the 
I'll just capture these for the transcript because I think they've, you've dealt with many of them, uh, that the core challenges confronting these as um, strategic level emergency managers was increasingly complex to context, the environmental, social and technological change, the tensions between political drivers and operational realities, the role of emergency management and community resilience, measures of effectiveness and information systems and social media, all different ways of identifying um, some of the different the, the many challenges that they must um, operate within, which I think captures a lot of what you've already said. Um, what I want to take you to in the time available so that the commissioners um, can ask any questions they have is um, at 0026, which is the conclusion. Uh, it's a, a neat way of capturing the things I want to address. Uh, in the first paragraph there, operator, uh, the, the how to address those, those challenges, those core challenges, um, I'll just wait for that to be brought up. Thank you. Uh, what you've done is, I think you've you've touched on the last there, which is to develop the capacity of strategic level emergency managers. You've picked up the the, the need for them to have, adapt into ambassadorial and diplomacy skills and work within that political environment that they must have, as well as responding to community expectations. Um, I think you'd started to talk uh, edge into this second uh, matter there of adopting a network governance approach uh, and then reframing ultimately emergency management as a part of the disaster risk reduction. In the time that we have available, if I could just invite you to address those two matters to provide some explanation or insights for the commissioners on how that work then all pulls together. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so the idea of, uh, and that was work co-authored with um, Steve Kernan and Karen Bosomworth, so um, uh, we kind of uh, spent some time uh, thinking about uh, these implications, is that um, to recognise that um, trying to come up with yet another mammoth um, organisational bureaucratic structure where everything, you know, was being organ or coordinated um, and uh, decided upon uh, is not going to work for, for the reasons I was just explaining in terms of all of those various um, uh, organisations, public and private and jurisdictions having their own legislations, their own accountabilities and so on. So then the question becomes, well, how might... Um, those organisations best work together. And I think um, in uh, the uh, commentary that's been made over the past few days, people have, have kind of stuck pretty solidly to, you know, my authority is within my state. Um, and, um, and interestingly, um, some have made reference to the political sphere uh, and those kind of relationships. Uh, but mostly it's about, you know, how do you... Um, make sure that you're sharing relevant information and acting in a coordinated way, but providing autonomy uh, to uh, various units of organisation to be able to get on and do what they do. Uh, and in relation to that idea about network governance, I just wanted to um, observe that Australia isn't alone in um, facing this particular conundrum. There's been a lot of work uh, that's been undertaken in the US um, at the Harvard Kennedy uh, School of Crisis Leadership uh, looking at exactly this issue. And uh, there's a recent paper um, that's come out that um, talks about how you know, the, the kind of organisational frameworks that might have served us well 40 or 50 years ago, uh, and I'd put, you know, these kind of AIMS type approaches um, in that to some degree, um, is that, uh, that they are um, not uh, serving us well in an environment with the speed of challenges and the need for flexibility and agility. So the question then is how do we decentralise uh, decision making about uh, relevant issues uh, in a way uh, that don't, doesn't create bottlenecks uh, but in fact allows people uh, in their various communities of interest to get on and do, do what they do. The idea about uh, reframing emergency management as a component of disaster risk reduction um, has, you know, some um, differences of opinion uh, that um, in part uh, the, the um, emergency services response sector is seen um, as um, 
having to clean up um, a lot or they, uh, the, in the interview comments that are listed in that paper um, that they end up needing to be responding to uh, other public policy decisions that have been taken uh, about floodplains and about uh, not putting infrastructure into levy banks and so on. Uh, but there's also an issue here um, that, uh, that is about, well, where does the, the funding for emergency management go? Does it go um, to people who are clearly and tangibly responding to crises or does it go into uh, creating um, resilience in, in infrastructure um, and in communities that mean that there's no need um, or there's there's little need for um, uh, for uh, those emergency responders in the first place. And of course, you know, I think there's probably a bit of um, disquiet within the emergency services sector about that. But having said that, it's since this paper has been <laughs> written, um, and I'll make the I'll observe that it's 2016, and in fact. You know, it was based on material that was, had been completed in 2014 and the publisher took about 18 months to, to get it to publish. Um, that in the most recent few years, there's been a lot of work uh, within emergency services agencies about community engagement uh, and about um, uh, uh, kind of how might um, not only community engagement but how might... Uh, emergency services people work with communities so that uh, they're not in a situation where they need uh, to be rescued or, or in crisis. And I'll, I'll use the opportunity, if I can, uh, uh, since we're talking about this, um, to, I was thinking yesterday about the question that's been asked here um, in relation to you know, how decisions are made if there's a need for, for really limited uh, resources um, and there might be jurisdictions squabbling over where they go. Um, and, and two things come to mind. One is um, in the context of disaster risk reduction uh, and in the context of escalating uh, events, what happens if there are no resources? Uh, what happens if... Um, uh, you know, the cavalry from uh, interstate or internationally doesn't come. Um, what then might happen? And then how might, in a disaster risk reduction context and community engagement, we think about um, self-organising emergent groups? Um, you know, we talk about the Mud Army, we talk about the tensions in Tasmania uh, at the time of the Denali fires between... Uh, the, the We Can Help Facebook group, for example. Mm -hmm. And so I think we should expand um, our views of seeing emergency management and emergency response as something that's simply the province of uh, the foreign emergency services sector uh, and um, that we've got um, resources who have done certain firefighting training are actually coming in. Um, and, and supporting uh, different communities. I'm thinking also of a case where, um, and I don't know the degree to which uh, the Commission um, has looked at volunteering, but, but just very briefly, um, there, are, there are, in large part, most jurisdictions would call on volunteers to be supporting, like a reserve, if you like, um, and uh, those people are seen as an extension of the Foreign Emergency Service. Um, in um, other jurisdictions, they've taken a different approach um, to recognising that uh, people uh, in communities might have an interest in uh, just supporting and protecting their patch. Uh, and so they have provided uh, resources and empowerment and uh, materials to those people in their cul-de-sac at the end of a ridge uh, to actually be able to defend that. So the, the necessary resources from a firefighting perspective um, may not be needed um, in that particular uh, area. So I think that in terms of framing emergency management in terms of disaster risk reduction, there's a lot uh, more that can be done. Uh, thank you so much, um, Professor Owen, and thank you also for the discussions that we have had in days leading up to um, this morning's session. Um, I, I note that I need to make time for the commissioners to ask some questions, but it, it, just capturing what you've done in terms of synthesising um, the evidence, your observations on the evidence that we've heard this week and, uh, and um, marrying that with the research that you've done, it does sound like um, uh, 
we're not just looking at a whole of government question, but a whole of society question. Yep, I'd agree. All right. Chair. Dr. Owen, thank you uh, this morning. In fact, you've distilled a lot of it and brought it a lot to, together, and we appreciate that. We've, we've uh, talked amongst the Commission a lot about uh, just because you identify a lesson doesn't mean it's been learnt. Uh, in fact, I've been involved with a lot of lessons over the years that don't seem to be learnt, that just get identified over and over again. So, you know, we're very conscious of that, uh, and we are very conscious that the Commission won't be making recommendations that lead to something being done different. Uh, we're looking at things being done better, and uh, and so we're definitely what we're definitely looking at that distinction. Um, can I just ask one one particular uh, question? And if you, you alluded to it, but I'd really like you to, to try and give me a little bit more insight, if you could, or comment. Oh, um, and it comes from the fact that in a previous life. Uh, being involved with large, complex operation centres and uh, bringing it all together, watching people come in and they get operational centre capture, and you just watch their eyes open and uh, they, they get dragged into it. Could you make a, a comment or an observation, please, on issues of jurisdictional strategic level leadership getting dragged into those operational day-to-day -day issues and the traps that may be encountered and start and getting dragged into just looking at life through that lens. Does that question make make sense? Uh, uh, yes, it does. Yeah. Um, and some immediate examples come to mind. Um, yeah, me too. Uh, and I think, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, and I think, um, like again, if we um, just uh, broaden the scope here of kind of roles and responsibilities um, and how. Uh, uh, problems might be solved um, collectively and collaboratively. The examples that come to mind are ones where um, you, you've got um, a Premier or a Minister um, on the phone who wants to know exactly what's happening in a particular location. That then uh, sets um, the wheels turning uh, and uh, suddenly uh, we've got people on uh, on an incident ground who should be getting on and doing the job, uh, trying to double check their counting um, so that the minister can make an, a comment about the number of resources that are available in a particular place. So suddenly everybody's diverted uh, because of a particular request um, rather than uh, you know being able to have some boundaries around how uh, where where the you know, questions might be, how to respond to that, because uh, when people are at a state level, they too can get wrapped up in that and then wanting to micromanage. Um, so I think that there's there are some um, capability uh, issues. There's potentially some uh, policy issues around uh, how do we actually put boundaries around um, you know what can be provided when. Um, and certainly some of the um, information technologies actually now, I think, are, are better um, in terms of providing support for that. But I think it's also about assisting people to recognise uh, what are the right questions to be asking um, and to be taking a, um, you know, a more a higher level approach rather than uh, wanting to know exactly how that person is managing that particular event uh, because they might do it differently. So I think there's, and, and ironically, having mentioned some of the information technologies, I've also observed that sometimes uh, if you uh, get a, a situation where you've actually got a visual um, in a state operations centre of what might be going on on the ground in a particular place, uh, people get wrapped up and start kind of looking at that as if they were there. And I have a... Um, a, uh, an anecdote from um, being involved uh, or being involved with a colleague who was observing a, um, uh, a critical uh, hostage um, exercise uh, and the people in the state ops centre were so obsessed with kind of what was going on at a particular location, uh, they didn't notice on another screen uh, that hostages had actually been captured and, and, and uh, taken away. Now, you know, that's, a, that's an example simply of how we can become distracted 
uh, we can uh, engage in tunnel vision uh, and under those circumstances we've actually kind of lost the plot. Uh, thank, and I've seen that as well in an operational sense as well. And so then that's getting dragged down into the operations. Can you make a comment then on the ability then if you're getting dragged down to make those overall strategic level decisions more broader than that operation itself? Have you seen anything in that in lessons that you might have drawn out? Um, I think that, um, again, uh, there's a lot of work happening within uh, the jurisdictions on um, an AIDS memoir uh, templates uh, that are asking a different set of questions. Uh, so it's easy, you know, to start to think about the tangible, you know, what might we, um, you know, uh, count up in terms of resources or, or phone calls or and so on. Uh, but there are other kinds of questions uh, that can be asked uh, that actually start to lift uh, the level of conversation. And um, just on that, um, and again, at an exercising uh, perspective, one of the things that I've noticed that makes a big difference to how effective a, you know, a strategic level can be um, is whether the, uh, the state response manager is actually asking a question about um, what can other liaison people bring to a particular problem that they might have and actually leaving how they address that particular problem to them um, and uh, rather than saying, I need X satellites here uh, because the state response manager thinks that that's the answer to the problem. Uh, you would be familiar uh, with your military background in some of the work in Mission Command, for example. Yes. Um, and that's about uh, approaches where, um, you know, at a where we're having self-organising units that are operating within a bigger scope and a bigger uh, intent, the commander's intent. Uh, that's actually uh, people are, are trained in being able to identify those broader objectives uh, and allowing uh, people to to be able to respond to them in their own way rather than micromanaging or specifying the tasks that they ought to do in order to address that. Uh, but on that, um, I've observed in jurisdictions both good examples of that practice mm -hmm. and poorer ones. Uh, and so, again, I think the issue here is... Uh, if you're going to introduce uh, some kind of change in uh, decision making that supports um, interoperational governance, then how do you actually make sure that people are skilled up and confident uh, about their role within that broader complex system? Yeah, and I appreciate that. I think in the military term, you're referring to something like centralised command, decentralised execution within the bounds of the. Uh, um, and and I probably one more thing. I, I think if I can summarise. Also, if everyone's looking at today, who's looking at tomorrow? Who's looking at next next week? Yeah. Okay, I've taken a lot of your time. I appreciate you uh, giving a little bit more insight there. I'll ask Commissioner Bennett. Uh, Thank three you. Questions. Um, just one observation. Um, you made the comment about what might be, but there's no resources, what might be the case, and you might, I don't know if you've been watching all of the Royal Commission evidence, but there was there have been some lovely examples of what has happened where, um, for example, at Lobatall in South Australia, where there were no resources available and how the local community um, responded. You might find that interesting to check that evidence out for your own sake, because, of course, what comes to mind today is that Beirut may well be finding itself in part of that situation. But the question I have for you is just one. Um, going back to the question of an iGEM, and of course it's it, the concept of an Inspector General of Emergency Management, um, there's been a lot of focus upon an iGEM in the response, looking at the response phase, but an iGEM is also... For all the other parts that you've discussed and identified, there's also questions of um, mitigation, resilience and um, the, the, amount, the, amount, the distribution of fund and funding and assistance during the recovery phase. Um, can you comment on the role that you might see, for example, for a national IGEM in that situation, not getting into the constitutional issues that we looked at before, but perhaps not looking so much at response, but the role, the potential role of an IGEM in the broader questions um, of emergency management? Um, 
there's, there's a thing. So if we were looking at um, the role of an iGEM at a national level, uh, which I think uh, could be really interesting, uh, it would also uh, be useful, I think, to, to start to um, explore uh, the ways in which even, you know, the whole quality assurance and monitoring approach is being undertaken across jurisdictions. Um, you know, not all of them have iGEMS, but they certainly have, um, you know, quality assurance and monitoring approaches. What might we learn uh, in terms of the similarities and differences there? How might an iGEM, even at a state level, uh, provide the enabling conditions for some of the conversations that, that need to happen around mitigation and preparedness? Um, I'm reminded that... Um, uh, and for some reason, your comment uh, reminded me that at a national level, uh, the uh, the Commonwealth used to fund um, the Australian Emergency Management Institute, uh, and it provided a national capability development role for people from various state jurisdictions to come together to share what they knew um, to to learn uh, in a variety of different um, accredited and, and professional development contexts. Those people from uh, different uh, state jurisdictions included uh, the uniforms as well as police, some military, some humanitarian aid organisations, uh, local government and so on. And by putting all of those people um, into a particular uh, space, they, they at least, even if it wasn't the direct intention, um, had the opportunity to learn about each other and to learn about how things might have been similar or different you know, across uh, various borders. I think Australia lost some momentum uh, when that was defunded uh, with the incoming government, and I'm, I know that there are a variety of reasons for it, uh, but, but the need for that kind of national coordinating um, around capability development and thinking, uh, leaving aside just, uh, you know, how uh, an operational response mode might operate, um, I think would be a really important step forward. Thank you very much. Commissioner McIntosh. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Professor Owen. Um, I was really interested in the article that you wrote with Karen um, Bosomworth, I think is her name, and other, and other colleagues, and particularly comments in there about incoherency in the policy arrangements that we currently have and the inconsistency in the incentives that we're sending people which are impeding resilience. And I think the story that's told there by, uh, well, reported there by a senior um, emergency person is, is how we tell the individual and communities that it's their responsibility to, to be resilient and be prepared, yet when disasters occur, they turn up, well, in that case, I think you were describing how when there's a flood, they turn up with helicopter, helicopters and all sorts of other equipment to help people. And, and that, that, th that scenario is, is impeding resilience. And I just wondered whether you had, your research had thrown up um, the extent to which that is actually occurring, the extent to which those inconsistencies in, in policy messaging and policy incentives is actually impeding resilience. Uh, I, I think... Uh, again, um, uh, somebody used the word the vibe before in, t in terms of talking about the, the Constitution. I think we're on a journey. Um, and I know that, you know, that's a, a kind of phrase that gets thrown around. But um, uh, I have noted that um, over time there seems to be a little bit more um, uh, coordination um, in what the messaging is. Uh, that occurs at a state disaster level uh, to the various political representatives, for example, to how um, aspects might be um, rolled out. But I think uh, there's also some issues in here about community expectations. And I noted in the opening address uh, that that came up you know, as you know one of the growing um, issues around well, the expectations of what the Commonwealth or, or state governments or local governments uh, might actually be doing. Uh, and I, I suspect that uh, there's a lot of work uh, that's needed uh, in just clarifying the environments that people live in, uh, what can reasonably be expected and 
and not um, taking potentially cheap shots um, if, for example, the helicopter doesn't drop bread, you know, at um, that particular flooded location. You know, so I think there, there's still um, uh, the capacity for mixed messaging uh, and I think there are still uh, differences in understanding around what shared responsibility, uh, what community resilience even means. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the future, there are going to be particular issues that we would be better to get proactive about uh, rather than trying to deal with them in the moment. Thank you. And I hope you're keeping warm down there in Tasmania with the snow. <laughs> You've got no idea. <laughs> yeah, we do. It was minus four here this morning, so it, we got an idea. Um, Professor Owen, thank you very much. We appreciate it. it was a, it's been a very beneficial session. I must say you've got the best office I think I've seen this week too behind you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Ms. Hogan-Doran. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. There's nothing from parties with leave, so may uh, Dr Owen be um, released from her summons. Dr. Owen, thank you very much. We appreciate it and uh, your release from your summons. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Commissioner, the next panel is uh, is ready, so we'll call them. Uh, uh, I call Mr. Mark Crossweller, AFSM, uh, and Mr. Campbell Darby, DSCAM. Mr. Crosweller, please don't stop on our behalf. Mr. Darby, good to see you again. <laughs> Thank you for joining us this morning. Commissioner, good to see you. Thank you. Uh, both Mr. Crosweller and Mr. Darby will affirm. Mr. Crosweller, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Darby. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, just for the benefit of the other commissioners, if you could each, uh, I'll go to you first, Mr Darby, and then you, Mr Crossweller, just to outline your background uh, and what has brought you here today. Um, thank you, Council, and uh, good morning, commissioners. Um, uh, my background is uh, fairly long-term military. Uh, I then transitioned into the Northern Territory Government where I was involved in um, strategic emergency management. I was the Territory's Recovery Coordinator, uh, a number of other portfolios up there around security, major events, etc. Uh, and I then uh, transitioned from there to become Director General of Emergency Management Australia, uh, Mark Crosswell's predecessor. Um, and that was at the time of um, the 2010-11 floods, um, the Japanese tsunami, etc. And since then, I've been uh, privately consulting in um, the area of emergency management, whole of government crisis coordination with both the Commonwealth and a number of states and territories. Thank you much. Thank you so much, Mr. Darby. And I'll just note, commissioners, that Mr. Darby's um, extended ref, uh, resume is at DAR 500-001-0001. Mr. Crosswell, I'll go to you. Um, thanks, Council. Good morning, everybody. Um, so, Mark Crosswell, I, I commenced um, in emergency management um, in 1985 as a volunteer firefighter in the New South Wales Bushfire Brigades, um, as a volunteer for about 10 years, and simultaneously was in. Uh, engineering and consulting industry. Um, in 1994, I came on uh, staff full time as an inspector. Um, 1996, as superintendent. 98, as assistant commissioner. Uh, 2009, as commissioner. In 2012, as director general of EMA. Um, the uh, totals, and then uh, in March 2018, the head of the National Resilience Task Force, also for the federal government. Um, There's a total of about 35 years uh, in the sector. Thank you, Mr. Crosswell. And oh. Sorry, I interrupted you. Keep going. Oh, I could tell you what I'm doing now. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so I'm now Director of Ethical Intelligence, which is my own advisory company, um, Senior Advisor to KPMG, uh, and Director of the Bushfire National Hazards CRC. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. And commissioners, um, uh, Mr Crosswell's resume is at RCN 900 102 0001. Um, what I will do, uh, gentlemen, is, is just come to you both um, uh, in the first instance, focusing on your prior roles as Director Generals of EMA. Uh, we heard some evidence. I'm not sure whether you were able to hear the evidence of uh, Dr Owen or any of the other evidence uh, during the course of this week. But one of the questions um, we explored with Dr Owen and I put to uh, your um, successor, uh, Mr Cameron, uh, yesterday was the idea of reframing emergency management uh, within the broader risk reduction and resilience frameworks. Um, and I wondered whether if you could provide uh, to the commissioners some insights as to how, um, A, that question, and then B, how EMA could best facilitate that going forward. It's a large question to start, but um, uh, I have confidence you'll be able to engage. And I might go... Uh, uh, to you, Mr. First, Mr. Crossweller. Um, thank you, Council. I think um, the first thing I'd say is that um, we can't respond our way out of these problems. Um, I, I think uh, response is a, is a critical factor, of course, and, and does it need strategic uplift in the face of what we uh, experienced uh, last summer and will continue to experience probably in a more intense and more frequent way into the future, then the answer is absolutely yes. Um, but the difficulty is that only seen in that context without looking at the broader of risk reduction and resilience will continue, I think, to lead to systemic failures in how we deal with these problems. So um, response is uh, essentially the last risk treatment action uh, that we have available to us. And if we don't incorporate uh, more strategic uh, considerations of risk reduction in our in our institutional policies, particularly about where and how we place ourselves upon the landscape uh, going forward in anticipation of such effects, um, then I think, again, we'll end up in a bit of a pickle. Um, resilience also, it's not possible to be resilient if risk um, reduction is not enacted at the highest level and enacted systemically, because um, without reducing harms in the system, then it's almost impossible to be resilient to the production of harm and the uncontrolled production of harm. So, so we find in these um, environments that the capacity for response or its effectiveness actually drops off in the worst of circumstance. And by way of practical example, the aircraft can't fly, firefighters can't get in. Uh, in, a, in, in the flooding context, the same thing happens. Aircraft rarely can get up because they get socked in and flood boats can't launch. And so the capabilities actually, as much as they're um, immense and we could invest more in them and they're useful for the purpose, actually become degraded in the worst of circumstance. So that forces us to rely even more systemically on the risk production that we've, we've undertaken prior to the day of the event and the, and the extent to which citizens and systems and institutions can be resilient to those effects. So it has to be seen in that totality, I think, Council, and, um, and to that extent, I think EMA or its, or its um, emerging entity um, would need to take forward that totality of responsibility, I think, but it does extend well beyond emergency management mm -hmm. uh, to agency policy at, at the jurisdictional, state and territory level, local government level as well, of course, and also at the national level. So I think with what we're facing going forward, to see this only as, as an emergency management problem would be remiss. Um, we would probably end up uh, it, it probably end up in a worse space in five to ten years if we did that, if we don't take a more systemic and strategic view of, the, of risk creation, risk production, and the necessary systemic resilience that we need to put in place uh, to deal with these effects, particularly when response gets degraded in the worst of circumstance. Um, I'd probably finish by saying that um, resilience is admirable and necessary, but it also has a limit. Um, as citizens, particularly during the course of my career, I, I'm really yet to find someone who wasn't trying to do the best they could in the worst of circumstance. And whether they've met the resilient standards that the government has set for them is a different question, and whether they could, in fact, even meet those standards is a, a, another question yet again. But they do do the best they can, and they turn to uh, institutions for support when they become highly vulnerable, so their resilience runs out uh, or they hit a limit. It, it does concern me that, that uh, increasingly the capacity for institutional support in that circumstance isn't there. 
Um, and I think there's been a degradation in in the, uh, the structural, social and economic supports for resilience over the last 20 to 30 years, which is showing up now where people are turning for assistance and help and it's not uh, there perhaps to the extent to which it could be. Um, and I think this season really highlighted that. Um, some of the narrative in the media was you know, the governments could do no more. Uh, you know, we literally, in the headlines were saying, expect people to die, catastrophic conditions are about to manifest. Uh, people should abandon the, their localities and follow instructions and so it goes on. Um, that sort of leaves this profound public policy question, is that an acceptable position to be in into the future? And I think the answer has to be no. So there has to be systemic and institutional responses to this in, in concert with, um, you know, greater awareness at the level of the citizenry, but also um, helping them to reach the capacity to meet the resilient standards that we hope that they will achieve. That has to be dealt with in its totality systemically going forward and being led at the national level um, and carried across all levels of government in order to make sure that we're properly positioned for the inevitability of these things into the future. And there is we, we've published on inevitability now for six or seven years, not, not, not to be dramatic, because I think it's simply a fact of life, I think. Uh, and, and, you know, my, my, my last final point, because I already said final point, but um, governments are the insurers of last resort. And, and really, uh, we can't trade off risk on the basis of rarity, uh, because we don't have all the controls to do that in natural hazards. Um, and therefore, we have to accept the manifest consequence of the of, of the catastrophic end of disaster, and make sure we understand it and the extent to which we are able position for it. And governments, particularly, cannot escape that responsibility. Mr. Thank Darby, you, Council, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Crosswell, and Mr. Darby. I'll come to you. I did I did ask the question in the context of how EMA can best facilitate that going forward, and of course that was your experience, but um, if you wanted to turn to the whole of government perspective, which of course means we're talking First Minister level, um, uh, please please feel free. Um, thank you, Council. Um, I'm very much on the same page with um, Mark on this, that I'm not too sure EMA is the body to facilitate this unless there is a significant change to the scope and role of EMA. Um, I believe that if we leave these broader um, polar government strategic policy issues that need to be undertaken to achieve uh, the risk reduction framework and the resilience that we're seeking, if we leave it in an emergency management context, I think it will fail. Um, we went through a lot of pain in 2011 with a national uh, di national disaster resilience framework. Um, with some good work was done in that. That was looking at whole of government issues around community education, around planning, around insurance. Um, but we didn't achieve all the things that we, we could have done in that. It was a major undertaking, almost akin to some macroeconomic reform. But we didn't get where we needed to get with that. The sort of things that are needed to be undertaken in this space, as Mark says, are really all the government issues around legislation. They cut across levels of government, where local government has a major part to play in it. Uh, and I think unless, unless EMA and the scope of EMA and what it's expected to do changes, and you might even need to change the name of it, because as soon as you put the emergency bit in it, uh, you, you could say there's not much in a name, but it means everything and people will immediately go back to see EMA doing the things that it used to do. And it's much broader than that. Uh, we were just having a conversation. I was talking about Queensland and the, the Queensland uh, Recovery Task Force, which is a, uh, a statutory agency sitting outside of government but with a legal remit to really look at um, how to uh, mitigate risks, how to rebuild after recoveries, and they're the ones who are taking on this role for the whole of for the whole of the Queensland government, sitting outside an emergency management space, and it seems to be one area which is really working really well in Queensland. Thank that, you. That role of an external um, external input or <coughs> review, um, I'm not sure to what extent this. Um, uh, it raises the same issue um, 
Uh, we've had some earlier questions from the commissioners today concerning uh, the role of IGEMS and the role at a state and at a state level, uh, and the idea that perhaps um, there might be some role for a Commonwealth IGEM or, a, or or some kind of broader agency that takes on. Uh, this sort of not just assurance issues but broader issues. Um, is that what you had in mind, Mr. Darby, or are you speaking to a different a different intent? I'm probably speaking to a different intent in that I don't necessarily know that it needs to be a statutory authority in that sense, but I'm not too sure that sitting it under a single department is probably the way to go. It, um, We've spoken a lot about the uh, the Australian New Zealand Emergency Management Committee, which was sort of conceived to undertake some of these things, but like most um, committee bureaucratic structures, I think it is uh, in need of a significant refresh. Um, most bureaucratic organisations over time tend to become a little bit stale, a little bit too big, a little bit uh, unable to be quite as adaptive as they should be, and I think that that's one organisation that could be in need of significant refresh. Uh, I'm not too sure at the national level a statutory authority would achieve what you want, but it needs input, strong input from all First Minister's departments and even within Prime Minister and Cabinet, I think, to make sure that there is uh, an ongoing ability to report back so the, the political level can see what is being achieved uh, with the objectives that have been put in place. Mr Crosswallow, there's a proposal which we've heard in evidence uh, in respect of ANZ EMC that uh, the Commissioners and Chief Officers Strategic Committee, which is a, presently a subcommittee of AFAC, be brought in under and repositioned under ANZ EMC. What's your view of that proposal, particularly in light of what Mr Darby's just said in respect of ANZ EMC itself? Um, I think it needs to be repositioned in a governance context. I think um, ultimately where that sits, um, the reference to ANZ EMC is because it's the existing governance framework, but I would probably argue that, that the full answer to that question lies in the government's response to, strategic, uh, the, to the structural adjustments to governance. Um, it was set, I set it up with uh, AFAC, with Stuart Ellis, the CEO at the time, because we had anticipated the need for a, a greater level of coordination uh, in real time in complex environments of potentially conflating events. And um, uh, it's probably fair to say, I think, that politically and bureaucratically, we, we took it as far as we could, given the appetite for that sort of coordination at the time. And I think at the time, you know, there was much at the government level, for example, much emphasis on the activities of ISIS and counterterrorism, and there was a lot happening in the space of national security and so I think, you know, the window of looking through catastrophic natural hazards uh, was not necessarily, you know, fully open, but given the context of where we're all at, that probably makes sense. Um, so it's done some good work. It, it needs to continue, of course, that, that dynamic nature and having commissioners and chiefs at the highest level coming together quickly and making those decisions uh, is important. Um, However, uh, I think with an increasingly complex environment and conflating environment, uh, for example, we haven't really contemplated, well, I think we had contemplated in discussions when I was Director General, but um, the underlying impacts of the pandemic, for example, and the other thing that's happened this uh, season, of course, which has been not necessarily overt, which is the significance of cyber threat and cyber attack and cyber intrusion, um, does warrant an even higher level consideration of resource allocation, perhaps even beyond commissioners, uh, to the political level uh, in times that we may not necessarily be able to foresee or foreshadow in specific terms, but I think we can probably foreshadow more generally. So I think there is a, a need to bring it into a more accountable governance structure. I think it's proved its worth. I do think that there's a level of complexity in the operating environment going forward that requires a, perhaps another layer or a, a, more, a more sophisticated consideration of those hard decisions about resource allocation. And COVID-19 gives us a bit of an insight into that. Um, COVID-19, of course, is a global rupture, a global event. Uh, you know, would a, would a natural a series of natural hazards conflated with cyber and national security give you the same global effects? Probably not, but will probably give governments enough of a headache to need to come together in a similar way.
Mr Darby, uh, you've had experience uh, in providing strategic reviews in relation to counter-terrorism and uh, I've just come to you uh, in terms of your insights in relation to the work of COSC and its proposals that be put into ANZ EMC in that broader context that Mr Crosswell has just raised. Um, I mean, what Mark says is exactly right, that the the governance structures uh, will determine which way you go with this and I'm not too sure the, the ANZ NEMC as it sits at the moment is the right body. It would need to be significantly operationalised, uh, similar to the way AHPPC is sit fits between a, a policy making body and an operational sort of advice advisory body um, we need to be careful that uh, that cost group doesn't start stepping into the policy space um, and they weren't set up to do that but I think there is a bit of a danger that um, the way AFAC is conceived there there, there is almost automatic conflicts of interest in that. One, conflicts of interest between what jurisdictions might be doing. Uh, secondly, conflicts of interest that they... AFAC is a body which is funded by the agencies themselves and then you end up with a situation where agency heads are using AFAC to lobby against their own particular governments. Could be. Uh, I'm not saying it happens, but it's one of those things that we always had some concerns about, about bringing AFAC fully into the ANZ uh, Emergency Management Committee when it was uh, when it was first conceived. So there are some of the concerns in it. Um, mm. I think I spoke uh, about before about the National Counterterrorism Committee and how it was, I thought, quite a uh, a capable body that actually achieved a huge amount of work in terms of interoperability, building national counterterrorism capability. Uh, building connections between jurisdictions, about levelling out where the capability was nationally uh, so that where the highest risk were, the highest uh, areas of vulnerability were in terms of terrorism attacks were best protected as they could be, uh, where deputy commissioners and first minister's representatives in most cases left their particular jurisdictional requirements priorities at the door if there was something which is a, a, a hard line or a red line for a particular jurisdiction, uh, then the rest of the jurisdictions would work together and say, OK, we understand for X jurisdiction you would not be happy to sign up to that, so how could we actually get to a point where everybody will be happy? Uh, and that worked because of there was particularly good leadership, uh, particularly good personality leadership. It was run out of um, Prime Minister and Cabinet at the national level. Uh, and the Commonwealth threw a significant amount of seed money on the table to bring the states and territories to the table, and it worked well. Um, I might just turn uh, now to just some of the... and pause and just look at some of the work that you're doing now, um, Mr Darby. As I understand, uh, you're undertaking a strategic review of the efficacy of new and emerging telephony-based emergency warning technologies. And I'll just have the terms of reference of that work brought up. HAF 0003, 0001, 0584. We've heard some evidence in the course of the inquiry uh, of, the, of the Commission uh, in relation to um, community messaging, community warnings. Uh, we had some panels where there were, with the telecommunications providers, where an issue emerged in relation to uh, uh, carrier roaming and between carriers in an emergency context. How does this work that you're undertaking um, fit within that broader scope of issues? Um, thank you, Council. Um, th this work is essentially forward-looking. Um, it's looking to see where telephony-based warning should be in four or five, six years' time. Um, so to do that, I've actually got to look and see what we're doing now, where we're at now, what's working, what's not working. Um, it's true to say that emergency alert, what we're using now, is actually a functioning system. It will never be perfect because anybody who's dealt with anything which to do with radios or phones, though, that can be... Uh, a little bit fickle, a little bit capricious. Um, so there are improvements that are going on at the moment. There's another version uh, which is going to come out within the next sort of six months. Um, 
There are some challenges in that. Uh, we are still dealing with uh, three telecommunications authorities who are providing that capability. Uh, I, I haven't yet had my stakeholder engagement with those uh, telcos, but I understand the, the request to do multi-carrier roaming is something which is out there, and I will be having those discussions to see how that how we could actually make that work going forward. Um, it suffice to say, I think the EA, as it sits at the moment, does have some issues. It, it isn't particularly, it doesn't service the culturally and linguistically diverse communities particularly well. There are issues for remote areas. Uh, there are some issues around redundancy or when systems go down due to floods or fires that you're not necessarily going to be able to get uh, as much um, penetration of communities as you might wish. Um, so we're looking to see um, how we can both improve the capability and the capacity of the system. Uh, the, the bottom line question really is what what scope do we want for telephony-based warnings in the future? What, what concept of operations do we envisage? How much do we, information do we need to give communities? What is the cutoff line between enough information as against too much information where people switch off from alerts or see another alert on their phone and say, oh, it's just another alert, where it's actually an alert where you want to drive them to action. You want them to leave an area. You want them to do something. Um, so there's, there's, there'll be a trade-off between the, the technological risks for using other particular uh, technologies or media uh, versus the cost involved. Um, and whatever we do in the future has to mesh and be almost seamless with all the other ways that warnings are pushed out. Um, the telephony-based warnings are only going to be a small part of an overall communications and warning systems where education at the front end is really going to be critical because unless people are educated about what they might expect to see on a warning, then they're not going to necessarily react or respond to the way you want them. So there's a degree of education which has got to go up front before you even get to the fact of sending out a warning via a telephony-based system. And, and can I ask you just a question on one aspect of that? Um, the, I, I appreciate, well, I understand that your strategic review is more, perhaps more at the technology level and the, and the capacity or capability, but in terms of the content, I think you've just picked up on it there, the, the content of the warning that has been delivered is in terms of is it, a, is it a call to action or is it provision of information more broadly? Is that is that part of your review or at least something about which you've made some observations? That, that um, I, I was, a strict reading of the terms of reference would say it's probably not part of the review, but it's something that I will be considering right. <laughs> because it comes down to what you want in terms of the capability of what you're putting out there. Right. Do you perhaps need to have a different level where there is just a general warning or information to say beware there is a fire in your general area and you have a different notification system or something different which really is the alert as a call to action. So these two things might work in in, uh, in harness together to say educate, or a little bit of education first, a little bit of beware, and then the actual warning. How you, how you achieve that in a technology sense, I'm not too sure. The other aspect of it as well, which I didn't mention, is around governance. Um, and I think possibly this is where uh, I think the Commonwealth has has missed out because it's actually almost outsourced the governance and development of these systems to the states and territories, where my view would be that the Commonwealth probably needs to have a stronger lead role in this because they they have most of the levers around the legislation and the regulation to actually bring carriers on board to get what they want in terms of community service and public safety. And, and just looking at the scope of your uh, review, this is the last question, which question I want to ask about it. Um, paragraph 2 uh, requires you to undertake an assessment of international capabilities in telephony-based warning systems and emerging technological applications. I don't know where you're up to within your review, but, but where does Australia presently sit um, as against international capabilities? Um, uh, I think we sit um, probably in the top um, two thirds. Um, so there are different capabilities out there, a, different that's ways. That's a pretty broad. Sorry, it's like I mean, your we are, golf we are in, the, in the top. That's a top pretty broad uh, target. Yeah. 
Yes, <laughs> my apologies. I mean, I, I think we, we are in the top 30%, I would say, but there are many different capabilities out there and things that are changing quite rapidly. Um, Australia went to a system of using SMS text messages and some of the principles within that were that people couldn't turn them off. Uh, we had to be able to audit to see whether people received those text messages. Um, that puts a bit of a an issue in the whole system because uh, SMS mex messages are the lowest priority and it takes longer to get them through. You can only put a certain amount of data in that at the moment, 161 characters, although that will be changing. So we, there are some capability limitations in the system. Other other nations have gone to what they call a cell-based warning where the actual uh, telephone providers just push it out directly from their cell tower to all mobiles within that area. But we still have to take account of those people who still ha only have landlines and have the ability to send a voice message to a landline in an area as well. So I think our capabilities are quite good, but it's an area where technology is moving quite quickly. Um, and my uh, my request to do a, an overseas world trip to talk to a lot of people was very quickly rejected. <laughs> Well, of course, as would as circumstances would find us, it would, it's now impossible for you to do so given the travel restrictions yes. on Australians because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, when is your, your review expected to be completed, Mr Darby? Um, I was hoping to have a first draft in by the end of November, a final draft in January and reporting to the ANZ EMC in February. Uh, as you mentioned, COVID is making that a bit more difficult because I do need, I think, to get a number of people around the table to workshop what it is we want out of any future system, um, which is actually slowing down my uh, my progress in this regard. Thank you, um, Mr Darby. Mr Crossweller, um, I, I, before I come to the... Well, perhaps it's a, it's a good segue to it, the National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework and the work that you've done in that area. I just wanted to get some insights from you in relation to... We've heard evidence today and we've had some questions about community resilience uh, and community receptiveness to messaging from government, uh, both prior in the preparedness or in the prior phase and then we've just spoken with Mr Darby about the messaging they receive in circumstances of emergency and crisis. Um, in, in, what are your reflections in terms of the community's um, receptiveness to that kind of messaging from government and institutions? I think um, certainly my research and my um, PhD study showed that uh, accuracy was a big issue and I think um, the one-way mode of communication it, it can be quite directive and uh, the, uh, the, the situational awareness of that information can be limited or even perhaps inaccurate or out of date. Um, I think free and full access to information is fundamental to public trust and the systems are, have certainly improved since 2009. Uh, the Victorian bushfires, for example, and, and the uh, 10 level floods in Queensland. So you've got to give credit to the to governments in the sector for the really sort of a strategic uplift in warnings, but it's hit yet again another limit, which is the reliability, the accuracy, and the contemporaneous nature of the information. And I think um, that's where the next piece of work is really. And I think the other piece of work is um, it needs to be um, interactive. I think citizens see a lot, sense a lot and feel a lot and, and want to tell somebody. Um, now, sometimes when it's critical or urgent, that's triple zero, of course, but, but often it isn't. And um, our capacity to analyse uh, that intelligence and use it in such a way that it can be useful for warnings um, is not yet... Um, it doesn't yet exist in, in the sector, but I think it needs to. It's some of the advice I'm giving the private sector and um, other entities at the moment is to say, look, there's a rich amount of information and intelligence that exists in these incident grounds that the community holds and uh, first responders hold as well, for example, which isn't able to be channeled or harnessed in any meaningful way or analysed or processed or turned into intelligence. Um, and I think we need to think seriously about making sure that happens. Um, because information, uh, you know, the, the, one of the greatest sources of human suffering is ignorance, of course, and how do you, how do you dispel ignorance will become more knowledgeable. Um, if we can help citizens to become more knowledgeable at the time and prior to the time, 
I think that kind of helps the helps us to position as best as we can for what we're about to experience. Even um, you know our understanding of the risk landscape uh, is not as good as it could be uh, in terms of. Um, uh, risk knowledge about flood, fire, storm, and cyclone across Australia is, you know, it's reasonably good. I'm not saying it's bad, but uh, does it, for example, adequately take into account the effects of climate change going forward and and the adaptation challenges in in that regard? Well, no, it doesn't. It's very immature in that respect because the the knowledge isn't able to be produced because the data is not necessarily accessible or available, and the methods for analysing aren't uh, finalised or standardised. So. So I think knowledge, intelligence, information is a needs strategic uplift and is a new frontier for this sector um, to improve the capacity for people to make informed decisions. So if we're really going to focus in on resilience, and we need to, of course, subject to those structural supports and things we talked about earlier, then then knowledge is key to this. And um, there's, there's many, plenty of evidence through previous commissions of inquiry that highlighted that the knowledge was just deficient. It was either antiquated uh, or uh, or inaccurate or, you know, there's a whole lot of problems with it. And and unfortunately, I think that it's so critical to public trust that it, it, it just can't, it, you can't ignore it or you can't underinvest in it. Um, and I think the interactive nature is something we really need to explore uh, much more profoundly. People do want to tell us what they're seeing or how they're feeling about it or what they're, even what they're sensing. Some people just sense things are not going well or things are not right. They want to tell somebody we, we should be up for listening to that because, you know, it's a rich form of intelligence and human beings kind of feel as though things are going bad. It's probably because it is. Um, and our traditional means of picking up that sort of information, um, well, we don't have them really. We're not able to tap into that. So I think it's a, it's a gap that we could do well to address. Mr Darby, is there something you'd like to comment on on that aspect of Mr Crosswell's response? Um, no, I think Mark is right. We haven't yet been able to um, tap into these rich sources of information. And, and there's a natural reluctance, I think, some of the time to, to accept that the information you're getting is imperfect and therefore you shouldn't use it, uh, which I think is probably the wrong way to to approach it. Sometimes if you have information there and you're getting enough sources, as long as you can determine those sources are slightly different and it's just repeats of the, a single source, mm. then that is actually a good way to say we've got something happening here, we need to respond, um, we don't know exactly what it is, but we have a good sense it will be X and, and therefore we need to take some action. Mr. Crosswell, I just I want to come to you now and the time available to the national your work on the National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework and um, your um, insights as to how it, its implementation can be progressed from here. Yes, yeah, so I think um, I think key key to the framework implementation is a, a strong strategic partnership with um, the private sector uh, and governments about how to move risk reduction forward. I mean, it's not, uh, you know, risk reduction at the citizen level is a microcosm of the problem, really. I think, you know, it's institutions that design societies and ultimately make decisions about where and how we place ourselves upon the landscape. And um, and if those settings are more mature and more informed by climate disaster risk, then I think we stand a better chance of, you know, resisting or persisting or absorbing or transforming from these effects but um, but the mechanism isn't really there for that dialogue and so um, for, for many a year you know sensibly so I think we've heard uh, right, right back to the national strategy for disaster resilience a call for you know pro public private partnerships and dialogue and and uh, responsibilities and accountability is all the words you hear in bureaucracy but there's no governance to give effect to that mm -hmm. and there's no monitoring of implementation um, now, the private sector is diverse, of course, uh, incredibly, and, and governments, you know, comparatively speaking, are centralised or much easier to the corral. Um, but there are peak industry bodies, captains of industry, representative groups uh, that we, I think, ought to tap into um, more often and more formally and allow them to provide advice to government at the highest level about not only where they see the problems, but how they might collectively solve some of these things. So... When I was, as head of task force, there was an incredible willingness to do that. Um, we consulted with over 
I think it was well over 100 entities in the formation of the framework and a very small number of those were governments, of course, and the vast majority were from the private sector or community sector. Um, and the willingness was, uh, was unambiguous to continue to work with government on strategising and implementing risk reduction. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able, we were time limited, of course, and scope limited. We weren't able to provide sufficient advice on some of those governance arrangements and what they might look like. But and it, it may well be difficult for governments to contemplate such matters because, um, you know, the trading of the equities of power, wealth and resource are always contested in these spaces. But, but I think they need to be put on the table sensibly. If we're going to ask the private sector to be responsible for its part of risk reduction, I think we've got to give them a voice and be prepared to hear them uh, you know, in the context of constitutional and statutory responsibilities of governments and the dem democratic processes that liberate those things. They're, they're just as important, if not even more so. But, but there is no dialogue in an ongoing sense. There's no capacity to monitor nor to report. Uh, nor to influence, nor to shape. So it's one thing to write a plan or a framework and engage the private sector in what needs to happen. It's quite something else to make sure it does. So we, we run the risk of falling into the trap of writing a great document. And I think we've all collectively participated in doing that and Carag endorsed it earlier this year, which is, a, I think, a testament to the efforts of those 120 organisations. But it will mean for little if we can't continue to monitor its implementation. So there has been some planning done, as I understand it, through EMA and through ANZ EMC, and, you know, that's that's progressive, of course, but, but the extent... But I've talked to the private sector since, and there is essentially no dialogue uh, or conversation now happening with the private sector about next steps and what that might look like. So, so I think given the systemic and strategic nature of the problem, the key to this is a, a governance framing that allows an ongoing dialogue and, um, you know, sensible, will, willing accountabilities and responsibilities. It doesn't need statutory oversight, I don't think. Um, there's enough goodwill in the system, I think, to pursue these things to the benefit of greater society, but we need to put the governance in place to make it happen. Mr Darby, I might come to you, and I just, just as I was listening to Mr Crosswell, I was wondering if there were other models uh, on which this could be, um, uh, could be in, this proposal could be informed, and uh, we had some evidence earlier this week of the, um, from Jane Holton, who is a commissioner of the National COVID Coordination Commission, which has now become an advisory board, uh, advisory board to Cabinet. Um, do you have any insights uh, in relation to Mr Crosswell's observations? Um, no, Mark's. Uh, I think Mark's right on the money. It is. It is a really, really challenging space because you are cutting across jurisdictions, across levels of government, and across agencies and protectionism in a number of areas. And it's very, very difficult. And, and it needs to be a little bit of the the carrot and stick approach. Uh, Mark is right that it needs um, reportable objectives to actually achieve some of these things. Um, and it needs a transparency about where, what risks it is that you are trying to trying to mitigate or reduce, which sometimes are not always clear to people who are working on it because the picture seems quite big. Um, there was a lot of work done on a national emergency risk assessment guidelines where some states have signed up to those, others have adopted them for their own means and they've become so complex that a local government, for example, just uh, have not got the wherewithal in terms of resources to to action them. Um, to my mind, somebody's got to pay along the line here somewhere, whether it's the taxpayer paying directly, whether it's the extra cost to private industry for uh, building regulations or planning decisions or insurance, um, but it all comes together somewhere. And you only have limited resources, and the National Emergency Risk Assessment Guidelines spoke about how you use those resources, those limited resources, to best reduce the risk in your environment. And I'm not too sure all states and territories continuously look at where their risks are and how they apply those limited resources they have. In many cases, I think most of it is done on the basis of, of uh, traditional custom and practice, if you examine or look at, for example, the urban environment, where there's been a lot of work going on to make buildings safer, smoke alarms, uh, fire prevention systems, etc., 
the urban environment is actually very, very safe, but there hasn't been necessarily a reduction in the resources that are provided to the urban fire service or in terms of expanding, significantly expanding what they do to take pressure off uh, resources in other areas. So it's this balance of where you actually put your limited resources against the most appropriate risks to reduce those risks. Um, I think you've both spoken to the issues of a sort of a more whole of society taking in the private sector and, uh, and the community on, on, I don't like this word, but I'll use it, journey. Uh, in terms of taking a more holistic approach. One thing I haven't raised with you both is um, to what extent, uh, at least in crisis circumstances, I think what you're talking to, Mr Crosswell, is something more uh, sustaining and across both in peacetime and wartime, so to speak. Um, but in the crisis circumstance, what is your view as to the role of the National Crisis Committee? Um, one of the things that stands out in stark contrast um, to what um, might be thought the National Crisis Committee does, which is the vertical as across all governments, um, is it only met twice in the last fire season. Um, what is a committee like that or some kind of um, organising um, body that can coordinate uh, the national response to disasters of national consequence? Um, I'm not sure who wants to go first. Mr Crossweller. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, uh, it's it's an excellent question, Council. I think um, because uh, well, at least historically, I mean, after this commission, it could be different. But um, the, the Commonwealth has only ever had a moral and political mandate in this space, not a constitutional one. Unlike some of the other responsibilities in national security and elsewhere, and I think that has tended to um, to maintain the focus of that accountability at the state level. Um, and so there's not really an impetus to, to elevate these things to the National Crisis Committee um, on that basis alone. And I think um, last summer was, I, I think, clearly a need to do that. But uh, but I think traditionally, uh, culturally, there's been a reticence to actually make that happen. Um, I, I don't see that going away quickly, um, uh, to be perfectly honest about it. Um, but I think we need to uh, we need to come back and think about that because, uh, as we've mentioned, I think the commission said you know, on numerous occasions that how complex this is all getting, of course, in crisis and the competing nature for the resources and and I think also the citizen or the electorate's expectation of political cohesion and coordination and support, which has clearly been demonstrated in COVID-19 to great beneficial effect to both governments and citizens, um, really needs to be brought into this space, uh, you know, under, under that, uh, if you like, notion of goodwill or, or sense of responsibility to the broader society. So, so I think I think there are some cultural constraints here and we need to recontextualise within culture the fact that we cannot continue to see these things as small and maintained within jurisdictions because it suits us to see it that way when clearly the, the presenting conditions and the crisis is suggesting something uh, otherwise. Uh, I think the South Coast of New South Wales proved that it was a very difficult time for the Prime Minister and the State of New South Wales about um, the activation of defence resource. I think, I think that was the right decision by the Prime Minister and I understand the concerns of New South Wales, but the pressure on the Prime Minister to act on behalf of the nation was phenomenal. And ha having breathed three Prime Ministers, I can well understand what that would have been like. Um, I think if we had a, a more contextualised understanding as to what was unfolding from that perspective, we perhaps would have avoided that situation and the National Com uh, Crisis Committee could have come together perhaps a little bit earlier. So, look, I'm treading on eggshells here, of course. Um, but I do think that everybody did the best they could. I think everybody's concerns were valid. I think what the environment showed and the crisis showed was that our arrangements and our cultural understandings of the environment weren't working. Um, and it pushed us beyond our limits of understanding and it pushed us beyond our governance arrangements and it even pushed us beyond our constitution, really. So I don't think there's any fault there or blame or finger pointing. I think that would be futile. But I do think it highlights the fact that we crossed a threshold of our understanding of these environments that we weren't adequately prepared for. And those things are going to happen again and probably in a more complex way. So 
there is a there is a role for a national crisis committee. I think I think the uh, national um, uh, the national arrangements for governance now that the prime minister has recently put in place in part help to answer that question. And I think there needs to be a bureaucratic response in support of the national cabinet that allows this pathway to open up quickly and seamlessly. Um, in crisis response, of course, but the, the thing which we'll probably miss the opportunity to see in this commission is the recovery. Um, and I think the recovery effort is equally, if not more complex, and probably needs coordination at the national level over an even longer period of time. And so I think that's worth contemplating. Well, more than worth contemplating, I think we should act on it. Thank you, Mr Crosswell. And Mr Darby, I'll go to you and then I'm going to go to the commissioners for their questions. Um, look, thanks, Councillor. I, I think my uh, my time since involvement in the National Crisis Committee, I probably shouldn't comment too much, but it, it was set up to do exactly those things you talk about and I'm not too sure why it possibly only met on those limited number of occasions. I think the national arrangements have come a long way since my time. Uh, there's a lot more acceptance of states and territories about how they interact with the Commonwealth. Um, in the past, there used to be a strong resistance to even the Commonwealth going out and doing pre-season briefings to understand what the risks might be, where the shortfalls might be for particular states and territories. There was a reluctance of a state or territory to admit they didn't have all the, uh, the capabilities and capacity they needed. But I think we've moved on a long way from there uh, in these days, uh, and a lot of things Mark put in place to actually address that uh, are, are working well. And I'm not too sure why the National Crisis Committee um, didn't meet more regularly to advise upwards towards the National Cabinet. Um, I always had a view that we had all these arrangements at the bureaucratic level, but there was nothing at a political level uh, to actually have a, an operational or a, a crisis sort of arrangement where the Prime Minister and Premiers got together quite quickly to discuss um, crisis matters, uh, and that seemed to be overcome quite quickly in this uh, event. So it, it is there and it can work well and it should work well uh, with people coming together quite quickly to address issues uh, of uh, national significance in disasters. Certainly the um, material that's been made available to the Commission supports that the National Crisis Committee has met frequently during the pandemic. Uh, I might now go to the Commissioners. Yes, thank you for that, noting the time. I've, I've just got one question, and I'll be for Mr Croswell, just to build on uh, what he was talking about. Frameworks. We've discovered more frameworks than you can point a stick at with the, the Commission, to be quite honest. And when we go down the path of uh, what happened with the framework, quite often they were endorsed and everyone patted it, each other on the back and it was done. And when you ask what's happened since then, the answer is normally crickets in the night. It uh, it's, hasn't progressed, which is what you're alluding to. When you were talking about who should monitor the implementation, all too often everyone looks at government to do that, a level of government to do that. Noting all the bodies that have been a part of the implementation of the or the development of the late, latest framework that you've been involved with, is there a role for industry to come together to monitor an implementation and drive implementation? Does it just have to be government or actually is there another way of doing this? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. It's an excellent question and the answer is absolutely. I think the willingness of the peak bodies and the and the, the big players, particularly, for example, banking, finance and insurance, which I dealt extensively with, were more than up for that challenge. Uh, they just couldn't find the pathway of dialogue with the government around partnership. And it wasn't about, you know, I mean, there were people in the system wanted government to pay for everything, but that's easily dealt with. Um, we found a few of them the, too. The, <laughs> but but the, the leaders and the shapers and the influencers in the private sector really do understand their role as uh, as you know, heads of industry and, and want to do something about it, but they can't find the pathway to dialogue or partnership. And I think, um, if I'm understanding you correctly, Commissioner, this is in every sense of the word a partnership. And how do you how do you uh, operationalise that partnership and give it legitimacy and give it long longevity? Um, I think they would welcome that. I, I think the old the, the frameworks, you know, help, they help to guide the policy direction, but. But they don't really do a lot if people aren't allowed to continue to participate within them and to be held to account for them. And governments, are, and particularly some bureaucrats, are reluctant to give up the power, the equities of power in this space to 
allow the private sector to do what it is they need to do. And I think we're going to talk about public-private partnerships. We've got to put in place the mechanisms to make that happen. And that is, you know, trading on some of those equities. Uh, and I don't see a problem with that. I really don't. No, thank, thank you. I appreciate that insight. Commissioner Bennett? Commissioner no, Bennett. thank you. I think all of my questions have pretty well been covered um, to, the, uh, from what you've both said, so I'm very appreciative of that. Thank you. Yeah, nothing from me. I, I think um, Mr Darby put his, his finger on the pulse when he said the biggest obstacle to change here is that there are costs and they don't go anywhere and someone's ultimately got to pay. But other than that, that's a comment, so thanks very much. <laughs> uh, so, Mr Croswell and Mr Darby, and once again, good to see you again. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the time with us this morning. Again, you've added another little part of the jigsaw puzzle, but a very important part uh, of bringing this to, together. So thank you both very much. Ms. Hogan Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, nothing from parties with leave. Nothing with parties. So we will uh, be released. Be released. So Mr. Croswell and Mr. Darby are released from your summons. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And with that, we will adjourn until 11:30 Canberra time. Thank you, Chair. On time. Thank you. All right. Commission has adjourned until 11.30.
you. Please be seated. Ms. Hogan Doran. Thank you, Chair. Our next uh, witness is Laureate Professor Emeritus Cheryl Saunders AO, who's the co director of studies, government law, and co director of studies in public and international law at the University of Melbourne. I call Professor Saunders. Professor Saunders, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. It's a pleasure. Uh, Professor Saunders will affirm. Professor Saunders, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm? that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Professor Saunders, thank you for making yourself available today. And for the benefit of the commissioners, uh, I understand you've been teaching at the University of Melbourne a master's course in, of all things, multi-level government. And, and tomorrow you'll be teaching on emergency powers. Um, I feel like asking you just to repeat the, the, the lectures that you're giving in the course of today. But um, so thank you for making yourself available. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Um, a large question, which I'm, uh, I did give some notice <laughs> for about two minutes. Um, could you describe for the benefit of the commissioners in a, at a high level the nature of the Commonwealth as a federal polity, uh, including how that impacts on the areas of responsibility within the polity and decision-making within the polity? Sure. Well, um, as we all know, Australia is a federation, um, has a central government and uh, six to eight constituent units, uh, however you want to, to count the territory in that. Uh, we've got a form of federation that divides uh, legislative and executive power between the, um, between the levels of government. Um, and uh, uh, each of the levels of government has its own institutional structure uh, and its own democratic relationship with the Australian people or a section uh, of the Australian people through a parliamentary uh, structure, uh, each with its own cabinet, parliament, uh, electoral system, uh, and so on. Uh, it's a form of federation that's sometimes described in the literature as dualist because each level of government administers uh, its own legislation. But from the standpoint of, uh, of your concerns, uh, it's relevant because both in the uh, particular emergency that this commission is looking at, the bushfires, uh, and for that matter, the, the current health uh, and economic emergency, uh, power is divided between the levels of government in, in ways that mean that they both uh, have relevant powers to be brought to bear uh, on the solution. Uh, and it's not, it's not just a question of power. I think we also need to talk about uh, capability and, and, and knowledge. So each also has knowledge about what's going on uh, and what needs to be done uh, to solve the, the crisis. Uh, and each has some capability and experience and uh, uh, institutional structures in dealing with it. So um, the way in which Australia is set up, and for that matter, many other countries around the world are set up, means that um, in order to solve certain kinds of national emergencies, uh, you really need the efforts of both and perhaps all three levels of government to be brought to bear on the problem. And you've spoken of that sort of a dual responsibility in terms of the allocation of powers and also uh, that each each level of government has uh, its own capability and knowledge that it brings to the process of decision making. What impact does that have for, in a sense, multi-level decision making, coordination of that multi-level decision making within our federal structure? Is that anticipated by our federal structure? At least in well, the context of crisis? In some respects, yes. Um, the, the federal structure that we sort of have from 1900 uh, uh, does have some cooperative techniques in it. Um, for example, the power to refer uh, legislative power from one level of government to another, um, the arrangements for the Loan Council, uh, the arrangements for... Um, doing things collaboratively in Australia that only the imperial power could have done in 1900. There's, there's a number of those mechanisms, but uh, interestingly enough, all of those mechanisms assume that the, um, uh, the democratic process at each level of government will continue uh, to operate, the idea that the level of government is elected by and accountable back to uh, a particular electorate. 
Um, so, so there are some procedures within the Constitution, but uh, as we all know, very many procedures for collaboration have grown up outside the Constitution, although necessarily consistent with it. Um, you've talked about uh, the levels of responsibility or that both levels, the, the Commonwealth and the states and territories have responsibilities, but we often hear the expression that the states have primary responsibility for certain matters. Um, what is the significance of that for decision-making in our polity? Uh, well, I mean, it, it depends very much on... I mean, we're talking in the abstract here, um, and, uh, and that makes it complicated. Um, uh, the way in which powers are divided in our system uh, uh, is that the Commonwealth is allocated uh, uh, those listed powers largely in Section 51, uh, and the states uh, have the unlisted residue. But equally significantly, uh, almost all of those powers in Section 51 are concurrent uh, so that they can be exercised by either the Commonwealth or the states with uh, arrangements for Commonwealth primacy in the event of, of inconsistency. Um, and so um, if we take uh, quarantine for a, for a currently topical example, I mean, that's a concurrent power. Uh, which, and we can see how both levels of government are presently exercising that power uh, directly, not as a matter of delegation from each other, because they are both operating under that same umbrella. If there were an inconsistency, the Commonwealth uh, would prevail, Commonwealth law would prevail. Um, and so that would be an area in which you wouldn't say that the, state have, the states have primacy. But if you're operating in an area that is not obviously an area of concurrent power, say education, um, the Commonwealth has a big role in education, largely through funding, but it's clearly uh, primarily a state responsibility. Uh, similarly, the Commonwealth has a role in land management, in all sorts of things, uh, but most of those things are primarily things that the states deal with uh, on the ground. Uh, and it may be that the Commonwealth becomes involved um, because uh, to, to complete a particular project, um, Commonwealth money or power or influence is, is necessary. Um, or it may be that uh, in some way Commonwealth legislative power intrudes uh, into the area, as it does, for example, uh, with bringing... Um, uh, migrants into Australia with particular um, educational qualifications. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a complex picture uh, we're talking about. But I think it's, I think it is quite helpful sometimes to think in terms of primacy because it tells you where the responsibility falls uh, and the extent to, and, and the way in which collaboration should work. Um, the title of this Royal Commission, although it, it, it has been looking uh, through the prism of the most recent experience of the 2019-2020 bushfire season, is National Natural Disaster Arrangements. Where do natural disasters fit within our, um, in that, within our Commonwealth Constitution and federal construct? Well, there's nothing in Section 51 to talk about natural disasters. Um, so on that basis, they are... Uh, um, you know, they are a state matter. But again, it's not helpful um, necessarily to make those generalisations because you've got to disaggregate uh, the nature of the disaster and what the response calls for. Uh, so if we take the, the COVID situation, for example, um, uh, it's quite clear that the states have responsibility for hospitals, um, um, many health arrangements, uh, uh, deciding whether or not businesses are open, uh, deciding whether or not the state shuts down, all of those things. Um, but to make uh, the health response practicable uh, in this context, it's been absolutely critical uh, that the Commonwealth um, uh, coordinate uh, the, the purchase of supplies and so on, uh, that um, uh, Commonwealth responsibility for aspects of health, hospital funding, health insurance, all of that stuff is taken into account, uh, that uh, 
uh, income support has been available for people who, and you know, you know the story as well as I do. I mean, it's an absolutely classic case uh, of the way in which each level of government has had a lot to do to coordinate what, by and large, has been a fairly effective response to this global pandemic. And I say that even from the state of Victoria. Um. Just focusing on one particular aspect, what, what focusing further on one particular aspect of of the um, recent experience, you've written recently on on the role and future of the national cabinet, uh, and uh, the commissioners have received a copy of your paper um, published with the University of Melbourne's Melbourne School of Government, governing during crises, uh, titled "A New Federalism?" Question mark The role and future of the national cabinet. That's RCN nine hundred. 083 um, I wanted to ask you some questions, if I may, about National Cabinet. First, uh, to look at its construction, uh, and then I'll return with some additional questions about its performance. Um, how does National Cabinet differ from COAG, the Council of Australian Governments, and previous cooperative federal structures? Well, you know, Australia's gone ahead a long history of intergovernmental meetings. Um, they preceded federation. There was there were premiers' conferences uh, even before uh, federation occurred, uh, and since federation, we've gone through various iterations. For a long while, there was a thing just called the premiers' conference. Um, after a while, that turned into the heads of government meeting, and you only have to think about the acronym, acronym to see why that didn't last terribly long. Uh, and uh, then coag. Um, became uh, invented, uh, and now we have the National Cabinet. I mean, they're, they're all very similar uh, in one sense, uh, and that sense is that they bring together uh, the heads of government, the elected heads of government from around the country. Um, so the, 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 the similarity between the National Cabinet and all of those bodies is that their primary actors uh, have been the Prime Minister, uh, and the premiers and chief ministers uh, of the states and territories. Um, Sometimes there are other people involved. Uh, occasionally, uh, I mean, the Council of, um, what do you call it, uh, the Australian Local Government Association head, for example, has been a member of COAG. Uh, from time to time, we have other countries involved. New Zealand part participates. Papua New Guinea has participated. Uh, but those are, in a sense, frills. Um, but the primary purpose is to bring together the heads of government to make decisions about whatever it's thought necessary to make decisions about. Uh, it, and at least in recent experience, um, uh, has it has it been successful in allowing that decision making to be made uh, uh, quickly and or more quickly than might otherwise? Happen, or has it been more than just speed that has been the virtue of National Cabinet, do you think? Uh, look, I, I think um, timing depends a little bit. In, in, in fact, I think if effectiveness depends uh, on what they're trying to do. Uh, so uh, even though you know, my answer to you suggests that National Cabinet looks just like COAG in many, in many respects, in fact, it's operated quite differently uh, to COAG. Um, and it's a little bit worth reflecting on why that might be. Now, one answer is it's actually dealing with something that needs to be dealt with. Mm. Uh, it's dealing with uh, something that is a real priority for Australians. Um, it matters to Australians. Australians will notice whether it's being dealt with effectively or not. Uh, as for that matter, will the rest of the world? Um, everybody uh, who's a participant in the National Cabinet agrees that this needs to be done. Uh, and one of their um, uh, think very noteworthy achievements is that uh, right from the outset, they agreed broadly uh, on what the goals were. At least as far as those of us who are outside the process can, can see, they seem to have agreed that the goal here was to flatten the curve, uh, that in the short term that was going to have economic consequences, but nevertheless, let's deal with the health crisis uh, and try and manage the, the, the economic consequences uh, on the way. Um, they seem to agree also that there would need to be local variations 
um, because the pandemic was manifesting itself in different parts of the country. Different parts of the country had different um, uh, attributes to, to deal with, different, diff, different challenges, different strengths to, 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 to bring to bear on handling this problem. Uh, and that's also part of the sort of the federal story. Um, and so that there was a, a sense of a unity of purpose. Uh, and I think that that's one of the big differences between what we're presently seeing in the National Cabinet and what we saw before in COAG, because it wasn't obvious that there was unity of purpose uh, always in COAG. There were things on the agenda, um, but the things on the agenda were things that very often needed to be done uh, in the eyes of particular people. They might have been urgent, uh, but in the scale of priorities across the country and across systems of government, they were perhaps uh, not top of the, the priorities. Um, so I think in comparing COAG and National Cabinet, we need to partly take account of uh, the, the difference in the things that National Cabinet is presently dealing with as opposed to the things COAG routinely dealt with. And that then in turn feeds into the way in which these two bodies uh, have operated. Um, so um, uh, it was often said um, that uh, COAG was a pretty heavily bureaucratised mm -hmm. uh, body. Um, issues that were to be discussed by the heads of government were uh, worked up through various levels of public service uh, meetings from the various participating uh, jurisdictions so that by the time they finally reached the politicians, it was um, all a bit of a fait accompli. Um, and then there were questions, I, I suspect, about how wholeheartedly some of those decisions were then implemented in the various uh, jurisdictions. Uh, whereas um, uh, with the urgency that attends the pandemic and the, for that matter attended the bushfires, um, there's no time to muck around with multiple bureaucratic levels. Uh, uh, you go to where the decision making needs to be done and it's done. Uh, so I think that's been another important distinction. And I recall the Premier of Western Australia um, staying at quite an early stage in the National Cabinet process that one of the good things about National Cabinet was that there, were less, that there was less bureaucracy involved. But I think that's partly also the nature of the questions that they... So, of course, some of the uh, uh, bodies that sat below COAG were not just um, uh, public servants but were ministers. There were ministerial um, uh, councils and other groups such as the um, councils of attorneys general and and uh, ministers of um, emergency police and emergency management, uh, both from Australia and New Zealand. Uh, what's the importance of having those sitting under the national cabinet structure? They're not presently... Well, it, it seems it's in a position of either flux or transition. Uh, what, what's your insider understanding of that, uh, Professor Saunders? Well, again, you know, it's not new that we've got ministerial councils, uh, line ministers getting together uh, in areas of interest. Um, and it's interesting the way you put it, saying that they're under the, under the National Cabinet, which in a sort of a way they are, but I, I guess that was, that was a COAG invention, the idea that uh, you had COAG at the top and then there were all these COAG councils uh, underneath, whereas hitherto um, my impression was, and I never even thought about it in hierarchical terms before, um, my impression was that you just had these ministerial councils. You know, it was convenient for the agriculture ministers to, to get together from time to time and talk about whether foot and mouth was an Australia-wide problem or just operating in particular states. It was uh, convenient for education ministers to get together and talk about grants. It's convenient for the sta for, for attorneys general uh, to get together. And for that matter, it's convenient for emergency ministers uh, to get together uh, sometimes. Um, and so all of those um, councils, you know, some of them are very, uh, have a very long lineage again. I mean, the agriculture ministers go back to at least the 1920s, for example. Um, but under COAG, there was sort of an attempt to, to build them into a pyramid. You're quite right. Um, uh, and the, the situation we're in at the moment with the National Cabinet uh, is that my impression was that the National Cabinet uh, was formed... Uh, 
not quite by spontaneous combustion, but certainly pretty, pretty speedily um, uh, in the wake of a COAG meeting to respond to uh, COVID-19 uh, with relatively little thought given to structure as opposed to function and just dealing with the problem. Uh, and then because it worked so well, and, um, and if I can just sort of digress a little bit, uh, uh, it worked well because it was dealing with the, with the problem. Uh, but in order to deal with the problem, it had to do something that I'd been hoping would happen in Australia for a long time. There had to be actually mutual, uh, a mutual understanding that each level of government had a role to play here. Um, and you could talk about it in terms of mutual respect. You could talk about it in terms of saying we need to collaborate uh, and reach agreement where possible, uh, but sometimes it's also appropriate for local responses uh, to be run. So um, National Cabinet was very successful, I think, in, in, in the culture of collaboration it managed, managed to, uh, to engender. Uh, and so as the success of the National Cabinet, both in functional and um, sort of conceptual terms, became obvious, uh, so the idea that you somehow had to deal with the rest of the COAG councils seems to have been born. Um, and um, there, there is a sort of a notional list of things that should be the subject of... Um, uh, intergovernmental meetings, uh, which came out in that press release about a month ago. Uh, and there is currently a process underway for working out what to do with the rest of these councils. Not all of which were part of the COAG structure. There were others called ministerial forums that were not. So that's quite a big exercise that's going on at the moment. Um, uh, and it will be very interesting to see how it pans out. I, I will also be putting in a submission to that, uh, and I hope that they um, consider not just uh, structure and decision-making rules, but um, the sorts of things that should go to intergovernmental um, decision-making forums and um, uh, the, the way in which those forums should be conducted so as to ensure that everybody buys in. Uh, and everybody uh, sort of owns the, the, the process and the outcome. Um, um, so it's, er it's early days yet, but um, whatever they do, I don't imagine those arrangements are going to be set in stone. Uh, there's never been any formal framework for uh, intergovernmental decision-making in Australia. Uh, there's a question whether there should be, um, but the habit for the last 120 years has been to change the, the titles and compositions, etc., of ministerial councils when that suits government priorities and as times change. And I imagine that to some extent, whatever the future holds, that will continue. Commissioners, the um, reference to the media release is Exhibit 27.23.4, which is PMC 0001 0002 um, you've mentioned the future. Uh, how do you see the role of the National Cabinet into the future? You've been very positive about um, the outcomes of it. Uh, do you have any concerns about any aspects of the processes that might be um, important to take into account for um, the National Cabinet were it to take on a role in relation to natural disasters in the future? Uh, um, I think uh, the intention is that the National Cabinet, um, or something like that, uh, will continue. Uh, and I think that there's now uh, enough experience with how that's worked uh, with the current heads of government to um, suggest that it will have a good start. Um, but I think there are a number of questions. I mean, one is, uh, will this spirit of happy cooperation uh, and collaboration and acceptance of the value of diversity and innovation, will all of that continue uh, when the matter that's being dealt with uh, is not so critical? Um, now, from your perspective of uh, um, dealing with natural, natural disaster arrangements, they're generally critical. So I think that uh, uh, we could hope, uh, at least, that the National Cabinet would respond 
um, in, a, in a similar way uh, to any really serious uh, natural disaster. Um, but that's not the ordinary bread and butter of intergovernmental uh, deliberation in Australia. Usually it's something much more mundane. Uh, very often it's uh, something that is a priority for one level of government but not another. Um, and um, uh, the, one of the challenges is to ensure that this culture of uh, federal culture, if you like, um, uh, can be replicated uh, more widely. The second issue, and it may be in the um, material that you've distributed to the commissioners, mm. is I have some concerns both about the term National Cabinet uh, and about the, its apparent position in the, um, in the federal cabinet system. Uh, I don't think that the term Cabinet is apt. Uh, I, do, I do think in, Australian, in the Australian context, we've come to accept that national probably works uh, to refer to an intergovernmental forum. Uh, but I think cabinet is a confusion um, uh, because that's not normally the, the, what, the concept of a cabinet. Uh, um, and there's enough confusion around the term cabinet in Australia because of its complete absence from the Commonwealth Constitution. Uh, without adding to it by putting another completely different body called cabinet uh, into the mix, um, comprised of people who have quite separate responsibilities to their own cabinets around the country. Uh, so I have thought that the term cabinet is complicated. I don't want to be too hung up on terminology, but if they could change it, I wish they would. Um, but, more, but more complicated still, I think, is the fact that it's sometimes said to be now part of the Commonwealth Cabinet mm. for its system. Mm. And I can't see how that can possibly sensibly be the case. Uh, uh, it really can't be a subcommittee of the Commonwealth Cabinet. Um, uh, and I think it's worth unpacking what the rationale for that is. Um, and the rationales I've been given to, one by you, I might say, and I, I think it's probably absolutely right, um, that... Uh, 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 it's been rolled into the Commonwealth Cabinet system in order to uh, ensure that there's some uh, degree of um, uh, culture of Cabinet confidentiality between the members uh, and that it also that also serves to protect uh, um, instruments and other information before National Cabinet from, for example, uh, the Commonwealth's Freedom of Information legislation. Uh, but I have two answers to that. One on the, f the first, the idea of, of confidentiality. I don't think that's ever been an issue uh, in Australian intergovernmental forums. I think they've developed a culture of their own, just like any such body does. If you want it to work, you need trust between members. And trust between members means not going out and blabbing <laughs> about what your um, fellow Premier did uh, to the next passing journalist. Um, uh, and I, so I think that there is that solidarity anyway within these intergovernmental forums, and I think it's appropriate for us to build on that, not try and equate it to some other uh, different kind of body. Um, and as for the freedom of information point, um, uh, there is already some protection for intergovernmental information uh, in freedom of information legislation. It may not be strong enough to deal with the sorts of things uh, that a National Cabinet might deal with, particularly in the emergency context. Uh, it depends on how frank you think that uh, elected people should be with the public in an emergency context. I mean, I, I think the experience of COVID is that frankness is actually quite helpful, but... Um, but, 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 but the general point is, if you need better protection for intergovernmental forums in um, freedom of information and other related legislation, then provide it. Uh, it's not beyond us to do that, um, rather than mixing this up with the Commonwealth Cabinet system. That would be my, my, my response. Um, There's the final matter I wanted to take you to uh, before I take it over to the, hand it over to the commissioners is just the broader piece, and I think you've already touched on it. But do you have any comments to make about reform to the National Federation arrangements more generally, having regard to um, 
the principal concern we have in this Royal Commission, which is governing during crises and crises involved or triggered by uh, natural disasters of a national consequence or on a national scale, uh, or which are compounding and consecutive and thus yeah. create an enormous... Um, sorry, go uh, well, culturally, I, uh, you know, I would encourage us to somehow keep uh, uh, this arrangement going. Um, I think there are all sorts of um, things that might be done to encourage that. One of the things that uh, um, I've played with in the past, for example, is having... Um, a support structure that's dedicated to the intergovernmental machinery rather than just running it out of the Prime Minister's Department uh, or out of the Commonwealth Line Department, which what has, for the most part, happened in the past and tends inevitably to ensure that it's a, a Commonwealth agenda that's being run. I think if you really want buy-in and ownership of these arrangements and commitment to them, I think... Um, we need to think about how that is achieved for the institutional structure as a whole. Um, one question um, that might come up is how um, uh, emergency ministers fit into um, an essentially heads of government uh, operation. Um, I think that you know, can be dealt with either in the hierarchical way that you and I were discussing uh, a moment ago or adopting uh, a more imaginative process um, uh, of the kind that they have, for example, in the European Union, uh, whereby um, uh, a council, a ministerial council, is constituted differently depending on what the issue uh, is to be dealt with. Um, and so that might be useful uh, for some of the other uh, areas of line responsibility. But for natural disasters, at the end of the day, if it's a significant natural disaster of the kind that the Commission is talking about, uh, at the end of the day, you're going to want the heads of government, heads of jurisdiction uh, involved. I mean, we saw that during the bushfires. Um, certainly, uh, um, you did have emergency ministers and police ministers and so on uh, addressing press conferences, but more often than not, you had the Premier there. Um, and uh, and, the, and the same was true at the Commonwealth level. So that I think um, I think that that issue is is less significant in the sort of natural disaster area that you're talking. About. Thank you so much, Professor Saunders. Uh, commissioners, can I just, can I just add one quick comment to that? Sorry, and sorry to, to interrupt. Um, I, I do think also to to emphasise the the relative leanness uh, of uh, the um, uh, the National Cabinet um, during the present crisis has been useful. I remember an occasion during the height of the bushfires when someone said to the Premier of Victoria, uh, you know, should there be a COAG meeting? Uh, and he said, no, <laughs> I need to be here dealing with the bushfires. Uh, and I think, and that was, I, I listened to that and I thought, that's absolutely right. You need a COAG meeting like you need a hole in the head at this point. Uh, but if that had been, um, if there'd been a national cabinet type arrangement where they, whereby they were doing it on Zoom or whatever the Zoom equivalent is for the national, the national cabinet um, and were able to do it fairly speedily and were able to only deal with the stuff that actually knelt, 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 needed to be dealt with in that forum, that would have been rather different, I think. So I think that element of National Cabinet needs to be brought in as well. Thank you so much. Thank you for that addition. Uh, commissioners. I'd also note it's pretty grim if the Premier's got a man a hose out in the fire too. Um, so <laughs> yeah, diff different levels. Um, in regard to the Constitution, Professor Saunders, I, is the National Cabinet, the way it's come together, recognition that with the many complex situations that are currently facing us, regardless of which jurisdiction has primary responsibility, acknowledges that there are very few areas, if any, where one jurisdiction has sole responsibility for a response. Um, yes, but the National Cabinet's not the... I mean, that's been the fact for, for decades. 
there's nothing novel about um, the current situation in that regard. Um, so the idea Sorry, I'll just, that, ju I'll just jump uh, in, be because most of the paperwork yeah. and, and arguments we see always revolve around this primary responsibility, but I don't think they ever... I've seen anything that comes forward with sole responsibility. So that's why I'm just wondering yeah. if that's why this has come together to try and address those issues. Uh, no, I don't think so, because I think, again, um, the primary responsibility, everybody's got some finger in most pies. Um, uh, story is is a familiar story. I don't know whether you've um, received a copy of the uh, the paper that I wrote with some colleagues for the um, Australian Public Service Review um, uh, about uh, operating together. But we drew a sort of I can't do it on 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 online for you, but we drew a sort of a wedge there to say. Uh, uh, there's, there's very little of significant policy import in Australia at the moment uh, in which there isn't some uh, intergovernmental involvement. But uh, with this wedge, uh, sometimes the wedge has a greater state involvement at the top of the wedge than Commonwealth involvement, and sometimes if the wedge is in reverse, the Commonwealth has more to, more to do. So if you take uh, immigration as an example, uh, immigration is all is is clearly primarily a Commonwealth responsibility, but insofar as states provide schools and uh, and housing, uh, it's helpful for the states to have something to say about uh, immigration numbers. So you can just see how that primary primacy thing works out. Uh, thank, thank you for that. I appreciate it. And we will actually source a copy of that document. We're just, we're just looking it up. We're just looking it up. But before the end, uh, we will get back to you on that one. Commissioner McIntosh. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Professor Saunders. Um, in your evidence, you've described how there's somewhat of a, a split in intergovernment relations. You've got the, the non-crisis situation where it's arguably defined by contestation, and I, and I suppose to some extent that's both um, natural and desirable, that the contestation between jurisdictions and um, between political parties and even within political parties, is it, it keeps us strong. And then we have the crisis situation where you, you need leaders is to put aside those differences and come together for a, a single purpose. Um, I was wondering, given that that division in inter intergovernmental relations and that history, it, would there be any merit in in reserving the national cabinet for those crisis situations rather than trying to create the national cabinet as as the catch-all for all situations? Well. I mean, it's an interesting thought, um, uh, one that deserves consideration. My, my hesitation with it is that it's twofold, really. I don't think that the divide is quite as binary as you just described, um, that on the one hand you have uh, natural disasters or crises where we're all in and on the other it's contested. Uh, I think there's quite a lot of things that are, uh, are not crises but are not particularly contested and can usefully be dealt with uh, in a national way. Um, but I think um, then that, that, that sort of very large and amorphous category eventually tails off into things that actually are completely the priority of one government uh, and uh, the others aren't so fussed about it. Um, uh, so I do think that there is value, I do think that there is real value in keeping uh, intergovernmental processes and in particular um, the time of uh, the leaders of jurisdictions for things that really matter. Uh, and they might be crises or they might be other things, uh, but to keep them for things that really matter rather than trying to load a whole lot of other stuff uh, onto that agenda that could be dealt with uh, by the jurisdictions just doing their own thing uh, or could be dealt with at uh, other ministerial levels. So that's one, one answer to your question. The other, the other answer is that on the premise that you put, uh, we'd be having uh, the National Cabinet for uh, crises uh, and the other arrangements for everything else. Well, I've been very critical of the other arrangements. <laughs> so I've, I've been uh, uh, wanting th th them to change in the direction of a more collaborative, um, uh, more focused uh, 
set of engagements uh, between jurisdictions. Uh, so even if you were to go down that path of saying, let's have both National Cabinet and COAG, I would want to see changes in COAG because I don't think uh, it was really serving the Australian people terribly well. Thanks very much. We could talk about this all day, but I suppose we must move on. <laughs> we could indeed. Thank you. Commissioner Bennett. Thanks. Thanks, Professor Saunders. Um, look, a lot of this conversation, we've covered matters of theory, practice, reality and pragmatism. And you've, you've, you know, you've covered a lot of factors that go that way. On the basis of two premises, which you may agree with or disagree with, um, I'd like you to, uh, to tell me something, and that is, um, one can pass legislation, but often it's not a question of the, le I mean, we you can get it through parliament, but it's not a question of the legislation, but how it's applied in practice and how, how, let's say, the Commonwealth Government passes legislation then how it chooses to apply it. And also accepting the fact that what might be called beneficial legislation may also be in the eye of the beholder. The question I have for you is, as a practical matter, where the Federal Government has made decisions that are in the national space, how often have, have there been challenges by the states on, on a constitutional basis. I mean, one can think of work choices, for example, which was, one would have thought, that's what I thought about the eye of the beholder. Um, you know, work choices could have been thought a good idea from some and not of others. But looking at the sort of thing we're talking about here, which is a national natural disaster, and bearing in mind that you've got that two-stage process, can you think of comparable cases where there have actually been state, not, I don't mean individual challenges, but state challenges, um, you know, to the constitutionality of that sort of legislation? Because obviously there are a lot of cases where theoretically one could have that argument, but realistically and practically there has not been that challenge. So I'm just wondering just whether in terms of High Court jurisprudence you could help me with that. Uh, well, when you say decisions in the national space, what, what does that mean? Well, a decision that um, a, a Commonwealth decision, where I mean we've talked about primary primary responsibility or others. I, I don't mean something something that might have tangential Section 51 application, but doesn't cover the whole of the subject matter of the legislation. Something that is something that clearly uh, is is a de, is a legislation that is it purports to cover the country as a, as a whole, um, uh, whereas. And, and there could have been a constitutional challenge if you if you really sat down there and said, well, you know, not all of this is encompassed by existing constitutional power, or where a state could argue that um, it was uh, not a matter that was within the within um, the federal power within the constitution. Just just looking back at high court how high court challenges, state based high court challenges, have there actually been many? Well, then, um, no, but, you know, the, that's not the way the Commonwealth drafts its legislation. I mean, the Commonwealth does draft its legislation to try to keep it uh, within uh, the Section 51 ambit. Well, it, I mean, may sorry, it may try to do so. I mean, obviously, obviously, Commonwealth legislation is drafted with an eye to Commonwealth, what the Commonwealth can do. But... That's what I mean about the eye of the beholder. There are often, there might also be, and we had a discussion in the opening this morning that if you take the uh, the smorgasbord or potpourri of Section 51, and the Commonwealth uh, has drafted legislation that arguably there might, there might be covered by those powers, but there could also arguably be a, a lacuna in that legislation, which strictly, if you sat down and analysed, it was not encompassed by that power. I mean, I know I'm talking theoretically, but I'm just looking back at, at, at High Court jurisprudence, uh, and I, I know it's not an exam question, but um, can you think of many cases where there has been um, that sort of challenge by the states, where, where they could have found it a challenge, if you look at the legislation, but, but they've chosen in, the, in the, uh, dealing with reality and pragmatism not to do that? Maybe. Look, I haven't gone and uh, looked at the numbers, and I, I mean, there's not that many constitutional cases ever decided, uh, and not so many run by the states. But again, I would say it's, uh, you know, it's not just the states that can challenge things. Uh, it doesn't seem to me to be a terribly sensible practice uh, to pass legislation with constitutional holes in it, running the risk that at some stage somebody affected by that legislation might challenge its constitutionality. I know, I know. Uh, that seems to be a, a very doubtful way of leading. I wasn't suggesting it was a good idea. I was just wondering about bearing in mind that we do have a federal system and there's um, 
consciousness on the parts of the states and the Commonwealth as to the uh, roles, uh, as to the as to the different balances within the power and as, and to um, government responsibility. I know and I know that individuals can challenge, obviously, but I was just wondering whether there were any cases. I'm not saying it's a good idea to do it that way or to rely upon it. Yeah, I'm just asking yeah. if you if you had any. <coughs> Indians. Well, apart from, I mean, the most recent, as you say, is work choices, um, uh, maybe Spence more recently in a sl slightly different context. Uh, I mean, the states will challenge when the states care, uh, is the answer. Yes, but there haven't been that many cases where it's happened. <coughs> no. No, thank you. Thank you. I just want to get your assistance on that. Thank you very much indeed. Professor Saunders, thank you. Can we get credit points for your course after this? Uh, <laughs> no, I think you will be very welcome there at four o'clock tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> I you all. Uh, thank you very much. It's been very beneficial. You've given us another angle on this and we really do appreciate it. And for the record, that wasn't a Royal Commission putting pressure on the professor <laughs> to get credits for a course that they're not enrolled in. I just want to make sure that we're uh, full of the, the full probity issues are understood here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Very nice Hogan. to meet you. You as well. I look forward to meeting you in person at some stage. Ms Hogan Doran. Thank you. Uh, we'll nothing, just look for Nothing any... from parties with leave. Okay. Communicated. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, may uh, Professor Saunders be released from her summons? Thank you. Professor Saunders, you may be released from your summons. Thank you very much for spending the time with us. I know your time's precious. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. So with that, I think we're adjourning until 1300, right? Yes. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll adjourn now and we'll be back in here 1300 Canberra time. Thank you. All rise.
Royal Commission has now resumed. Ms Hogan Doran. Thank you, Chair. I call the Secretary of the Department of Home Affairs of the Commonwealth, Mr Michael Pizzullo, AO. Secretary Pizzullo, good to see you again. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Commissioner. Associate, Mr Pizzullo will take an oath. Mr Pizzullo, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. I do so swear. Thank you. Mr Pizzullo, thank you for giving us your time this afternoon. Uh, uh, do you have a copy of your statement dated 31 July 2020 with you? Yes, I do, Council. And are the contents of that statement true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes, it is. Just sketch for the commissioners what your role is um, as Secretary of the Department uh, of Home Affairs, which I understand you have, were appointed to on 20 December 2017. Uh, Council, that is correct. I've been the Secretary of this department since that time. Uh, this department is an amalgam of a number of functions that were announced by Prime Minister Turnbull, then Prime Minister Turnbull, in July of 2017. In short order, it brings together the Immigration Customs Border Functions, they're all set out, uh, functions otherwise are set out in my statement, so I won't go over them. Obviously, as the Secretary of the Department, I'm a, uh, the leader and the manager of the workforce of the Department and I'm the accountable authority under the relevant legislation for budget. I've also got a particular role in, in advising the Home Affairs Minister, the Minister for Emergency Management, which is most opposite for today and the Acting Immigration Minister in, in the policy realm that I operate in. I'm also responsible for coordinating a number of cross-Commonwealth uh, uh, relevant arrangements, such as the Crisis Management Framework, which no doubt we will uh, get to in a moment. I'm also a member uh, of the Secretary's Board and therefore, along, uh, along with Secretary Gaitchens as our Chair, am responsible for the stewardship and collective leadership of the public service. Thank you, Mr Pizzullo. Um, could we go to Mr Pizzullo's statement, which is HAF 8004-0001-0001 at 0004 and paragraph 18. I might just start there, if I may, um, Mr Pizzullo. Um, and I'm having that paragraph shown to the commissioners and displayed on the, uh, the public broadcast. Um, uh, in this paragraph, you identify the centres of excellence, as you describe them, within the department, uh, such as the Critical Infrastructure Centre, EMA and the NCM, which enable the department to work hand in glove with our Commonwealth colleagues, as well as the states and territories and industry. What I would like to do is just to take, those, uh, in particular, those three um, components, that is EMA, then NCM, and then criti the Critical Infrastructure Centre and policy development in that particular area. Just commencing with EMA, I'm not sure if you were um, uh, able to be either here or be briefed um, on the evidence this morning of former Director Generals of EMA, Mr Mark Crossweller and Mr Cam Darby, and yesterday the current Director General of EMA, um, uh, Mr Rob Cameron. Um, but what what is the current ambit of the work of EMA and, and what future do you see it could have to support a national response to national natural disasters? Uh, the Ambit uh, Council has always been described as all hazards. In my experience coming into the department as the leader of the department from December 2017, I found it to be the case that they were very heavily invested and, and supremely well connected in what I would describe as the fire and emergency services world, very, very well connected indeed. Um, and notwithstanding the fact that the Director General of that function, whether it was in this department or in the Attorney General's department or in days of, of old in the Defence Department tended to be a second or third or in some case four, fourth tier officer in bureaucratic terms, was always considered to be a peer of and work alongside uh, commissioners of fire, rural uh, fire especially and emergency services. So whilst the ambit is all, all hazards, it has been very much focused, and it's a function of Australia's climate, our topography uh, and so on and so forth, to really focus on fire, flood, storm, etc. And they do that very well, and no doubt we can further explore that as we uh, get into these into this discussion. 
The thing that we've bolted on since over the last two and a half years is an ability to truly operate across all hazards. So one of the first uh, stress tests that we did of our arrangements uh, two and a half years ago, actually, uh, was on pandemic. How would we partner up with the Department of Health with its national incident room, its ability to respond to and anticipate a <laughs> pandemic crises? What would be the role of EMA in that context? Because obviously you're not dealing with the Fire and Emergency Services Commissioners, you're dealing with a completely different ecosystem of stakeholders, as it were. So what EMA has evolved over the uh, uh, last two years is into very much a node that can that can lock, lock into, whether it's a fire, storm or a flood vector, as if you think of these threats as vectors, pandemic, and I'll get to the NCM in a moment, because we have to bolster the EMA to deal with the massive magnitude and scale of the global pandemic, but I'll, I'll get to that when I speak about uh, NCM. Or hypothetically, if we were to be the subject of a massive cyber attack, how would they partner with the Australian Signals Directorate and the Cyber Security Centre over at uh, Defence? Not to deal with the cyber attack itself, think of that as the vector, but how would they bring those common core skills of situational awareness rapid response, crisis coordination, uh, the tasking clearinghouse for the ADF in, say, responding to a cyber attack. Often they are the same issues. Telecommunications are down. Food supplies have been impaired. People can't get access to medicines. The power's out. So they are sectors. So the, way, the discipline that we've introduced in the last two years, which Mr Cameron may have, did in fact speak, of, speak about, I'll use my own terms, but essentially goes to the same construct, is irrespective of vector, what are your series of sectoral responses? Mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously in, in relation to each vector, who is your key partner? A fire, a flood, a storm, cyber attack, a pandemic, uh, a geomagnetic storm would be something different again, and God forbid a massive agricultural catastrophe such as the introduction of foot and mouth into Australia. And so one of the ways in which we think about EMA now, you are the node that brings those disciplines together, and then depending on the vector, you partner on to different parts of both government and industry. You mentioned the National Incident Room and also um, uh, the arrangements for cyber security. To what extent is um, EMA's uh, crisis coordination centre still a central um, organising uh, arrangement or, or location for the coordination um, of sectors and for responding to these different vectors, to adopt your terminology, um, in circumstances of crisis? Uh, short of a military conflict, uh, so leave aside war, every other crisis, the Crisis Coordination Centre, or the Triple C as we obviously refer to it, is the central node okay. that then docks into, whether it's a national incident room, the Australian Cyber Security Centre. I'll give you one practical example, Council, that amplifies that point. If the Director General of the Australian Signals Directorate, and particularly the Director of the Australian Cyber Security Centre, wishes to amplify an urgent message about a massive ransomware attack or a massive cyber attack, Ms Bradshaw, the head of the Cyber Security Centre, will dock immediately into the Triple C. She will amplify an alert to her technical stakeholders She'll then be able to have that message amplified by the Triple C as the National Crisis Coordination Centre into its stakeholders. And so to take that example, uh, she can reach a wider audience. She can also work with uh, Director General Cameron to convene then a sectoral meet, set of meetings. I'll get to the NCM in a moment because the NCM plays a slightly different role, but I'll get to that when you ask me about that. Mm. And she can... Whichever sector is being impacted by the cyber event, so just to take that example, she can use the triple C mechanism to dock in whether it's supermarkets and so on and so forth. And indeed, the division of labour that we have is that the specialist crisis responder, a pandemic responder or a cyber responder, they can actually focus on what they need to do, deal with the cyber attack deal with the clinical implications of the of, and the medical issues arising out of the pandemic, leave us to worry about stockpiles, logistics, supermarkets, getting medicines to vulnerable people and the like. You've described the interconnections between the different centres or nodes um, within the Commonwealth Government in terms of responding to crisis. How well connected are Commonwealth nodes or Commonwealth centres with the respective state and territory operational centres? 
very well in most vectors. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll use a couple of examples to amplify that point. One suggestion that I that I intend to make the, to the commissioners through through you, council, is that I think that there is a an opportunity here, particularly with the creation of the national cabinet, that no doubt we'll get to, for the states and territories to think about bringing their home affairs like capabilities together. But we'll we'll get to that no doubt in a moment. But vector by vector, those nodes are very well connected. So, for instance, EMA's connectivity to the commissioners and chief officers and their command centres. Uh, EMA also plugs in if it's a police or CT incident through the federal police and also directly into the incident response centres. Very well connected uh, with the ADF into state crisis emergency centres as well. So I would contend to this commission vector by vector. The connections are very, very good. The question in my mind, an open question indeed, is now that we have the national cabinet the national coordinating mechanism, is there a gap that could be remediated relatively straightforwardly by having Home Affairs, supporting the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet perhaps, also connecting up First Minister's departments. Now, we've done that through the NCM. Yes, can I come, can I come to the NCM? Because uh, Indeed, um, well, pr prior to um, the terrible COVID pandemic, uh, the, the coordinating mechanism appeared to be the National Crisis Committee uh, on a vertical level and as, between, as across um, the Commonwealth Government, the Australian Government Crisis Coordination Committee. The NCM seems to be have as its foundation what was the structure of the NCC, but it's not clear um, that it's not... Sorry, I withdraw that. It appears to be much more than that. Is that right? And if so, in what ways? Yes, uh, your observation is very astute. In fact, when the Prime Minister asked for advice about how best to plug in uh, or, or link in with Premier's offices, Premier's themselves, heads of Premier's departments and Chief Minister's departments, the advice that we gave him through the Home Affairs Minister and the Emergency Management Minister was to do a relatively minor adaptation. So in doctrine, uh, you're absolutely right, the National Crisis Committee essentially a, 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 an apparatus that has emerged over 20 years mm. after 9-11, the Bali attacks and the, uh, the more prevalent terrorist attacks that we saw 10 or 15 years ago. The connectivity, though, is essentially the same. The difference being, because COVID was going to be such a wide societal and economic impact, in a way that, it, with the exception of 9-11 itself, terrorist attacks have been much more localised, we had to build in deeper connections into industry, supply chains, supermarkets, providers of essential supplies such as hand sanitizers. So yes, we adapted the National Crisis Committee, the, the Commonwealth version of which is known as the Australian Government Crisis Committee. Uh, Secretary Gaitens and I intend, uh, once we get through both um, the bushfire uh, Royal Commission process, COVID, which is ongoing. We do, just to mark the spot, intend to rewrite the doctrine. So that the NCM, which has become a reality, a very useful reality, pragmatically and practically used by the Prime Minister and the Premiers, we, we want to then retrofit that back into doctrine. Regrettably, sometimes council doctrine is thought to be the limitation on reality. In this case, we've created the reality. We'll get to the doctrine in due course. Um, uh, can we go to paragraph 16, which is the top of the page, um, just for some further, uh, to use your word, amplification of the points you're making there, uh, Secretary uh, Pizzullo. Um, what we see here is, um, in the second sentence, uh, reference to standing up the NCM and task forces therein um, to coordinate the non-health aspects of the Commonwealth's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Do I just get some sense from you of what are the task forces that you're referring to there um, and noting that they are directed to the non-health aspects of the Commonwealth's response? Uh, thank you, Council. I should make just a very brief preambular point that allow me to take two sentences. Um, for reasons that I perhaps alluded to do obliquely before, we decided to create the NCM for the moment at least as both parallel to but connected to EMA simply so that EMA could, uh, back in March, you, you'll recall, we were still dealing with the aftermath of bushfires, so I didn't want to take the focus off. But as pandemics started to emerge, 
we created as an equivalent divisional structure, the NCM, in functional terms within my department. They work together and one deputy secretary, Mr Grigson, is the chief coordinating deputy who links up with um, industry and government uh, governments in relation to the matters I'm about to describe. So I should have made that clear. Thank you. And in the aftermath of both the Royal Commission's initial report plus uh, in addition to what the Australian government's going to be considering in terms of future functionality, in effect, we will bolt those two functions together. So I should have marked that spot earlier, Council. But in terms of the task forces themselves, they range from everything from supermarkets, uh, rural workforce, uh, the permits and permissions around uh, interstate border, intra, sorry, interstate domestic, that is, border movement, so how, how do you ensure that freight, for instance, keeps crossing state borders as the sovereign states were, were able to put in place border closures? How do we manage that? There was a Telco working group. There are a number of others that I'll no doubt not recall, and I'll give you a full list in writing if you so wish. Yes, uh, did, would we have enough bandwidth, for instance, uh, through Telstra and NBM to support working from home and schooling from home? So there are a number of... To go back to my essential models of vectors and sectors, there are a number of sectoral committees and task forces, the NCM being the lynching, uh, the central lynching point of those processes. And so the Prime Minister and the Premiers could quickly mobilise advice and get advice on, uh, are the supermarkets going to be stocked? Do we have enough bandwidth? Um, if everyone's logging on from home to do their schooling for their kids and, and for work purposes, are the systems going to crash? So, again, it was one node with tentacles into each of those sectors. I want to come um, for, uh, later in the piece to the critical infrastructure uh, strategy, but it does sound like the task forces have had at least um, uh, some echo of the TISN arrangements, that is the Trusted Information uh, Security Sh sorry, sharing, sharing. There's too many acronyms in this Royal Commission. Uh, but nevertheless, that was a sectoral uh, relationship between government and uh, private industry and, and to also um, uh, where there are uh, government uh, agencies at a state and territory level that are responsible for either essential services or essential, essential infrastructure. Um, was that used to inform the creation of the task forces or were the, were the creation of the task forces more just a response to the circumstances as the, um, the pandemic un, uh, unfolded? That is, reactive to that as opposed to being building on the, the pre-existing structures and uh, relationships? Uh, Council both, the, the TISN supplied us with critical intelligence about how different sectors operated, noting the TISN uh, predates all of this. It goes back to the work done on infrastructure protection in the aftermath of 9-11, uh, and most Western governments tended to develop a civil contingencies or infrastructure protection regime, sometimes codified in statute, sometimes through regulation, sometimes through these information sharing arrangements. Australia's had a mixture of both. What that uh, information sharing portal and database gave us was uh, incredibly rich insights into how ports work, supply chains, trucking, logistics. That can be used for a multiplicity of purposes, whether there's a cyber attack, whether there's a pandemic, to go back to the vectors uh, point. So we adapted that intelligence, but the TISN itself and the work of the critical infrastructure centre itself it's more related to regulatory affairs. So what we did is we took that intelligence and the benefit, of course, it's all in one department, so we can move resources and experts and specialists around, and we created operational task forces that leverage that rich data and that rich intelligence picture, essentially of how Australian logistics supply chains and the economy essentially works. Um, how does the NCM and their task forces uh, differ to to the National COVID Coordination Commission. Uh, is it, is, how do they differ and how do they relate? Uh, well, I've got the benefit of being a commissioner on that commission as well, so I, I can ensure that the bridging works. Mr Power and his commissioners have been tasked to look at longer-term re reconstruction and recovery. That is their uh, principal mandate. The Prime Minister's made that clear both when he when he established the commission originally and he recently reset it with some new commissioners and, and even a clearer terms of reference around advising government on, if you will, reconstruction. 
However, and Mr Power and I uh, and Mr Gaitchens as also a commissioner agreed from the outset, to the extent that the commissioners could use their personal contacts, their networks, their deep insight into retail, wholesale, trucking, uh, telecommunications, to the extent that they could assist the NCM with troubleshooting and immediate response, their assistance was more than welcomed. It was actually, in some cases, game-changing, but it's not to be confused with actually running the crisis coordination work. That's our job. The Commission is very much focused on how do we build a stronger economy coming out of COVID. Um, while we still have on display here, I'm not sure it's been displayed to you, but in paragraph 16, uh, the, the latter half of it refers to uh, the concurrent surging of staff to other Commonwealth agencies. And I just want to get a sense what what has happened within um, uh, your department in relation to uh, the staffing and redeployment or surging um, and, and what kind of flexibility there would be uh, for that going forward into other national natural disasters. Well, the advantage of having the scale of our department, which is uh, roughly 14,000 strong, uh, but that's inclusive of the Australian Border Force, which is an operational agency that operates obviously at our ports, our seaports and, and elsewhere. Uh, so they've obviously got very operational work to do, but save that, there's 14,000 staff. Um, with the adjustments that we've been able to make, because obviously these replications have dried up, if not completely then largely, our staff are multi-talented. They are generalist public servants first, and then they are specialists in their realm second. So we were able to create a, an internal surge or reserve workforce at its peak. It was uh, well over a 1,000. Uh, when I say peak in the March-April period, we are able to re redeploy a number of those staff. I, I'm not sure, Council, and I'll need to check whether every single uh, officer on that list of 1,000 was on every single day deployed, but at its peak, we had available to us at least 1,000 officers, some of whom staffed up the NCM, and they worked on everything from supermarkets to telcos and all the other matters that we, that we uh, discussed earlier. In other cases, they were able to be deployed as a reserve force to Services Australia, particularly when Job Seeker was first uh, implemented in helping in registering uh, Australians into that system, many of whom have, had never applied for benefits of that nature before. And so obviously a talented visa officer, a citizenship processing officer in an emergency, and you, would, you can't sustain this because obviously uh, you want your visa system to be optimally uh, staffed and so on and so forth. But in an emergency, you do reprioritise and public servants have got the ability to bring problem solving, good record keeping, good decision making skills, the ability to match identities and the like, and that can be deployed either internally within the department to shore up EMA and or NCM, or externally to the externally such as into Services Australia. So you speak there, and you've just spoken now about uh, surging staff into other Commonwealth agencies. To what extent has or could um, Commonwealth public servants be, uh, I guess, seconded into support state and territory arrangements or staffing? or even private sector. Is that is that possible within the Australian public service environment? Uh, yes, it is, and indeed, we, we have a, a current operation on foot. In fact, it's referred to at the very, in the last sentence or the last clause of that sentence there. Uh, I make reference there to the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre. Uh, Victoria uh, requested assistance. Uh, sorry, I'll, I'll withdraw that. The Federal Health Department that is responsible for the oversight and regulation of uh, aged care homes and residences came to an agreement with the Victorian Health Department, which is of course responsible for public health, that we needed to put a, um, a, a surge team in to assist with command, control, communications, triaging what was happening in those nursing homes. You would have seen public reports in some homes. The entire workforce had to be stood down because of COVID infection. Yes. So that, that required an emergency response. We have a combination of EMA officers, Federal Health, Federal, uh, sorry, Victorian Health, I should say, Victorian Emergency Management, working as a joint team, cross-jurisdictionally, to bring stability to the workforce and other issues that need to be put back in place to support those residents in those nursing homes. So the answer to your question is yes, uh, we ensured all the appropriate legal immunities and legal powers were in place, and we did it very much on uh, in a rap in rapid order.
Um, I'll, I'll take it in reverse order and ask you uh, to what extent that this, first in relation to staff and then in relation to the, NC, the NCM, the National COVID me uh, Coordinating Mechanism, to what extent do the approach and experience with COVID um, be able to be utilised in natural disasters? So just looking at the question of staffing to begin with. But certainly with uh, staffing, uh, you would have um, a fixed uh, core group whose day job was command control, coordination, crisis management, irrespective of vector. Uh, to, to us, uh, again, short of a war involving military conflict, and even the term natural hazard for us uh, is um, not ambiguous, but we have soft edges around it because a massive cyber attack occasioned by human actors or just the systems outage that is so profound is, is in a sense artificial, it's not natural, but the consequences of having the internet down, uh, supplies disrupted, um, uh, traffic lights out and the like would be just as dramatic as if, as, if an, as if an earthquake had hit a major city. So natural for us is a sort of elastic concept. Um, in terms of staffing, you do need people who are professionally and deeply trained in those disciplines that I mentioned. And then what you need to do, depending on the nature of the crisis, is to be able to surge people around them, partly because they get fatigued, they need relief as well. So there are people who can come in and do a night shift, for instance, to monitor um, systems, to write reports. You can, with, you can draw those staff from your surge list, but it is important to have professionals both professionals who are expert in the vector, be it a fire, a terrorist vector, cyber, um, pandemic, you need people who are deeply expert in the, in the vector, and you also need people who are deeply expert in relevant sectors <laughs> to form your, your core element around which you can put other staff to assist. In relation to the NCM, uh, if one were to apply that to natural disasters in their broader sense, and certainly national natural disasters, um, is the mobilisation of resources one of uh, supporting the states and territories, uh, or is it broader than that, that it is in terms of the way it is operated from COVID and to go forward? It's always going to depend on the scale of the catastrophe. So um, if, if you were... In fact, I might take this top down rather than bottom up. Mm. Uh, a catastrophe that, that hit the nation, either in terms of its immediate impact or its consequences. And, and there are some catastrophes which, uh, you know, regrettably start to look like, um, uh, you know, the last book of the Bible in terms of their apocalyptic um, dimensions. Um, and uh, we obviously need to think about those. We plan for those. They are very extreme um, uh, consequences, but very low likelihood. But we would not be doing our jobs if we didn't think about those. Uh, a massive cyber attack I've mentioned on several occasions. Uh, imagine doing COVID as difficult as that has been with um, a persistent outage of electricity. Uh, that would be, frankly, far worse. Um, Imagine, and again, uh, we get paid to be in our trade called, we're called black hats. Mm -hmm. We need to think through with our colleagues in the Defence Department particularly. Imagine a bioweapon, and I don't use that term lightly, I use it in a very uh, uh, defined fashion. Imagine a coded virus that was designed to kill at a particular rate of lethality in relation to which a vaccine was actually, had been engineered but was being withheld. There are, there are going to be, and then of course there's the outbreak of, of war, which is very clearly a national uh, function. There are some catastrophes, um, mercifully, uh, rarely, rarely occurring, that would be of such a character that only the Commonwealth in its, in its nationhood role would have the capacity and indeed the reach, the resources, and probably in a deep sense, the constitutional responsibility to, to lead on. And in that context, the National Cabinet's role would be to mobilise across the nation where, no doubt, in those sorts of scenarios... And, and I, I don't use those scenarios lightly and I don't, certainly don't wish to raise anxiety uh, by uh, speculating in almost science-fiction-like scenarios, but they are credible enough low-probability eventualities that we do need to think about those. So that's at the very top end. Clear role for the leadership... Uh, clear leadership role for the for the Commonwealth, the Prime Minister, in circumstances up to and including war. 
The next tear down, in my way of thinking about it, are, are catastrophic incidents which are either confined to a nation, uh, to a state, that have such a profound impact that, that there are national consequences which have affected our ports, or our electricity system, uh, our supplies and distribution. So the immediate response might well be within the ambit of a, uh, of a state with a premier, uh, an emergency services coordinator responding. But the impact, say, um, think of the attack uh, uh, in, on 9-11, which was an attack on buildings in New York City and, and, and elsewhere, but they had such a profound impact in terms of the national aviation system, for instance, uh, President Bush had had no had no uh, alternative, obviously, other than that, uh, other than to step in and say uh, the mayor has got an element of this under control. The state governor is doing other things. I need to attend to things like uh, further attacks coming and or what happens with aircraft that are in uh, that are in the air. Shared responsibilities, very clearly. So again, I would see the national cabinet as having in that still catastrophic but not quite existential category a key role to play. And then there's probably a tier, and I don't want to tier these in a, tier these in a way to, to suggest uh, a lack of importance, because if a town is burnt out or people are impacted and they're still recovering after a bushfire that's quite localised, that is dreadful for them and our hearts, of course, go out to them and we try to do whatever we can for the reconstruction. But then in that tier that I'm about to describe, you've got a clearly localised impact well within the ambit and the uh, constitutional remit of the state in question. And the Commonwealth role there is very much to be in support, to provide um, uh, resources as requested. It doesn't prevent the, the Commonwealth, as Mr Cameron's made clear, from positioning resources and maybe anticipating a request, and maybe we can get to that when we speak about the changes that we made to our posture after 1 January just passed in terms of bushfires, pushing liaison officers forward. But in that third category, and again, I, I wish to make it clear to the commissioners, I don't seek to diminish the importance of that third category. It's still, it's one, it's the one that's most prevalent in terms of probability and the one that's probably likely to impact on people the mo most often. That's where the Commonwealth supports. So just coming to um, Comdis plan and the pragmatic approach as it was described, practical or pragmatic approach as it was described by Mr Cameron yesterday to its interpretation, um, what's, what's, what's the plan with Comdis plan going forward? Uh, in light of the advent of uh, COVID, the establishment of the uh, National Cabinet, the NCM, the, uh, the fusing of the NCM and EMA functions that uh, I certainly am contemplating and in discussions that I'm having with ministers, um, we will work with the states and territories to recognise those new realities and to write that into the into the doctrine that's contained in that plan. I see. All right. Um, paragraph nine of your statement, if I may. So far, your responses have been very focused on on the sort of response phase of an emergency. And I just wanted to now pivot to look at broader issues of preparedness, res resilience and recovery from all hazards. Um, you make, although you've identified these three different tiers, what you make are the um, observation uh, in paragraph nine is uh, to quote a strong case of a greater centralisation of decision making in relation to preparedness, response, resilience and recovery from all hazards. And I just invite you just if you could clarify um, how that uh, how that sits with the three tiers and recognition of that third tier um, in that context. I think, uh, and and uh, I, I've been focused principally on responding on the day or the immediate uh, aftermath. Um, your responses are going to be better honed uh, with deeper preparation, uh, training and, and exercising. I don't want to be glib about this, but it's no different from sport or, or any other endeavour in life. The more preparation you do, the more planning and training you do, the better off you are on the day, although obviously you need to adjust on the day. Um, depending on the, the risk register that I laid out earlier, those matters that are most profoundly, less likely to occur, but most profoundly impact across the nation are the ones where national leadership is always going to be, in a democracy, the, the, the key. So whether it's a massive terrorist incident, whether it's a massive 
um, outbreak of an agricultural uh, disease, um, uh, a bio uh, a bio strike along the lines that I described, having preset plans, you're not going to slavishly follow them exactly because on the day you'll need to adjust, mm. but having preset plans, preset preparedness standards, preset doctrine and preset communications protocols driven from the top down because inevitably with those sorts of scenarios, the Prime Minister, the Premiers and the Chief Ministers, either collectively or in a, in a couple of cases, perhaps one or two states that have been most impacted, are always going to take an immediate direct interest. As you then work through that hierarchy of risk, uh, it's probably the case that that the political leadership is not required to allocate resources or to direct the response, but they need to be assured in the preparedness sense, almost from an audit and assurance point of view, that those plans are in place. So whichever way you cut it, you've got to work out ways to thread all of these vectors and these sector response plans ultimately back to our democratic leadership. And then it's just going to be a function of, as we go forward, vector by vector, sector by sector, what is the best ministerial arrangement and what is the best uh, Commonwealth state territory official arrangement to ensure that that um, governance and that democratic accountability has been put in place. So in the final sentence in the first two clauses, you say, within the framework of the nation's constitutional framework and the distribution of powers across the Federation, Australia must have in place national civil contingency arrangements. Now, just pausing there, what do you mean by national civil contingency arrangements? So, so all of the uh, contingencies that I've been describing, from the most existential to the catastrophic to the... I don't, certainly don't want to diminish them as mundane, but the, the more regular occurring, they all fit within... Uh, uh, and perhaps this is uh, my defence planning background uh, showing, they all fit in, in the realm of contingencies. And a contingency is a risk materialised, a function of its likelihood and its consequential impact and what it means both for those immediately impacted and for those who suffer downstream impacts. So that is a contingency. How you deal with those contingencies, flood, fire, agricultural risk, pandemic, cyber, is, is the contingencies framework. And, and obviously, my, um, in my submission, I contend that that framework is best managed on a national basis, noting that as you work through that contingency hierarchy, as you get to more localised impacts well within the resources and province of a state, you don't need national arrangements to intervene or to direct, but sometimes you need those national arrangements to be poised to support. Can we go now to paragraph 20 of your statement, uh, which is on page 005, Operator. Um, I want to now uh, shift from the focus on hazards in the arrangement and look in particular at um, a particular vulnerability, uh, which is critical infrastructure. Uh, and uh, you say here in 2019 the Australian government and industry started work on updating the critical infrastructure resilience strategy. Just pausing in that respect, what's the status of that work and what is what is the work directed to achieving? So, uh, in two parts, and today's very opportune because the Prime Minister and the Home Affairs Minister just announced the cyber dimension of what I'm about to uh, describe. So the critical infrastructure resilience strategy, for reasons that I mentioned earlier when I was discussing TISM, is very much built on a regulatory model, which is what are the obligations under law, principally the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act, known as SOCI, yes. what, are, what are the obligations under law for owners and operators to do certain things in a way that can be assured through a typical and, and quite orthodox regular, regulatory compliance framework? ownership arrangements in line with foreign investment rules, for instance, the requirement for workers in critical functions to hold either Australian security clearances or Australian citizenship. That is what I've described as a regulatory model. It is not an operator's model. It, mm. It's not able to be deployed in a fluid, flexible fashion in the way that, I, as I suggested earlier, we're able to take that information, put it through the NCN to actually then address real-world questions like, for all of that, is the, is the network going to break tonight when everyone's uh, children are at, are at home, being homeschooled? So the framework that, uh, that the department inherited uh, was very fit for purpose for regulatory and compliance purposes outside of cyber. 
remedying that for cyber has now been achieved with the announcements made earlier today by the Prime Minister. Yes. Uh, he, has, he has announced that we will be changing the regulatory framework to put obligations onto critical infrastructure operators in relation to cyber vulnerabilities. And in the other dimension that this strategy will uh, formally, where the doctrine will catch up to the reality is, how do we operationalise those networks and the deep connections that we have with infrastructure operators in that very day-to-day -day way that I mentioned earlier? The... Um so that's the uh, announcements today in relation to the additional funding for uh, as part of a cyber security strategy. You go on to say in the next sentence uh, that the department is progressing initial work on uplifting the security and resilience of our critical infrastructure and systems of national significance, including by ensuring that the Australian government has the best information available to make judgments in times of crisis. Is that speaking to something slightly different? And if so, what? That, no, it's an extension of the point just made, and, and your reference to the announcement earlier today on the funding was an element of it, but the, the more, for these purposes, the more impactful point or the more, uh, the more central point will be the obligations, and this will be subject to the Parliament, of course, considering the, the legislation I'm about to describe, and obviously seeing fit to pass it, but assuming that the Parliament seems, sees fit to uh, turn its mind to this legislation in a positive fashion. And I think the Minister made it clear that it's his intention to have this legislation through by Christmas. The new critical infrastructure legislation that replaces the current statute that's on the books would do several things. It would require critical infrastructure operators, particularly a key subset known as operators of systems of national significance. Now, they'll need to be set out in a regulatory instrument, so I don't want to preempt that, but you can imagine what are the key essentials that are delivered to us through systems of national significance, power, water, gas, banking. Now, I don't want to be prescriptive uh, with that list because I don't want to presume where the parliament will get to with that legislation nor what a future minister might choose to regulate by way of instrument. But for illustrative purposes, those systems of national significance or SOMS to use the acronym, will be a subset of that critical infrastructure. So I just draw attention to the fact that that will be done by regulatory force. I see. The funding that, uh, to which you refer to, Council, uh, is then the funding that will be given to the ASD and to other parts of government to work with those operators to detect threats on their networks, principally of a cyber character. And then the other thing that we'll do in the physical realm is to enhance our information collection through the TISM that I mentioned earlier, to the wall, we've got a full spectrum data set that goes to both cyber variables and physical variables. Um, now, I'm not sure if it's related to the partnerships with the industry point or uh, is something separate. Uh, you refer by way of footnote, we can just take to uh, footnote three, uh, an approach to market has been made by the department uh, what, in relation to some opportunities. What, what is that referring to for those who aren't able to click on that link? I'll have to. Um, I just have to remind myself of the actual request that we put out. That it was a, uh, and I'll, I'll correct this uh, as I as as I need to. I, as I recall it, it was to gain information on how to further improve the information sharing network arrangements that we have with with industry to get to get that information into single into a single portal. If I need to correct that evidence, I will. That's all right. Um, I was hoping you would be able to assist me, Mr Fazzullo, because I've successfully left my copy of that printout in my uh, in my office and I didn't have time to read it. Uh, but between us, we'll get there. Uh, now, in relation to... Um, uh, the issue about information sharing. Before I come to the Critical Infrastructure Centre and other aspects of that, there's a there's a there's a point you make in paragraph ten about a concept of embedding of active uh, feedback loops. I'm sorry, 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 council. Paragraph ten. Uh, paragraph 10 on page 2 of thank your you. statement. Sorry about that. Um, I just don't know no, if it's you. connected. Um, you refer to uh, the concept of embedding active feedback loops, uh, a concept referring to the cycle whereby information is exchanged between the central body and devolved operations, which exchange in turn increases the efficacy of the overall effect effort. And I was trying to understand whether that was linked in any way to the information sharing opportunities that you were just describing, or is it something entirely different? Uh, 
No, it's on point. Uh, the, the information sharing to which I was referring to is a sectoral uh, point about industry sectors. I see. But obviously, with these feedback loops, um, and to take schools as an example, in some cases, and we have to think about post-pandemic, how to ensure that this occurs also with state and territory governments, if, if we need to, for instance, ever, ever again, have all of our children at home, take that example, uh, homeschooling, you need a combination both of state government information about the, the profile of their uh, demography in their schools, how many children they've got, where they are, and you need to then combine that with sectoral information that would come from Telstra, NBN, Optus and others, and the role of the EMA function, by which I, for these purposes, mean EMA plus NCM, would be to mill all of that information together and then to provide advice up to the National Cabinet or to relevant ministers, if it had been delegated to ministers, to say, we think, for instance, to take that example, between industry and the state school systems, we can cope and or we can't, and here's what we intend to do about it. So it's feedback both from industry, but also from uh, other key sectors such as state and territory instrumentalities. And, and perhaps, uh, as if I understand what you've said correctly, uh, and to adopt the parlance that we've um, pursued in this Royal Commission this week, to, to create a better sense of national situational awareness for the purposes of decision-making at a yes. national level, I see. Yes. Um, uh, I, I, I skipped away from it, but I want to come back to it. To what extent is um, is this effort um, to be housed within uh, that centre of excellence that I, we began with, which was the Critical Infrastructure Centre, uh, and how does that relate to EMA? Because I understand that's in a sec it's a separate part within the department more broadly, but not necessarily tied presently to EMA's functionality. Um, uh, well, it is insofar as it's the same... Uh, group manager or deputy secretary is responsible for both. So there's a structural nexus between the EMA uh, and the CIC or the Critical Infrastructure Centre. Uh, they will specialise, they, sorry, I should say, I withdraw that, they specialise, present tense, in two different but connected realms. The CIC works in that regulatory realm of which I was speaking before. So to take an example, the CIC works with the Treasury in assisting the Treasury when it does foreign investment screening. So they have deep sectoral expertise in banking, roads, power, water, all the sectors that we've been referring to. The CIC does not duplicate the EMA's role. They are regulators and policy and compliance officers. So for instance, they can be tapped by the Treasury who might have a foreign investment proposal before them to say, what are your understandings of the vulnerabilities, Australia's strategic interest in this um, power grid or this uh, water, water system or this traffic management system? Where EMA gets value in tapping into the CIC is on that same data, not from the point of view of regulation or you know approving a foreign investment proposal, but that same expertise can also be very useful in, in terms of dealing with questions like, um, uh, freight and logistics. How, how do we ensure that we get uh, food into uh, supermarkets, including in remote localities? That example I used earlier, how much strain can we put on the telco system to tr uh, school our kids at home? We have specialists in the CIC who typically would be working on regulatory questions, legislative questions, policy questions. They can be mobilised, though, as specialists experts to assist EMA with those day-to-day -day operational questions as well. Now, um, so, so they are complementary and connected. I see. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Pizzullo. Um, I've been handed the document that I successfully failed to bring in with me, which is uh, that link that we were just mentioning before. Um, to remind you, uh, it's an it's a, um, an information document published by the Department of Home Affairs uh, titled Critical Infrastructure and Systems of National Significance Mapping and Analysis, uh, identifying that uh, the department was seeking technical advice and expertise on the development of a national critical infrastructure and systems of national significance mapping and analysis capability. Um, that application uh, sis, uh, pro, that application uh, closed on the 26th of June. What's the status of that work? Uh, that will be, uh, that will support the work that I mentioned earlier to create the new regulatory scheme. I'll use the bureaucratic shorthand of the 
SOCI SONS scheme. SOCI standing for Security of Critical Infrastructure Act, SOCI. And within the new act, as I mentioned earlier, will be a subset of critical infrastructure of exceptional sensitivity to the nation known as SONS, right. Systems of National, National Significance. And, and that mapping exercise will serve that dual purpose of which I, to which I just referred. Both for regulatory reasons, that is to say, a, a Minister for Home Affairs will be presented with regulatory um, considerations to designate certain infrastructure for certain purposes, which might go to who can own it, who can operate it, the nationality, in other words, you might have to be an Australian citizen to operate certain parts of infrastructure, what cyber protection you are mandatorily required and you're obligated to have, and that goes to the cyber announcement that I described to you earlier that the Prime Minister made just a few a few brief hours ago. And then that same mapping tool will, will give us an even richer picture of operational connectivity that will be of tremendous value to EMA as well. That, I, I, just to be clear, Council, is a derivative benefit of that tender. I see. Um, and just noting that it, it would, at its mature end state of capability, the map uh, would allow analysis, the mapping would allow analysis of um, the critical infrastructure or system and systems of national significance, locations, vulnerabilities, criticality and interdependence. Um, one, of the obs one of the other points that is made in this, and I'll have this um, uh, entered into the system and, and pro provided for tender commissioners, that once mature, the capability could also be used to inform a variety of decision making, including infrastructure planning and development and risk reduction measures. Um, the, yes. the way that that is put, it, it sounds like that's not necessarily the starting intent, but is a potential endpoint that it would add in um, a capability for risk reduction uh, well, measures. Is that right? Well, it, it, its primary purpose is, as I've described it, but it's such a rich document, and you can imagine elements of it will have to be highly classified because, in, in effect, it will be the crown jewels of, in a sense, how Australia works logistically. And, and once you've got that, you would obviously reuse that for several purposes. And you'd have to obviously redact uh, sensitive information at different levels of usage. Um, for its primary purpose, just so that uh, the, the procurement auditors understand that we're spending money on, on things that have been appropriated, its primary purpose is to create a map that would support the, um, presuming of course the parliament uh, sees fit to pass the legislation that I described earlier, it would provide a map so that a Minister for Home Affairs under the designation power that I've described would designate critical infrastructure for purposes of protection, certain cyber standards, things of that nature. It would assist a treasurer in... Uh, here's another derivative purpose that goes to your point. It would assist a, a treasurer in making decisions under the Foreign Acquisitions and Takeover Act. But it also it could, and we'll have to work through the protocols for sharing this information, but it could help... Commonwealth and state planning ministers in terms of the resilience of infrastructure, understanding the uh, sensitivities of intermodal connections or, or connections where roads and uh, data and uh, cables all meet, but have that planning benefit as well. It would help disaster planners think about uh, recovering resilience. And as I said earlier, it would help EMA think about how to protect the infrastructure from a variety of vectors, whether it's an earthquake, fire, storm, tsunami and the like. Thank you so much, uh, Secretary Pizzullo. I note the time and I want to give the Commissioner some time to ask any questions they have of you and I might do that now. No, that was great, Secretary Pizzullo. We appreciate that and all the thought uh, that you've the thoughts that you've given us. Um, I'm going to put you on a bit of a spot. Uh, and look backwards to the 1920 fire season and what went on, and I'll give you a chance to think about it as I sort of step through, and rather than look at what was in place then, because that's clearly irrelevant now as we move forward, how this whole new uh, framework or mechanism would, would overlay it. So, you know, we go back to early last year, uh, predictions are this is going to be the worst season on record from all the climate predictions, the, uh, the, the drought's been going. Northern Territory starts to, to burn as it normally does, uh, sort of towards the end of the, the dry. Not a lot of population spaces out there, but then Queensland starts to burn. Fires move south into New South Wales, further south into the Blue Mountains. 
South Australia lights off in uh, Adelaide Hills and, uh, and Kangaroo Island, continues to burn south around the, the, the back of Sydney. Further south, Gippsland starts to, uh, to, to burn. We have fires in, uh, in Tasmania, although a bit smaller. Our main uh, lines of communication with WA on the ground are cut off with uh, Norseman fires and, uh, and the, the like there. And then as we come into the into the new year, we have uh, fires around uh, the ACT, Aurora Valley. Smoke's been pervading all this for a couple of months, national health issues. And then as we get to the end of all, all this, we start to have COVID roll in uh, on, on top of it. So I'm hoping that gave you a chance to have a bit, just a quick think, but at a higher level, how would this new uh, format work to be able to, to look to uh, to address the issues that would come out of that at a uh, at a national coordination level. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Commissioner, uh, and uh, thank you for running through that narrative. It, it did allow me to gather my thoughts, but it, it is something that I've also have given thought to. Look, I don't want to presume. I don't want to place myself in the shoes of the prime minister or the premiers, but I, I would assume, knowing all we know now, knowing. Uh, the machinery that we've built uh, from uh, both through the bushfire period, those phases that you've described, and recalling, of course, that the ADF was directed to take a more forward lean posture in terms of pushing forward joint task force, and I think you've taken evidence on that, so I don't need to rehearse that. No, so I'm also have. going to build that into this, and I'm, I'm going to build that into this equation. If you had a time machine and, in a sense, went backwards to maybe roughly about now, August, September, I think, and I don't want to speak for the Prime Minister, but I would assume now that he's got this machinery in place with his colleagues, the fellow leaders of the nation, you would start with a national cabinet meeting on the um, extreme weather risks that we're facing. Um, you would have at that committee a number of, at that meeting rather, a number of feeder pieces of advice from the uh, health side, the AHPBC, around uh, smoke impacts and the like, because they have a role there. Uh, the commissioners and chief officers, I know that you've taken advice, would be ready and primed through either through DGMA or through the Minister for Emergency Management to give their frank views about resource, given that the fire seasons are also extending in the northern hemisphere to a greater extent. So the, the traditional model of swinging aircraft between hemispheres, I know something very much on their mind. Uh, and you'd also have, in this context, we didn't know about COVID, but let's imagine if you had a concurrent other potentially catastrophic risk, you'd have that advice. So you'd walk into the National Cabinet in uh, roughly, uh, you would think, August, September. You'd have a briefing from the Director General of EMA. Uh, and if I had a time machine, I'm assuming that EMA and NCM have come together for this purpose. There'd be a question in my mind, and I, I would give uh, advice uh, to this point about whether a minister or a group of ministers perhaps, if not so much moderated, but were parties that, because the ministers, and I know you've taken some evidence on, in a Westminster system, what is the role then of the ministers in this uh, equation? Um, I think of it like this, the health minister in COVID is having his own uh, networked arrangement with the state health ministers, and they, they consult the HPPC, but the HPPC advice goes directly into the National Cabinet, so I'm going to take a little bit of a gamble here and think that the Prime Minister and the Premiers and the Chief Ministers would want to hear directly from the officers, not secretaries of departments, the actual officers themselves. They get a briefing and they'd say, OK, how bad could this get? How bad could it get in terms of concurrency of events, cross-border? How are we going for fleets, retardant? Um, do you have enough bombers? Um, how are we placed in terms of international crews? and so on and so forth. The DG in that context with, um, and again, for this purpose, Commissioner, I'm, I'm connecting the, EC, uh, the EMA and the NCM function, would almost certainly get some homework out of that meeting. You and I have been in those sorts of meetings many times at the federal level, out of the National Security Committee, and there'd be comebacks about telcos, supermarkets, and so on and so forth. I think the other construct that we haven't touched on there would be some kind of institutionalisation at the national level, which I know is on the government's mind about some kind of recovery and reconstruction function. I won't call it an agency, I'll just call it a function. And I think uh, Mr Gaitchens, uh, is has made some comments about that in his 
uh, statement and, and no doubt he'll be willing to speak to that. I think the recovery lead would also be involved in that discussion because um, you've got to be both prepared to take the blow, you've got to be, uh, be prepared to take the blow and stand back up, and then you've got, to be, uh, you've got to be prepared to build back. What would I think happen then, Commissioner, is that the National Cabinet would make a number of binding decisions because of the way the National Cabinet is working. Constitutionally, they are pooling their sovereignty. And so, in effect, nine sovereign governments would say, OK, we've heard about the risk, we've heard about the preparedness side, we've heard about the concurrency side, we've taken advice from our experts, the Chiefs, of the Fire and Emergency Services about pooled resources, uh, the, P the PM might well say, I'll have a separate offline discussion with the Premiers of New South Wales and Victoria about maybe some border issues, about you know, if the fire gets into the snowies, for instance, how we might work together. And we would get a series of directions that would come out of the National Cabinet, as actual decisions of the National Cabinet. I would then envisage that DGEMA would broker, coordinate, facilitate the implementation of those decisions. And where it's been decided, just much like COVID, that a matter was purely within the remit, competence and reach of a jurisdiction, there'd be more of a watching brief. But where it was either cross-boundary, cross-jurisdictional, or required the pooling of resources, let's say we were short on bombers, I've got no doubt in that construct, DGMA would then be tasked to solve that problem. Uh, and would either go and source uh, those assets, obviously working... I mean, currently we have the AFAC and we have the uh, the synchronisation and concurrency mechanism that's set up under the AFAC. We're going to need to think about how a not-for-profit body works within the sort of governance arrangement that I've just sketched out. But that's as best as I can do with the time machine that uh, you've afforded me with your question. No, I appreciate that. Uh, and, and, I, and it was good just to bring it all together into a, into a context that uh, I think people can recognise. So I, I appreciate that very much. I'll go to Commissioner Bennett. For a uh, question. Thank you, thank you. And Mr Pizzola, I just want to clarify one aspect of the matters that you just discussed with the Chair. Um, we heard from um, Professor Murphy about how this worked from his perspective and he, he very conveniently said you collapse five layers of bureaucracy and one of the things that he, um, you know, he described was you actually go out to your uh, that the person who's going to present to National Cabinet goes out to the other interested jurisdictions and synthesises a collaborative view and then comes to National Cabinet with both the uh, consensus view and if there's not a full consensus with a dissenting view if that's a strongly held one. So I take it that that's the sort of thing that you're thinking about. Um, or, but I, I, it also sounds as if what you're saying is there would need to be a series of Professor Murphys um, both from um, preparation and perhaps operational roles, depending upon the state of the emergency and, and the actual questions being asked, not a single person who could um, do all that. Is that correct? Uh, Commissioner, that is correct. So to give you two very quick examples, um, Professor Murphy is a dear colleague of mine has become increasingly so over the last six months. There's only one of him, but his particular expertise, and Brendan, uh, Professor Murphy would be the first to say, I have particular sectoral uh, expertise in my domain, which is the public health domain, and my vector is, to use the language that I've been using through these, uh, through these comments, is pandemic. Um, Professor Murphy would, would defer to and would yield to the head of our cyber agency to say, if Australia had received a massive cyber attack, yes, there might be some health consequences of that, and I've got to be party to that, but the National Cabinet would want to hear from the head of cyber about um, what is, this, if it was a preparatory meeting, what is the risk? If it was an, if it was an incident, incident meeting, okay, what's going on? How bad is the attack? Can you break it? And then they might then want to hear from the head of EMA about dealing with the sectoral consequences. The one, um, and I'll conclude on this, uh, Commissioner, the, the one common note is probably EMA regarding sectors because there's no point replicating that national coordination mechanism because if food supply is not getting into supermarkets for one reason, then it doesn't matter that they're not getting in for another reason. It's still the, the, the challenge is how do you get food into supermarkets? So that's the one common node and then depending on the risk that's materialised through a vector, you then bolt on the Professor Murphy equivalent, and I'm happy to use that shorthand as well, for each of those vectors 
depending on what the nature of the risk that's hit you is. Thank you. I should just make it clear, as we would say in our parlance, Prof Professor Murphy, as he then was, as the CMO, <laughs> rather than Professor Murphy. I've just, uh, but uh, I've got two other very short it's questions. Uh, uh, you do. We, there was some some discussion about your paragraph nine and questions of of assurance. Do you see a role, and I'm not uh, a fu functionally rather than at the moment with how it's instigated, for a an IGEM? Or an Inspector General, of, of an IGEM, an Inspector General for Emergency Management? Um, not, uh, not directly in so far as in, if, if you take emergency management not to be synonymous with fire and emergency services, where well, I know those services quite properly like police and customs have Inspectors General, if you take the EM function in the way that I've been describing it, which is really about command, control, communication, situational awareness, um, the discipline around common operating pictures, the ability to support the National Cabinet in the way that I've been describing, I'm not convinced that you need an Inspector General for that profession or that professional discipline beyond the integrity measures. And we in here, here in Home Affairs are under a single integrity and corruption framework in any event because of the sensitive materials that we handle. I'm not sure that you'd need an Inspector General for that function. Whether you need an Inspector General for fire, emergency services, counter-terrorism, policing, is really a matter of those functions and the statutory constructions that sit around those functions. If, if that, and I'm sorry if that's a little bit unclear. No, 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 it is quite clear. I mean, it was, there was also a possibility perhaps an Inspector General to deal with, it, it wouldn't need to be an Inspector General, perhaps um, assurances vis-a-vis -vis recovery. I mean, that's a different, but that's a slightly different angle to it, um, the way the recovery services operate. But I'll, I'll leave it at that. I've got one more question for you, and I think um, another matter is the question of stockpiles for natural disasters. Do you have a view on um, the need for or the advisability of either a broad or narrow... I mean, fire retardant's an example that's been used so far as, um, you know, fires are concerned because that's imported and, you know, there are transport issues and, of course, supply issues with that. Do you have any view on the question of the uh, advisability of developing um, a stock, some sort of stockpiling in that for, to deal with that sort of um, problem? I, I do, Commissioner, and if, if I could just very briefly uh, emphasise, just very quickly going back to my last answer, in, in dismembering or disentangling emergency management from foreign emergency services, I mean absolutely no disrespect to the terrific work that's done by and the deep expertise that's contained in the foreign emergency services world, but nothing but the most uh, you know, sincere admiration for, for them. In saying that the functions have become collapsed, that's really around governance, accountability, and trying to differentiate the functions rather than in any way suggesting any disrespect to uh, the wonderful uh, uh, professionals in that world and the volunteers who, who do so much. No, and, and we didn't take it that way. No. We, we took it that you're talking about at the national level in uh, in these sorts yes. of areas. Yes. yes. No. Yeah. But thank you for clarifying that. And, We've been hearing. Question. We've also heard a lot of evidence about the amazing work that they have done and the and the ways in which they operate. So, uh, thank you for that clarification. But back to stockpiles. <laughs> On stockpiles, uh, uh, Commissioner, I have a very strong personal view, uh, and I very much concur with the evidence given to you by Professor or Dr. Holton. Sorry, Miss Holton, I should say. Just uh, got, to, got to remember what her, um, her title is. Um, I, look, I strongly uh, support Miss Holton. Um, I think whether um, off the back of bushfires we needed to confront this question, that's almost mute. Given COVID, um, the world's going into very deep recession, if not worse. Global supply chains, the distribution of manufacturing, when you combine that with the changing profile of both disaster and climate risk, um, the benefits that we get from interconnectivity, but the risks that that is placed on us by things like cyber attacks on highly connected systems, I think whether off um, in response to your recommendations, whether in, in response to similar recommendations that are likely to come from the National COVID Commission that I mentioned earlier in response to Council's questions, because I know this is on their mind as well, um, and whether it's sector specific, so leave, save the medical stockpile that's particular to health, uh, whether it's about 
retardants, uh, UAVs, uh, sensors for uh, dealing with fires, the retardants that were mentioned, hand sanitizers. I'll leave toilet paper to one side. That's been uh, Every, overdone. In, everyone's in trying to leave toilet paper to one side. Um, I, I think the nation, uh, and look, this is not a function of bushfires per se. It's a function of the dramatic disruption that now the world economy is going to go through, where supply chains will take a long time to recover. Uh, what the impacts on global manufacturing are likely to be, I think, still remains to be seen. So, independently of bushfires, I think COVID has created a circumstance where we need to seriously think about both domestic manufacturing in limited and targeted ways, sovereign capability, and yes, stockpiles for those geostrategic and geoeconomic reasons. So the answer is yes. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Basulo. Commissioner McIntosh. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Basulo. Um, uh, I fully understand the logic of why Home Affairs was created, the idea of bringing together multiple functions within the one department. Um, we've heard during the course of our inquiry some counter views that, that EMA has effectively been lost in a, in a mega department, and I wonder whether you might comment on that. It's just simply wrong. <laughs> that's, a, that's a simple response. Um, my next question then is well, about... Sorry, I, I should look. I'll, I'll add to it only because Mr. Cameron's dealt with the facts. Uh, I'm on all the encrypted communications where the, I see the traffic involving the PM because, as you can imagine, the Prime Minister would expect me to be aware. He tasks directly, he gets information directly. We're a very flat, to use management speak, we're a very flat networked team. In fact, I have people, as we are speaking, Commissioner, at the moment, working with the Prime Minister's office and with. Uh, Prime Minister's Department and with the Victorian Government to work through some issues around supermarkets and the, and the delivery of goods. It doesn't go through me. I'm not a bottleneck. My headquarters is not a bottleneck. And, and I reject it from well-meaning people who just simply are not seized of the facts. Thank you very much for that. Um, my next question is about Comdis plan along the similar lines. We're, we've heard that there were some inefficiencies in, in the processes for making requests for Commonwealth assistance during the fire season. And, and I just wondered whether you had views or insights on whether you would firstly sort of agree with that and whether there's any steps being taken or thought being given to, to how those inefficiencies might be ironed out. The, um, uh Perhaps the lead to my uh, answer might have been discernible from what I said to Council earlier. Um, in these circumstances, which I, I know it's a hackneyed phrase, are unprecedented, uh, doctrine is only ever going to be a starting point. Regrettably, uh, in bureaucracies, and I, I use that as a universal term, I don't specify any particular bureaucracy, and I'm using it in almost in the sociological terms as, as Max Weber or someone would have described it. Uh, middle ranking and even quite senior officers prefer doctrine because steps are set out and that's good for normal business. <coughs> Leadership is about disrupting doctrine and then catching doctrine up later. So when it became apparent through the course of December and into January for reasons that Mr Cameron has put before this commission that in a sense we have to throw the rule book out and start to anticipate requests including uh, and I think Council uh, took uh, some witnesses through the exact letter of uh, the doctrine that you have to have exhausted all other possibilities. When something's burning or when you're the subject of a global pandemic or when you're the subject of another catastrophe, human or natural, um, the last thing you should rely on is a rigid rule book that has lost all contact with the enemy. So the better course is to take charge of the situation, put in place modified arrangements, which uh, which Mr Cameron did with the not only the uh, strong blessing of his departmental leadership, but at the direct at the direction of our more importantly democratically elected political leaders, uh, and that also included the joint teams that went in from the ADF to start to scope out the needs and that shift in posture, as you know, Commissioner. I gather from the evidence that occurred on the 1st of January. As I said to Council earlier, we will now write that into doctrine. Doctrine can only ever be a theoretical construct that is taught at staff colleges, and it's very important because the extent that it can cover 90% of reality has done a really good job. The problem is it doesn't count. It doesn't cover that 10% of reality that really hits you in the face hard. 
Yeah. Thank you, and um, thank you, Chair. I have no further questions. Thank you, Secretary Pizzullo. I know you're a very busy person, so uh, we're finished with our questions. I'll just go back to Ms Hogan Dora. Anything from Nothing parties? Nothing from parties with leave. Um, could um, Mr Pizzullo, Secretary Pizzullo, be released from his summons? Thank you. Secretary Pizzullo, you can be released from your summons. We appreciate the, the insight that you've given us. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next witness is slated for 2.30. Okay, we will take an adjournment until 2.30, uh, Canberra time. Thank you. All rise. Commission has adjourned until 2.30 p.m.
Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Ms. Hogan Doran. Uh, yes, uh, Commissioner. Um, the next witness is Mr. Philip Gaitchens, uh, who is the uh, Secretary of the Department of Premier Prime Minister and Cabinet. I call uh, Philip Gaitchens. Secretary Gaitchens, good to see you. Thank you for taking time out. I know what is a very busy schedule. We uh, we appreciate you giving us that uh, that time. We will keep it as short as possible so you can get back to your your day job. But once again, thank you. Uh, Secretary Gaitchens will take an affirmation. Mr Make Gaitchens, it. do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Secretary Gaitchens, have you prepared a statement dated 3 August 2020 and do you have that with you? Uh, I do, Council. And are the contents of that statement true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? Uh, correct. All right. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. Just for the assistance of the commissioners, um, could you describe to them the, um, the role and function of, that you have as Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet? Uh, Council, as Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, uh, I consider myself to have several hats on. One is, if you like, Chief Policy Advisor to the Prime Minister. Uh, I am the Head of the Public Service. Um, I am the CEO of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and also the head of the portfolio for the other agencies that exist in the portfolio other than the department. Um, and we work uh, in a collaborative fashion with other departments. Again, we support the Prime Minister in his capacity as the chair, chairman of Cabinet. Uh, so our job is not only to look at the running of Cabinet uh, and the involvement of Ministers within it, but also to provide the Chair with a uh, briefing strategy that helps him run the meeting very well. So it's a, it's a, a wide job, but one that's uh, very enjoyable and it involves um, doing things that allow me to give you evidence like today and, for example, uh, I'm able to tell you about um, National Cabinet, for example. What background did you bring to the role? Uh, I am now, I think, into my 40-something or other, more than 40 years in the public service. Um, so I have spent um, most of that time in Canberra, uh, but starting off uh, in, in the Bureau of Transport Economics, actually, as a graduate, uh, I came up through line agencies in 1990s. I was in the Department of Prime Minister cabinet earlier, actually. Um, then went to South Australia to work in its Treasury and Finance Department. Uh, came back, I was Chief of Staff to a former Treasurer. Um, then spent a couple of months in Treasury, spent two and a half years at APEC uh, as a diplomat helping the Secretariat uh, run that body. I was then uh, working in the, as Secretary of the New South Wales Department of Treasury in 2011 to 2015. Uh, then came back to Canberra after four years of commuting. Um, became the current Prime Minister's Chief of Staff when he was Treasurer. Uh, and then in August 2018 was Head of the Federal Department of Treasury and since September last year, head of this department. You've had um, quite a year in that role with the COVID-19 um, global pandemic. As head of the public service, how, in your opinion, has the public service responded to this um, incredible challenge? Uh, in my judgment, I think it's done um, a great job keeping services going, uh, and, and it has, I think, done a great job in a couple of ways. One is to look, uh, each individual, I think, with guidance from departments, has taken a very um, good attitude to looking after themselves, 
uh, and their families so that they can continue to be in service. So I think there has been a focus on overall wellbeing. Uh, within that, I think there's also been a focus and a much greater focus than I've seen previously in terms of helping each other to uh, help out uh, including redeployment within agencies and redeployment across agencies. Uh, for example, through work the Public Service Commission did, there were more than 2,000 public servants redeployed to Services Australia to help for the um, large increase in people seeking uh, welfare support. Um, we have helped staff um, the bespoke functions and, and uh, purposes within departments, uh, the National Incident Room, which is a very important crisis response role that's taken place in the Department of Health, has been staffed by people other than in that department uh, who have been able to bring in their own skills uh, to help uh, them. So I, I think it's been a, an individual effort, it's been a collective effort uh, vertically and horizontally. I think the secretaries as a group uh, have met very frequently as a secretary's board uh, these days, remotely of course. Uh, and I think another plus uh, that came into this was the formation informally late last year of what we call the um, uh, Chief Operating Officer Committee so that we have Chief Operating Officers within departments, not just performing their own role to fulfil the operational requirements of their departments, but to take a horizontal role across the public service. The secretaries as a group um, have really come to the realisation that we want to run the public service as an APS enterprise so that we are not only acting as individual departments, but we are acting as subsidiaries of an overall group, if you like. And I think that approach is making us think and act a lot more to help each other and to use the scale and scope of the public service to do things better. Um, it, it, it may it may be self-evident, but do you think that the experience of um, the public service um, responding uh, by both through surge and taking on different roles and being both dynamic and flexible about it, um, places Australia in a in a better position were it to face other natural disasters or catastrophes? I think every learning uh, and experience we can take adds to the benefits for future possible events. Uh, so I think one thing that helped us in response to COVID-19 was in fact what happened in the bushfires. Uh, where there are, um, again, responses within levels of government to provide support and resources where those resources are needed. Um, and, and I think those exercises and, and real events, not just exercises, but um, provide ongoing examples of where we must and have acted, um, how that action works, how it could be improved, uh, and that can then lead in to the handling and management of future events. Um, I have a, a couple of questions which I might be, you may be assisted in the commissioners as well if I have uh, shown paragraph 17 of your, of your statement. Um, We've touched on one already, which is the um, the public service response to the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic and how that might inform a national approach uh, for the future. Um, one of the matters that uh, we heard some evidence of just a moment a moment ago from uh, Secretary Pizzullo was that he and you have uh, joined uh, the National COVID Coordination Coordination Commission. Uh, so um, I'd just like to get some sense from you, if I may, to understand how that um, uh, economic, social policy, government response uh, has, uh, how, how has that um, performed in your view and what um, uh, lesson is there from that for a future national disaster response? Uh, Council, I think the national... COVID Coordination Commission, now called the National COVID Commission, uh, and, and the board has recently been added to uh, with the breadth of their experience uh, broadened 
Um, the Commission was set up, I think, to actually provide to the Prime Minister the ability to connect directly with a group of uh, business people who had actually willingly given up their time uh, to contribute. And it provided them to do two things. One, I think, was to use their networks to provide practical advice. Uh, for example, we have people like Paul Little who's been very much involved in logistics uh, and freight. So we've got people with real hands-on experience that can provide us with, again, a hands-on and a practical approach to how to solve things. Uh, in an experience like COVID and, in fact, um, I would relate the same thing to the bushfires in disaster. You, you need to actually transport people to where the event is happening. You need to get people in and out. You need to get goods in and out. Uh, and, and people who actually do this for a living can actually provide governments with very useful advice uh, about that. And what they do is then add and supplement to the advice that the public service uh, provides as well uh, this is not to say one is better than the other and one should replace each other, but they are in fact complementary and they add to each other. Um, and you can speak to some very, some people with very sharp knowledge and practice and experience uh, that can actually relate an event or a circumstance to something that they've handled before. Um, the end... Uh, well, the Coordination Commission uh, was involved with the um, handling the outbreak in the, uh, I think it was the Coles Laverton Distribution Centre, and, and people actually had knowledge of how those things work. Um, so it, it provides another avenue, not only for direct advice to the Prime Minister, but for the Prime Minister to use the Commission to go out to use their own networks and experience to help solve a problem. Uh, now, what I think the, the advisory board's been tasked to do now and why it's expanded is, is to go a bit more into recovery mode mm -hmm. uh, because, yes, we have Victoria going through a situation at the moment, but the rest of Australia needs to keep on continuing with the recovery. Uh, so that that's part of the reason, and I think it, it, it's worked very, very well, and the Prime Minister, I know, has appreciated the input he's received from those people. Um, it sounds like what has been constructed is a is a holistic, not just whole of government, but a whole of society approach to informing the situational awareness and thus the, the improving the decision making to respond to the pandemic. Is that a, a fair assessment of, of what has occurred? Uh, I think that's correct, Council, and I, and I, I, I wouldn't. So I would not just say it's the COVID Commission, um, well, not just the COVID Commission, but the whole society is constructed by the aggregate impact of many parts. And I think so the public service can provide the work with the policy stuff they do. Ministers, I think, again, are widely connected within the community. They can bring community perspectives as well as official advice that they receive from their departments. Uh, to actually bring in business people that have lots of experience in particular areas also helps for direct advice and the Prime Minister can use them as a, as a sounding board and, a, and, a, and to bounce off ideas, issues. Um, so I, I think through the aggregate combination of policy, business experience, um, operational responses and using the architecture that already exists within government uh, both within levels of government and between levels of government. The combination of those things like, does add up to, again, not just a public service response, but a, a response that takes into account community, business, other views. We heard uh, earlier this morning uh, some evidence from uh, Mr Mark Crossweller, who's the former Director-General of EMA and was head of the National uh, Resilience Task Force about involvement of the private sector in the implementation of the natural disaster risk reduction framework. Is there, is there, do you think, in light of the experience of COVID, um, a, an appetite for establishing a dialogue with the private sector as a, as in a sense, in partnership to help implement to ensure the implementation of that framework. Uh, the answer is yes, and I think for several reasons. 
One is, um, I think in events like bushfires and COVID-19, Australians do want to help each other. Uh, there is support, again, using some of the supply chain issues and that Coles Lavin one, other competing um, uh, businesses were helping um, to, to say, if, we, if you, that centre doesn't work, we can do things ourselves or we can change operations interstate to actually help states that are, are in trouble. So there is a willingness to support and I, and I think that can be used uh, to be of great value. Uh, and it also means that in some areas, private sector involvement can in fact address real issues at the point of contention rather than doing it um, arm's length away through, through government. Uh, so I think there should be um, a continuous link, if you like, between government and the private sector. Secondly, um, in the COVID space, for example, uh, private hospitals uh, have helped. And, and the reason for that is that, uh, and one of the reasons for, for example, the um, a cancellation of elective surgery at some times is to actually then allow the private hospital space to be available should that be required. So at the moment in Victoria, there has been the movement of patients from aged care homes into private hospitals. So that, that has helped the process. Uh, so I, I think there is both a willingness and an extension of the capability that the whole of Australia can provide through um, deep connections and involvement and collaboration with the private sector. You uh, foreshadowed earlier in terms of the important role that National Cabinet, the creation of National Cabinet has had in the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic. Could we go to paragraph 10 of Mr Gaitchen's statement? It's on page two of your statement. Uh, Mr Gaitchen, that's going to be uh, zoomed into on the screen if that's of assistance to you. Um, uh, uh, the, the matters that you identify there uh, the shared sense of purpose, the frequency of the meetings, their confidential nature, their direct tasking and access to expert advice and their flexibility has um, contributed to the effective uh, coordinated national decision making by that body. Um, just one aspect that, it, that, that, that doesn't address, and I just want to get a sense from you as a preliminary step, is um, what have the what have there been the factors or, or inputs that have enabled there to be um, appropriate and adequate situational awareness that is insights into what is happening so that those decisions can then be made? Uh, a couple of things, Council. Uh, in, in terms of the again for a national event uh, like COVID, the the situation situational awareness. Um, in terms of the health aspects, and this is what National Cab has been focusing on mainly, there is the expert advice from AHPPC, which involves chief health officers from each state, so they know through the networks and the public health units in each state and territory what is happening in their jurisdiction. Um, by having the premiers and chief ministers there they not only take into account that advice, but all the other advices so that they receive, yes. either, either from their ministers or from their health departments. Um, other departments with respect to, yes, the object or subject of the matter is health, but the impacts of the health situation uh, uh, transfer out to many, many areas of society, so they get that feedback loop. Uh, in terms of cause of problem versus impact of problem and how to handle it. Um, they were able, uh, in terms of situational awareness then, by being able to meet together and have expert advice, they could compare and contrast what was happening in their own jurisdiction to others, which allowed, if you like, a pretty quick, comparison uh, of what they were doing, what others were doing, and if there was a difference, why that difference occurred. And that could obviously be explained by either different case numbers or the geography and context of, of their own jurisdiction. 
Um, so I think they were some of the things that, that came in. And again, if there were any gaps in knowledge that they had, this goes to the direct tasking point. Mm. Uh, the leaders themselves, um, and I emphasise as well, the, the, the leaders don't just have you know, a, a portfolio position, they are the leaders of the jurisdiction. Um, so they take that very high level view. Uh, they, and I th again, I think being leaders, they can themselves assemble priorities uh, that goes to their health and then beyond health matters. And tasking can arise from those meetings directly. Um, and, and another thing I'd say, frankly, was the, I think I made this point to the Senate, the, the transparency of national cabinet outcomes has probably been uh, the most transparent I have seen in the time I've been a public service at state and Commonwealth level uh, of information being made public to the community uh, within hours of that meeting, and that basically happens through the Prime Minister's press conferences after Cabinet and then the Premier's and Chief Minister's press conferences as well. Um, in your observation, how important, um, you've spoken of transparency, how important has the um, confidential nature of the discussions been to facilitating those outcomes? Uh, critical. Um, I think the the, the, the nature of um, the six, um, six states, two territories, uh, the Prime Minister meeting in a room, um, and, and I think they have said this publicly, but the fact that they are in that room, uh, there has been no leaking from that room, there has been no breach of confidentiality to actually then take the confidence of that to know that they can talk on practically anything and it, and it remains in confidence, mm. uh, but it leads to outcomes that occur. And uh, again, I think, um, I think it was Kitchener, wasn't it, who said, you know, you don't necessarily need to look at the sausage making, it's the outcome that matters. Uh, and I think that's, that combined with it's like the confidentiality and the solidarity of discussions in the room um, makes it very important, uh, well, it did make it very important on every occasion, actually, for each of the members of National Cabinet to have confidence in the Prime Minister going out and announcing pretty clearly what happened in those, the outcomes of the discussions in those meetings without going into the detail of those discussions. Could we go to paragraph 11, please, operator? Um, in paragraph 11, uh, Mr Gaitchens, you, uh, you speak to the issue of um, if and when governments are faced with responding to a large-scale natural disaster, particularly those which affect multiple jurisdictions. Um, you say in your opinion that National Cabinet could play a very beneficial role in supporting national leadership and coordinated decision-making. Um, that it's the next proposition that I wanted to ask you some questions about. Direct access to expert advice relevant to the unfolding disaster would be essential. Um, you gave some. You gave uh, the example earlier of the expert medical health, public health advice that has been conveyed to National Cabinet by the Chief Medical Officer, uh, and we heard from Professor uh, Murphy yesterday. Um, uh, one question that has emerged uh, in the course of this, of course, is in when translating that to circumstances which consider um, broader national emergencies involving natural disasters, involving bushfires and or other kinds of natural hazards, um, there's a range of experts that might be available um, to inform National Cabinet. Do you have any thoughts on how that might be? Um, is, is that an impediment? To, um, to adopting uh, that structure for the future of, in national natural disasters or are there ways to streamline that to enable it to nonetheless proceed? Well, I, I don't think it necessarily needs to be an impediment, but care needs to be taken in selecting that the right people are there. Um, so again, I, and I'm no expert in this either, by the way, but, but I am sure that there would be people who would be experts uh, in drought versus experts in floods. 
uh, or, or be experts in infectious diseases versus uh, other diseases. Um, in, in the case of the Australian Health Protection Principles Committee, the AHPPC, um, they in fact are the um, lead group uh, which uh, sorry, who, who are supported, I think, by five other groups who, in fact, look at more focused ideas that come up to AHPPC. And, and as much as you could have an emergency expert committee, I'm sure that beneath that there would be groups who would deal with a particular type of emergency. So I think we just have to be very, very careful about who to select, um, I would take a fair bit of confidence in the fact that Premier's Chief Ministers and the Prime Minister would have a fair idea of who they would want in the room uh, for a particular event. Um, in the case of the AHPPC, there is only one member of that group, and that's the chair of AHPPC who attends the meeting. Mm. Uh, so that, again, is a trust and acceptance that the chair of the group is able to represent the group. Uh, of course, that, that trust is also supported by the fact that I'm sure premiers and chief ministers are being advised by their own chief health officers, so it would become pretty apparent if, if the view in the room was different to, to that being provided uh, to others. So there's a, a reinforcement mechanism there. Uh, so I think as long as you don't um, make the group too narrow, nor in fact too large, uh, and, and that goes back to the point I made in, in paragraph 10 as well, and this is direct access to expert advice that is relevant to the issue. Yes. Um, and I think in the APS and between the, the leaders themselves, it would be a reasonably clear task as to who would be best. Just turning to, just considering the process um, of that briefing by... Um, uh, the expert, uh, do you see advantages in there being essentially one one person speaking, um, ideally on, on a consensus basis, but being the single source of source of truth um, to of way by way of expert advice to the national cabinet to then making its decision making processes, rather than having a, a, a large number or more than one briefing them on the different perspectives. I think that's right, Councillor. As I said, it's the chair of our HPPC who does that. Um, that person is trusted. Uh, obviously, the same arrangement did not apply at um, during the time of the bushfire, but certainly from the Commonwealth's own advice, uh, Director EMA um, was basically the single point of truth who, again, brought into the meeting of um, federal discussions on these issues input from a lot of people and that again could be tasked back to him to get further advice if required but um, and, uh, I think that's that's uh, a good example and I said I think the, the architecture the one, once first ministers know what they want I think the, so that says you have got a pretty clear objective and mission then you can arrange things around that as long as you're clear about those two things in the first place. If this architecture was to be uh, adopted or embraced again for future national uh, natural disasters, um, do you have any insights as to how uh, national cabinet, its 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 lead first ministers, and and even the prime minister um, can can stop from themselves from descending into the detail and and, and ensuring they stay above the tactical level? Uh my opinion would be that would be reasonably uh, easy. I, I don't think, that just from the, on the health issue, I don't think they've tried to get into the tactical issues very much at all. Um, they have uh, looked, and I, I think my recollection of um, ministers and the uh, operational requirements with the bushfire as well, there, there is most times, if this needs to be done operationally, this needs to be done. Do it. It, it, it's, it's, it's the higher level issues where people seek to prioritise. Uh, also to understand why. So I think there are questions 
uh, why something is done, uh, and that goes to again. I think that the more that people at that level seek to understand uh, why that is a learning that can then be stored in uh, memories that make a decision next time easier because they've worked out why. Um, so I, I think uh, that. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think there would be an issue of getting into the weeds, if you like. Um, and I think if the meeting is well chaired as well, there would probably be a hesitation to doing that in the first place. Um, you've. Uh, uh the National Cabinet was stood up essentially in the middle of the response or at the commencement of the response phase and you've um, just addressed your remarks, uh, your evidence to uh, the response phase of a national natural disaster circumstance. If we go to paragraph 24 uh, and the observations that you make, on page 5 it is, um, Mr Gaitchens, uh, your observations you make about um, the advantages or of convening a national cabinet meeting ahead of a disaster season. And I'll just um, have you share with the commissioners your insights as to that. I think I feel as if it's if you want, had that one's time again. Uh, look, in, in terms of national cabinet, um, it was, uh, it, well, it was established in a COAG meeting that had been uh, on people's calendars for quite a long time. So the 13th of March was a Friday. Yes. Um, so just some background, at that stage, uh, at that meeting, there was some advice from the health people that made it pretty obvious, I think, that this was getting more and more serious. So the, the Prime Minister and the Premiers actually did have a short, well, a, a session amongst themselves, and out of that came National Cabinet. Uh, and I'm sure at that meeting they would have, sorry, at the COAG meeting, I'm sure they, they talked about why you would have a National Cabinet and what was actually, um, the, what what was the, uh, what was the possible path uh, going forward. All I was saying in paragraph 24, in fact, was if we have, and particularly in relation to, to bushfires and seasonal related events, mm. I think it would be useful for leaders to meet before the event and, and again, set uh, expectations, hear from the data and the evidence and the forecasts of what sort of season are we expecting. Yes. Um, so, one, they can actually set themselves up with an expectation of forecast and future events, that of course can change drastically. Uh, it, it, it might stay the same, but it gives them an outlook and a starting point. And to then be able to, and, and sometimes it could actually give you a, a, a possible baseline uh, against which you, you compare things. Yes. Uh, and depending on where, I, I, again, I think the action from National Cabinet or other uh, if you have a benign baseline, I think you might act differently than if you had a less benign baseline. So it actually does set a tempo right from the very start of where you could um, handle things. So I think uh, in, a, in a planning sense, that would be good. Uh, and I think I'll do so as my... Uh, any, any meeting that National Cabinet has, of course, is of its, is of its own decision. Um, but I think there are... Uh, uh, benefits that right from the very start there is a knowledge base if you like an understanding of, of what to expect and then you can actually against that baseline compare progress with expectations and adjust them. And, and, and um, establish any coordinating efforts or additional or variations on coordinating efforts going forward, is that right? Yes and commission work uh, again which, which may need to be adjusted through the um, through the process. Yes, thank you, Mr. Gaitchen. Go to paragraph 27, and I'm take, I'm fast forwarding us now uh, through to the sort of after phase, uh, the recovery phase. Um, you make the observation in paragraph 27 that national cabinet could also play a role in coordinating decision making. Uh, 
related to recovery following a natural disaster. Um, you've, of course, already given some evidence uh, in relation to the recovery phase, uh, at least for um, for a number of states and territories in Australia in the COVID-19 pandemic, and we've seen the shift of the National COVID-19 Coordination Commission into an advisory board focused particularly on longer-term recovery issues. Um, uh, I'll just um, uh, step to the side and ask this existing question concerning the role of the National Bushfire Recovery Agency. So there's already been established a recovery agency uh, for the bushfires and we've also had some evidence from Mr. Sh Mr Shane Stone in relation to the recovery agency that he heads um, in North Queensland following its uh, drought and floods. Um, the, I, I wondered whether um, the uh, what your view was in relation to uh, the recovery agency becoming a standing agency um, rather than standing one up after each each disaster, um, particularly in circumstances where, as the evidence has indicated to this commission, the recovery is a long process. It's a long-term process. It's not something that's confined to six to twelve to eighteen months. Um, Council, I think. I think that's a very empirical question, actually, because the, the you, if you had, let's say, five or six years in, with benign circumstances, then then you, you have an agency that um, might not have much to do. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the, the reason I mentioned that is not, not just the efficiency aspect, but in fact... One of the things in the NBRA and indeed the, um, uh, the, the COVID events is, is well, the National Cabinet, if, if you have a, a recovery agency that deals with ongoing recovery, there, again, you get that sense of purpose and mission. I see. This is, this is your job. And I, and I think if, if you actually, because of circumstances not under our control, you, you don't have that purpose or, or mission because of events, uh, that, that can actually have an effect on uh, morale and, and, and attitude at the start. Um, I think if a, recovery, if a recovery agency applied to um, disasters, no matter what the cause, uh, that might not be as much of an issue. Uh, and I also think you've got a transition, if you like, from an event where there will be a sense of purpose and a cause in response to a particular event as to what can then happen to policy roles in general and what we need to do for an economy. Again, we've, we've got an economy, and again, the forecast is, I think, about a 7% um, uh, fall in GDP uh, in the June quarter. You know, the, the whole of the country will need to have the sense of purpose and mission to actually recover out of that, mm. uh, that, that hole. Um, but I think as, as, as long as you can sustain uh, a purpose, I think you can have a single agency that will do very good work uh, and, in fact, it will benefit and become like the leading edge of the rest uh, of public services and other things to actually focus their effort on re the recovery, recovery from that event. Um, I, I think... However, and again, you can see from that paragraph there, the National Cabinet, in fact, moved to recovery in May when, uh, in the expectation that things were going to get better, let's, let's work out a plan to get out and to start a path to recovery and then move on from there. Uh, so I think, and, and, and the empiricism and, and the, my reluctance to provide a firm answer is that if you set something up and then circumstances apart from the reason you set it up for, what what will be the effectiveness? And, and again, I, I, I repeat, this is not just an efficiency argument, it's an effectiveness argument. So, um, it, but so it, it sounds from what you've just said that um, it, it, you wouldn't recommend or, uh, that, for example, the MBRA be um, folded into a broader national recovery agency. Is that what you're saying, or are you saying that at least its component should continue on uh, with its central mission? 
Uh, no, I think I'm so well. That, I think it could be folded into a to a wider agency. I think what I'm probably more directly saying is, I think you would need to set it up in a way that says, a, oh, sorry, a very um, scalable and adjustable focus, so that there could be a standing uh, number of people in terms of reference to that commission, which, depending on actual events happening and that needing to scale up and then back again. So it, it, it would need to be a lot of thought given, I think, to the, the nature of its setup and not being seen to be an agency of X people uh, and that's then written in stone forever and ever. So it's just flexibility, I think, and, and knowing what it could do, but a scalability, I think, would be definitely required. Right. We go to paragraph 28. 28, um, you've, you've broadened uh, your view to a national cabinet playing a role in building national resilience. Um, there's some overlap between recovery, building back better, and thus establishing greater resilience. But I, I think when you speak here, because you've referred to the National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework, you're speaking of resilience in a much, much, more, in much broader sense. Is that right? Correct. Um, in terms of uh, this role, how, how would you see this role operating for National Cabinet? Um, it seems to be one that would, uh, seems to be more policy driven as opposed to reacting to the circumstances that uh, are, um, are confronting it and seems to be hark more back to um, the way in which COAG had been established uh, and operating in, in times past. Is that right? Uh uh, it would not be right in that outlook because National Cabinet does not want to go back to the way COAG works. <laughs> uh, but it, I, I think what you can imagine here is, and I, I'd go back to the, to the framework of National Cabinet, as well as National Cabinet, um, there has been formed the National Federation. Um, Reform Council. Council, I think. Uh, is it, so that, that's the group that actually includes local government. Uh, it's probably going to meet once a year. I see. And, and I think if you looked at resilience, which is a saver, it could involve local governments, the private sector and communities. It, it could just be a check-in, um, so not, not in terms of constant meeting to check out progress on what's happening in an event, but as this is a greater process, I could, in fact, uh, use a comparison of closing the gap. So closing the gap is still intended to be considered by that committee in terms of progress. I see. So in terms of the risk reduction framework, this, and again, if National Cabinet decided it was necessary, because I think they are also going to be quite disciplined about what they take on and what they don't, just to keep that sense of purpose, um, it would then go from... Uh, an update or a check-in to see how things are going and if things go up, are, are off track, then again, um, review, make decisions, pass back out to get things going. So it, it's a case of uh, how frequent and, and what it would do uh, rather than actually manage an ongoing event where things are changing very quickly. Um, the last topic I want to uh, take uh, you to, and I'm mindful of the time, and the commissioners will, of course, have their own questions. Um, you were asked some questions, uh, question four and five, so question four in your statement on paragraph, on page six and seven, uh, as to what role could National Cabinet play in the making of a declaration of a state of national emergency, uh, and what might be the consequences of a making of that declaration? Um, if I could go down to your answer at paragraph 36 over to um, uh, the next page as to how you saw National Cabinet um, involvement in the making of any declaration and what it, how that might then operate. Uh, Council, I think if I could go back, oh, sorry, also refer to paragraph 37. I think if a national emergency yeah. declaration was made, that would be the decision of the Commonwealth. And I think uh, throughout national cabinet, uh, it's been quite clear and, and often expressly um, uh, considered about 
what is a decision of National Cabinet versus National Cabinet being informed of a decision by either a state cabinet or, or the federal cabinet. Uh, and, and there's an acceptance of that. I mean, they all, they all operate in that space and, and know how to work. But again, I think what National Cabinet can do is to look at, uh, again, if, if there were triggers on which a declaration would be made, there could be discussion about that. And I think it's very useful to have a, a, a discussion and that can be taken into account when the Commonwealth makes its decision uh, about these things. So in, in that event, it would not be um, a, a, a discussion about the Commonwealth doing something. It would be a discussion that provides an understanding in National Cabinet about on what basis the Commonwealth uh, would act. Uh, and I think that, that again, helps things because people understand uh, the likely consequences or, or, sorry, the likely circumstances in which in, in which this would happen. Um, I also think in paragraph 36 as well, it, it's um, in terms of what, what would be the purposes of that declaration and what would be the implications of it. Um, and that goes into the advice that EMA at the Commonwealth level might have from its interactions so that go into the into the making of that declaration itself. Um, you speak in uh, the subparagraphs of 36 uh, about mobilising EM that the that the consequence of the um, uh, the declaration t being to augment rather than usurp the roles and responsibilities of the states and territories, the, the, the consequences it therefore follows that you've emphasised are mobilising um, EMA, mobilising the Commonwealth's resources. Um, and then you speak at paragraph 36.3 to a unifying mechanism for the Commonwealth and states and territories to come together and take collective stock of the resources at hand. I just wanted to get a sense, is that is that reference to National Cabinet or is that reference to the National Coordination Mechanism, which I asked some questions of Mr Bazzullo and that what had previously been the National Crisis Committee? Um, I think it would be the NCM. Just, yes. Just, yeah, so I think what we are saying here is if the, if the National Emergency Declaration happened, I think if that, that would not overtake what actually happens in operational levels at the moment. It would just be another another mechanism to say, well, the circumstances have got, and again, there, I think there is in a general um, nature at the moment, it, it's, it's the uh, request and respond issue where a state makes its own decision. Um, and, and I think that is an area where, uh, and the Prime Minister has, has spoken about this, is uh, what the Commonwealth did on the last five seasons was actually by pre-positioning thing, testing that limit, but it's only in the nature of being able to react and respond more quickly uh, and, and be able to do that um, more readily. If, if I think you have an understanding uh, of the circumstances in which a national declaration would be made, you then have a sense of what mechanisms, operational uh, resource placement and it will occur and I think underneath a declaration you then get what I would regard as a unifying mechanism that actually says well, what are our priorities, what are the issues and the NCM I think has proven to be a good mechanism in the COVID experience of getting uh, the views of states, local governments, private sector uh, to actually, all right, well, this is what we need, how can we best then um, uh, meet the mission that the actual emergency declaration uh, commences. Um, and the last matter is uh, 36.4, you refer to for crises of national scale affecting multiple states and territories, uh, the declaration could initiate certain Commonwealth outreach for international support from one collective source rather than having multiple states and territories reach out independently to international governments or bodies seeking access to the same resources. Is that is that um, is, is that reflecting any past experience um, of there being more than one voice reaching out uh, for international support in circumstances of natural disasters of which you're aware? 
Not directly, Council. All that I was trying to envisage is, at, at, and again, at, at, at the global level, and I, again, I appreciate, I think, between state fire agencies and, for example, US state fire agencies, I think there's a very good relationship. Yes. I'm not seeking to um, be critical of that in, in any way, but at, at another level as well, at a global level, there is a very quick and easy recognition between sovereign governments. Um, and, and for some instances, I think for, for sub-sovereigns to deal with sovereigns, uh, it can cause delays just because of lack of knowledge and things like that. Uh, if, it, if it would help, I think it, it's very useful for, in fact, because uh, it, it, it's the Prime Minister who speaks with leaders of other countries, yes. uh, that can actually be used to good effect um, uh, to help these things. So it, it's really just again, an efficiency and effectiveness argument rather than for seeking to see any uh, actual problem. Uh, but it's just something that adds to the, adds to the mix and, and hopefully makes things, again, much quicker. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr Gations, for that clarification. Uh, I note the time, uh, Commissioners. I'm going to um, pass it back to them. Thank you, Mr Gations. Thank you, Mr Gations. Um, you gave us a very concise statement and uh, and actually, as you went through that, that's answered my questions. But I'll go to Commissioner Bennett. Thanks, Chair. Mr Gages, I just have one uh, matter. Can paragraph 29 come up, please? Thank you. Uh, you talked there about National Cabinet could focus on supplementing rather than supplanting operational level coordination mechanisms. And then you say, I emphasise here the importance of subsidiarity. And then you say, a policy construct under which roles are delegated to the lowest level of government possible in order for the response on the ground to best meet the needs of the community. Now, we've, as you would appreciate, we've heard a lot of evidence about the um, of the importance of community-led action both at, at every stage, um, preparation, response and, and recovery. And I just wanted you to expand on, 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 on that for me in the context of um, the concept I understand, but how in practice um, is there such a delegation? And I think using an example of things like recovery um, you know, the, uh, the Commonwealth has provided a, a lot of money and, and resources into the recovery space. And how do you then uh, practically, A, get that down to the lowest level of government, and B, how do you um, get assurance as to how the, um, the, that level of government is responding and utilising the resources that are being transmitted? Does, do you understand the question, the question I'm asking? I think I do, Commissioner, and it's uh, um, it, it's an issue that comes up in federations quite often. Um, but I think in, in terms of, of subsidiarity, the, the best example, and I, I think the best example is probably in response uh, rather than recovery, and that is what's the response to a bushfire? It, it, it's the local brigade that actually is the first responder. If, if they have to be supportive by others, then you bring in others, and, and then there's a, there's a centralised coordination mechanism um, in, in state agencies and so that, that's the subsidiarity of a, of a local response first because they know what's on the ground and then the state coordination mechanism above it also knows at the, at the wider level. Yes, that, that, that's an easy example, if I might say so, and, and, a, and a good example, yeah. but um, recovery is the harder example. And, um, we, yeah. you know, the, the, that, that's why I'm asking, that's why I'm focused. I mean, I understand that concept at response level, but focusing on recovery, and one of the things I'm looking at, because we know that there are inspectors general in, the, in some of the states that look at assurance, questions to, um, I mean, the question at one stage was, is that audit? But I mean, it, it isn't, it's, you know, it's broader than that. So I'm just trying to work out um, how the policy construct works when, uh, let's just put hypothetically, the, um, the National Cabinet decides and the Commonwealth funds a very large recovery program to be implemented by local governments throughout the country or the affected areas for a particular national disaster. And I, A, how do you know, I suppose you have to rely, you rely upon the states to ensure, I suppose, that the 
um, the monies are so delegated. But how do you? Tra I mean, how does? Is there is there a role for the Commonwealth, being in mind it's, it's providing the funding, to track that going down and and assuring itself that it's having the desired effect at local government level and that the monies are going... I'm not suggesting anyone rip them off. I'm just saying that, you know, the monies are actually being utilised effectively at that level and doing what they're meant, they're meant to do. I suppose, I mean, you've got the... You might have a national recovery agency that might have people in there. I'm just, you know, to, that, that actually have um, people uh, seconded or... Um, what's the word I want? Put in into the... Hmm? Seconded. will do. Into, into a, um, some sort of a state monitoring system. I just want to get a feel from you as to how that uh, how that works as a matter of policy and practice. Uh, a, a couple of levels, Commissioner. I think um, the principles of subsidiarity, I think, apply in recovery very easily through, through the financial transfers that occur. So, again, for an event that is small in nature... And again, DRFA has actually worked on this base. The first responder is the state, so they do the immediate income support. Uh, if you if if you had large events, let's say COVID, um, and the economic response is unemployment goes up, then in fact the Commonwealth pays unemployment benefits, so the financial burden of that goes up to the Commonwealth level of government. Um, in the health aspects. There are increased calls on hospitals. Uh, again, the Commonwealth State Agreement on the Hospitals Agreement basically says the Commonwealth and the state share uh, the um, uh, they, they share and take risks with respect to growth. And the Commonwealth acts in a lot of cases, I think, as a bit of a reinsurer, if you like, or second second level support mechanism for that. Um, and in, in terms of looking at whether the money's delivered correctly or not, I think there is quite a, uh, a bevy of Commonwealth state arrangements which quite often have KPIs or requirements to be done. Uh, at, at the state level, in fact, and at the Commonwealth level, both can be audited in terms of did they actually do what their, what their job was. Uh, treasuries and the uh, state treasuries, the Council of Federal Financial Relations, uh, and the, the portfolio ministries actually look into how these agreements are tracking in terms of are you doing what you were asked to do. Uh, some agreements, for example, and there's one of note at the moment, the skills agreement. In fact, what the Commonwealth payment, there is one and a half billion to the states and that is untied. So, in fact, the states don't have to spend that money on schools, but that is the arrangement that, that was started. So I think there are... A range of accountability mechanisms within uh, the wider sphere of Commonwealth state relations. Um, we provide uh, assistance to local government as well through the states because the local government are a, a creature of uh, state constitutions, not our, not our own. Um, but, and, and again, sometimes the Commonwealth can provide money direct to schools, a mechanism called the paying money through the states, not to the states, so it goes to the state but then is immediately passed on to private school operators. Um, so I, I think that the concept is there, and, and it, again, I just think it, it's a focus that National Cabinet realises as well in, in the health response. Again, public health units are state units. They're not Commonwealth units. They are actually, they have people on the ground, they have, have the work being done uh, to recognise what's there and then what, how the response has to happen. So I'm, I'm not arguing that anything needs to change in this. I would acknowledge, however, Commissioner, that one of the aspects that plays into this is, and, and I think I detected this more from community views than government views, is I think there is a view sometimes that the public expectation is the Commonwealth gets involved earlier than what it does. Uh, and that's, that's because of... Um, uh, a view and, and again, not, not necessarily a great, a great understanding of federal relationships and processes. They just want things fixed. Uh, so I can understand the need for resources to get things uh, fixed more quickly. Uh, and in that respect, I think I, I mentioned, I think in my, my statement that sometimes we have to be careful because there is a little bit of, of you know, moral hazard, if you like, in people coming in too quickly and then that being... Um, upsetting either the usual arrangements 
or what might normally happen. Um, I don't know whether that's answered your question. I, I think it does. It, it it does. It answers my question. <laughs> if anything, it uh, it reveals a level of existing complexity that perhaps um, uh, means you know. I mean, there's no silver bullet answer to some of this, some of these uh, questions. And I think you've you've helped elucidate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner McIntosh. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Mr. Gatchins. Can I pull up paragraph 34, please, operator? Um, Mr. Gatchins, this is a, a, a one of your paragraphs about the national emergency declaration, and in it, in that I think it's the second sentence there, you say there is some moral hazard in this, and it may lead to calls for Commonwealth involvement even when first responder capacity is sufficient. The way I interpreted that was effectively to say, um, be careful attaching any mandatory Commonwealth assistance to a declaration lest you create incentives to constantly pressure the Commonwealth to make such a declaration. Have I interpreted that correctly? Um, I think this was the question about, again, a, a declaration of a state of national emergency. I think this is a follow-on, I think, from the previous question, Commissioner, which says basically if um, there was a sense again, that public opinion actually might have been in advance or greater than, say, government opinion about the Commonwealth being involved. And, and this does, and that does again go to the subsidiarity point. If, if the state and local government has the resources to do things, again, it's a question of roles here. But again, I, I think circumstances have been, I don't want to make this a point, in both bushfires and COVID, I think each government has helped each other almost immediately. So there's been no, um, you know, harsh negotiations about doing things. But if if you have an involvement where Commonwealth, so if circumstances which keep accreting so that the Commonwealth becomes involved, then you ask the question, why do you have the other levels of government? Yes, yes. Uh, my interest is really about the reference to moral hazard. Just uh, I'm very aware of the fact that if you create uh, a guarantee of Commonwealth assistance, then you potentially create that incentive for constant pressure on the Commonwealth, please declare a state of emergency because therefore we'll get assistance. And that's how I interpreted that sentence. Um, that's, that's one part of it, Commissioner. Yep, thank you. Can, can I pull up um, paragraph 41, operator? And I, I do reiterate, Commissioner, I, I do come from a Treasury background as well. Yeah. <laughs> so we've noted that. <laughs> Thanks. And this is almost on a, on a very similar point um, where you make some very salient remarks about the balance between Commonwealth assistance and uh, and it's a, an issue that we've been grappling with amongst the commissioners, amongst the commission more broadly. At the moment, um, there seems to be three options the Commonwealth can take to the handing out of assistance for, for recovery. Um, there's one where the Commonwealth simply gives a set amount to, to victims and that ensures that Commonwealth assistance is consistent across the country, yet the outcome for the victim then depends upon state assistance. The, the second one is where the Commonwealth matches the state assistance, in, in which case you can have differences of, of treatment between jurisdictions and you can also have different outcomes for victims. Then the third one is um, the Commonwealth can calibrate its assistance depending on how much the states give so the victims get the same amount. But the negative of that is that it creates a disincentive for the states to give or, or creates an incentive for the states to cost shifts on the Commonwealth. And, and I, given that you raised that issue in paragraph 41, I, I wonder whether you had any advice for us on which of the, uh, the suboptimal outcomes that someone should choose in this, in, in this space when trying to design um, optimal recovery policy. Noting we only have 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trawling for PhD no, think, students, obviously. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think the... Um, look, this, this is an issue that, that does come up, but I, I wouldn't also overemphasise it, I think, because a person who is living in northern New South Wales, for example, do they, do they really care what happens to someone in South Australia? In fact, do they really know? 
Um, I think as long as they are satisfied that they've been treated well, uh, it's good. That, that addresses total quantum. It doesn't necessarily address split between different levels of governance to who provides it. Um, I think, however, we do have, and again, this, this is a bit of a conceptual argument, but it does play out, I think, directly in the media, because the media, I think, sometimes says, well, person here got X and person here got Y. They have the same circumstances. Why is it different? And the point here is just to say it's not just because there can be different Commonwealth treatment. It could be different baseline positions on which the Commonwealth tops up. Um, I, I think this is a very good exercise, um, and, and I think there will be numerous different outcomes. The one example I could use um, where I think the a certain objective has been to provide a person with similar circumstances in different locations the same event, and that's in fact the NDIS, where a person could actually move from one state to another and take their package with them. Yep. Um, so I, I, I do not have any magic bullet answer, I'm, I'm afraid. It, it's just one of the... Um, issues that arises uh, in a federation and uh, again from my previous background uh, that goes to issues that go to uh, both vertical fiscal imbalance and horizontal equalisation um, and, and there can be multiple PhD theses about both of those things. <laughs> I, I think uh, you... But it was just... just Sorry to cut Sorry. it, I was just going to say I think you just gave the, the golden piece of policy advice, that is those who are in similar circumstances be treated equally. Of, of again the, the composition of that that what quantum of the um, I think that that's the sense uh, and and I would also add to that I, I think there is an issue which uh, did play I think both in bushfires and COVID and that is when when the community see governments acting together to achieve outcome it, you know the, the financing of that uh, is, is less relevant but of course it's it's relevant on the other side because all of that is paid for by taxpayers. Yep. Thank you very much for your evidence. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Ms Hogan-Doran. Uh, no, no communications from parties with leave. Might well. Mr Gaitchens be excused from his summons? Uh, sorry, released from his summons. Mr Gaitchens, uh, you may be released from your, your summons and we, we appreciate your time. Before you go, though, uh, as head of the APS, I'd just like to make a comment, uh, and this is the last hearing for the day, for the for the week. The core of the Commissioner of Australian Public Service personnel that we've we've got here, can I thank you and can I commend them for the quality and their capability, both individually and collectively, in uh, getting this commission up and running, and the adaptability and the flexibility they've shown in keeping it going throughout the uh, the current situation. So, I'd just like to pass the. And dedication. I'd just like to pass on the Commissioner's thanks to you as the head of the APS uh, for their service. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Can I just uh, thank you for that acknowledgement and I will make sure I pass that on. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good luck with, uh, with the rest of the day and uh, the rest of the year with the way it's going. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Ms Hogan Doran. Uh, Chair, just some uh, conclusionary remarks and some housekeeping. I need to tender documents that had been omitted from the tender this morning, mm -hmm. which are documents at tab 30.16 of the amended declarations tender list as notified to the parties with leave to appear. These are the materials provided or relevant to the Australian Capital Territory. Yes, that's 30.16. 30.16. Yes. We'll take that uh, as marked as an exhibit. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. And there's also a bundle of additional materials which we'll seek to approach you to have uh, tendered in chambers, which are materials that were gathered in the course of earlier hearings which had not made their way through to the tender list. OK, no, I'll do that in chambers. Yeah. Um, Commissioners, this concludes the block of hearings on national this block of hearings on national coordination and decision making. There is a lot of material to digest. Mm. Uh, we would like to thank those who have assisted us in um, collating the evidence and 
uh, providing it to you. Uh, I anticipate that the Royal Commission will shortly advise parties with leave to appear and the public on the plan for future hearings mm -hmm. of the Royal Commission. Uh, and finally, I'd also like to take this opportunity to express our gratitude for the work of um, Emma Costello, Jasmine Ford, Rebecca Smith, Emily Lobbin, Rowan McPhee and Georgia Sullivan of the uh, Queensland Office of our Instructing Solicitors of King and Wood Mallisons who are returning home to Queensland, which of course has just closed or is about to close its borders with the Australian Capital Territory. Uh, and could I just record again that our thoughts are with our Victorian colleagues who I mentioned on Monday who have returned to lockdown and we wish them all well. Oh, we do wish our Victorian colleagues well and I wish the best for the Queensland team as well. I'm not sure whether it's COVID lockdown or this is the coldest day in Canberra that's causing the decision, but uh, I appreciate the support that they've given us. I do hope before we finish that we do get a chance to get everyone back together again and, uh, and tie this all up, but uh, I wish them all the very best. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. With that, we will uh, adjourn. Thank you. All rise.